buenas, giteadores. ¿Cómo? ¿Que os perdisteis la segunda Master Cup de TFT Level Up? Bueno, bueno, no os preocupéis, porque volvemos con un nuevo resumen de la competición española de Teamfight Tactics. Guillosco y Snoopy quedaron primero y segundo respectivamente, consiguiendo así una plaza en la final nacional. Y además se unieron a Akawonder y Luke en la segunda GSC del set 8. Aunque no lo creáis, llegar hasta aquí no fue nada fácil, pero será mejor que os lo cuenten ellos mismos. Imagino que para competir en España en general es una motivación extra, sobre todo porque acerca el perfil de jugador casual al jugador competitivo, ¿no? O sea, básicamente el acercarnos a nuestra audiencia, a la persona que está, pues eso, en todos en Master o así, intentando motivarse a jugar y ese fin de semana tiene tiempo y quiere competir. Porque conforme terminaba yo cada uno de esos días, eh, un, el día de torneo, me decían, ¿cómo va el punto de esto? ¿Cuándo es el siguiente? O sea, ¿qué es? ¿cómo funciona exactamente? A la gente le cuesta dar el paso de decir, vale, juego for fun, sin presión, sin nada, a me voy a apuntar a un torneo. Ese paso lo tiene muy fácil con un creador de contenido porque viven la experiencia de cerca, ven cómo se ven, ven lo que pasa, ven la atmósfera que se crea, entienden un poco cómo funciona el torneo y ahí se meten. La rutina que teníamos era que básicamente todas las noches nos juntábamos a repasar cosas del parche. En plan, uno estaba estudiando los chinos, otro estaba estudiando los DNA, o alguien le veía llamado la atención a alguien que había hecho algo en Europa. Entonces nos pasábamos 3-4 horas viendo bots mientras además jugábamos nuestras propias partidas. Y aparte de eso también hemos hecho scrims con otro europeo. Ya viste que la GSC pasada pues, nos fue bastante bien porque llegamos a día final Luz Martín y yo y que en general el papel fue bastante decente. Tú, por mucho que entrenes, el mejor entrenamiento es el torneo. Porque es donde has estudiado, vas a aplicarlo todo y vas a aplicarlo todo con la máxima tensión. En ese momento es donde tú más aprendes. Pa, 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 ra, ta, 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 ta. Esto pone. Si algo no se puede negar, es que esta gente está teniendo una preparación de locos. Desde Level Up estamos seguros de que dejarán el listón de Cine Españita bien alto.
Welcome back to our Golden Special Cup number one. We do have a new special guest, the Barry Baden. This was probably my best chance to make it to a day three, actually, so I took the opportunity. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, Barry, people are super excited to see you. Saru, welcome. Hello, how are you? I practiced this for you, okay? So I'm going to say Sin Charit Tiria, is that right? Yeah, uh, kind of. <laughs> it's Sin Charit Tiria. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tanais Tsarukas. I live uh, in Greece, uh, 26 years old. Worked as a serving engineer, close to civil engineer. Yeah, we could well be seeing our first um, representative from Greece bringing the title home. It's funny that Zaru won because his victory was not really predictable. In the start of the set, I decided with some friends to try to play competitive, so we practiced from day one, talk about meta every time. That was very helpful for uh, most of us. My favorite moment of this weekend had to be the moment where we hit an ergot three. It's just, just so fun to watch, man. Look at this. Yeah, did someone order seafood? We have three crabs right there on this board, spreading. Ergot three was my last game for day two. What's not funny to play against, but pretty funny to watch for sure. Oh, the dice will be ready to kick off, but Zaru, that is, there it goes. The Ergot yeah. is out. <laughs> I'm not like, you cannot not smile at this. Like, this is just so way, man. <laughs> and this is the revenge you get from the sea creatures. So in the finals, it was a rough game. Because what kind of puzzles? And for Saro, they're up on 32 and 31 points. They've got a two-point cushion over everybody else. I scouted like to see if the Draven is contested. Didn't see anyone pick that. Tatum and Saro both picking up Draven in the early going. And we know how damaging it can be if that Draven takes too long to get online. I regret my option. And I knew that it would be a difficult game. Oh, so he's chaotic here. <laughs> he's playing a Draven too as well. <laughs> Boy! Another player hit Draven too also. Uh, I was in, in a pretty bad spot. You're pretty close to getting some other mech 3 stars as well. Ooh. Honestly astonishing compared to where they started. Found by Draven 3 and uh, countered almost the whole lobby. And I believe if Saru finishes second or above at this point, or maybe even third already, might be the win for him. The Alistar, but not quite enough to They're win. Both dead. Oh, Ketzer wins Ketzer's the lobby, coming. but I believe Saru wins Eternal. Our winner of the Golden Spatula Club is Zaru, taking a win for Greece. Just so, so happy to see that. They've had a lot of support in the chat today. They've had a lot of fans pulling up for Saru. I saw chat, right? I was watching chat. They were going wild for you. And I asked them to like, okay, if you think Saru is going to win, put one in chat. And suddenly the chat went like, like okay, I guess it's decided. Uh, I should thank uh, everyone that supported me. Uh, people that don't know me personally and uh, were supporting me. Ένα πράγμα έχω να πω μόνο. Μικρός Crazy Baby.
So you think about it, take your time and get to the root cause. The bigger the man, the bigger the jump, the bigger the suit. I've got a fever and the only solution is hydration and bed rest. That's not right. The only solution is TFT. We're here. Day number three of Golden Spatula Cup number two. My name is Niberia, joined here by Counterfeit and it's Stuart over there on the right. Stuart, welcome to the show, of course. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling excited. I've been watching the last couple of days from behind the scenes. I've been watching you all cast and doing a great job. So I'm excited to be here for the final day to see who's going to be our winner. Oh, that's so nice. Peter, he's, he's giving us compliments <laughs> right away. I'm, I'm a fan of this. Your microphone's off, buddy. You're fine. We, we yes. had to have it once. We well, had to have it once. It's the rule. It's it was, tradition. It, it is. And I'm, still, I'm so glad, you know, like, like Villas on day one, Maze on day two, you know, to be here day three, to see the UK come in triumph in a two day three, you know, it's obviously a great day to be a uh, British TFT fan. I, I, mm -hmm. I guess us, I guess us on the broadcast team have to do something for all the UK going out in TFT yesterday. So you know, at least we're still here. <laughs> that's where the representation is. That's 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 where we want it. We need it on desk, so we had to pull it off all of the games. You know, it's it's a balance. It's it's a very carefully balanced ecosystem. Of course, if you are confused, bonked your head, or like me, didn't sleep at all last night, you may be wondering, what's Rising Legends? Why do I feel so sick? Is that something real, or am I hallucinating that? Well, I can't answer most of those, but I can tell you what Rising Legends is. This is, of course, the premier EMEA TFT competition. All of the TRCs, rest of EMEA, dah, all those good stuff feed into this very league, this very tournament, Golden Spatula Cup number two. Now, of course, Stuart, if people want to tune in, if people want to know where they can give us a shout or shout at us, where can they go on Twitter? Yeah, they can go on Twitter at TFT Esports EMEA using the hashtag TFT Rising Legends. Send us your tweets, send us your questions, you know, memes, everything like that. Everything over on Twitter is the best place to put it. So let us know what your thoughts. Let me know if you think I'm good or not. That's always a good sign. <laughs> Don't open yourself up for that. Don't do that. They're sharks. They're sharks. You just uh -oh. jumped into a pool of sharks and said, oh, look at this juicy, juicy meat. Look here. Let me just, oh, see that? You love blood, right, guys? Come on, Stuart. Don't do that to yourself. We've oh, got a contest, boy. though. I like a that, is, yeah. that is one place we want to hear from everyone. Yes, we go from Stuart versus uh, the world to the world versus all of our players. Because over on Twitter today, just like yesterday, we're going to have a contest where you are asked to predict who is going to win. But the prize, which will be Little Legend Eggs, is not dependent on whether or not you get it right, but whether or not your answer is entertaining. And yesterday, we did, of course, have the beginning of our alliance with the prequel memers, which, of course, it was a great success. Now, of course, if you do want to do grievous bodily harm to the casters, of course, the best way to do that is submit your worst possible pun. I know for me, um, I definitely am going to at least feel a little bit worse after having seen the day one pun. So you've got you've got some access to us that way as well. Of course, we did just come out of day number two. This is our final day of competition. So I'm going to run between you two just real quick. What 
came out as a highlight for you from yesterday's games? I mean, I think from, from my side of things, you know, it, it, I think the big picture thing, of course, France versus Germany was the kind of the main story of the competition. And Germany managing to hold on to eight players, only dropping five from yesterday is absolutely astonishing, which means Despite Germany having you know, a ton more players than France did and more than everybody else, they also lost amongst the least of the players. Of course, I'm not going to include United Kingdom in this conversation at all. <laughs> uh, but still, I think Germany did incredibly yesterday, and I think this is almost... It feels like with the amount of momentum they've got, this is their day. Yeah, for me, it's, it's nice to see some returning players from obviously GFC number one as well. But for me, I'm always looking at the new players, the new rising stars that are coming along as well. So I'm really excited to see what they're going to do in day number three as well, because I think it's exciting to see all some of the old players, but some of the new players rising up as well. Well, if you missed any of yesterday's action, don't worry. As always, we have a little recap video to send you down memory lane. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes after we show that to you. Matt, wake up. Golden Spatula Cup, two, day number two starting. Matt. Can this fight be different from the last one or will it be the same result? Kaisa, almost taken down, but not quite. A loss streak. It's not a good sign, not good feedback for where the, the strength of your board is right now. Last catch from Talia, oh, almost able to clean up the board. Sona almost taken down in the back, but stays alive to get a few more casts in, and that could be the deciding factor for this fight. The Spanish player, Iosco, looks like he will be dominating the lobby with the start he had. Nine win streak going into Wolves. Aphelios is too good, though. Soraka stays up at the end of the fight. She will be going berserk, but it's not enough for that Soraka to come fully online. Both these balls off the chart, but Dasik just looked a little bit stronger. Dasik allowing himself a little smile. Got the Soraka as well in the back line here, also being able to push in just a little bit of work for healing coming through oh, from that Hextech Gunblade. The stun from Fiddlesticks might be enough to stall. LeBlanc, one ult, looking for two, but cool? Belveth, it's the Omni Vamp, oh. David, is still alive for the moment, but the dream will die and Sage takes first place. The backliners completely uncontested. Ezreal frozen once more. It's up to Belveth to take down the entire board, but she just can't cut it. Tropical takes the victory and makes it to day number three. For now though, it's been a pleasure to bring you day two. Day three beckoning. Just tomorrow, we'll see you there. I'm still riding the high of that lobby where we had like all one two cost augments and nobody chickened out and was just like, oh, Raider spoils, oh, burning spirit. They all went something actually interesting. <laughs> and I just really appreciated that from our players. Lalana, I know you guys, a little bit of a sensitive subject for you <sighs> coming after yesterday's results, but getting to see that Fiora carry augment actually do something, I was heartbroken as well when he went down. As Maisie said yesterday, truly the Commonwealth and the country of Britain will fall with him. Uh, so that's truly tragic for me. But of course, we do have a bunch of players who made it out of that kerfuffle yesterday. We're going to take a look at all of our qualified players. Zoylanash is one of the ones that I am going to pull out alongside Tropical as surprising forerunners for me as the most exciting players we've seen. Tropical and Zoylanash uh, both coming from underrepresented countries, uh, Greece and Romania. Zoylanash started day one going exclusively for First and eighth, which is the most Giga Chad placement you can ever ask for. So I'm looking forward to seeing if he can just make it all first today. There's a ton of consistent players here as well. Salvi and Norby, you know, stayed at the same, almost the same place. Org as well, going from 26th to 28th. You know, we've had an enormous amount of consistency. We've also had a lot of players improve a ton between days one and two. Yeah, Simply Wodchek as well, like right at the top as well, only making it out just in day number one and then going into second place day number two as well. So he's going to try and get that one step further to try and get that first place finish today. So excited to see. Of course, we do have our predictions that uh, have have varyingly stood the test of time. Um, I, I guess I guess it's just me and Wida, huh? 
<laughs> where, where you at? Good work. Good work, buddy. You got there. Ging's still in here. All right, perfect. Thank you. Salvi as well, just doing an absolutely fantastic job making it out into day number three. But it shows that, you know, all of us were surprised by the players that showed the most consistency, showed the most ability to consistently get those top end placements. And one of them we are going to have on the line in just a moment. Stuart, you mentioned him earlier. Simply Wojciech is going to be our interviewee for today. Wojciech, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Hello, guys. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you. How are you feeling after, you know, day number one, like Stuart said, was a very narrow victory, but day number two, you came out just swinging for people. Are you confident that you can continue that into day number three? Uh, I mean, day one wasn't really that narrow because I was sure I was going to make it before the last game, and I kind of trolled the last one and went eighth. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it wasn't, really, wasn't really that close. Uh, also, I forgot that uh, the tiebreaker is uh, total points from the whole tournament, so that was uh, kind of bad for me. Uh, but uh, but yeah, overall, the tournament, I'm a bit uh, high rolling. Uh, the luck is on my side, so I'm just uh, I'm just here for the ride, and I'm glad I'm here in the A3 finally. Love to hear it. Well, it, can you take us through then? You know, what, what was your preparation process for the Golden Spatula Cup two, and you know, and what did you know last night your preparation for day three in particular look like? Mm, okay, so to be honest, uh, I am not that well prepared for this patch. I haven't been playing as much as I've been playing uh, throughout the whole set before. Uh, I got eliminated in Ultra Liga, so the Polish uh, Championship, and then I was kind of busy with uh, work. So I, on this match, I haven't been playing that much, but uh, I am uh, super lucky to have uh, my friends Travis, Leluk, Shredin, with whom I'm uh, playing on Discord and talking uh, basically um, every day. So. They've been a huge help for me to to prepare and to know uh, to share. They they are sharing their knowledge with me, and uh, I am, uh, I guess, uh, taking it to good use. Oczek, first, congratulations on making it today number three. Um, you mentioned a bit about you know work as well. How do you balance like your work like life and everything with you know being in the top thirty two as well of you know TFT and GSC number two? How do you balance everything? Uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> it's uh, I, I've been uh, working uh, all night. I, uh, it's, uh, it's like a re remote uh, job, but I've been up to 8 a.m. So I haven't got much sleep before today, but I feel pumped and ready to play. So I don't know. I'm I'm just I guess I'm balancing it. Uh, I don't know. I'm not balancing it. I, I just uh, go with the flow. Go with the flow. Yeah, perfect. Well, I feel like we've got a mind meld going on over here. You know, you're talking about not getting any sleep. I'm not getting any sleep. You know, like kindred spirits here. I'm really feeling it. So I've got to Yeah, ask I you. get it. In the spirit of things that I truly love, favorite one or two cost augment. Two one. What's your favorite augment if you get it every single time? Oh, my happy? God. I hate two one augments. Uh, really? Uh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> No, 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 no! Don't, don't give me two on hero arguments, please. <laughs> Just stay away from me, okay? But now, uh, uh, if I have to, uh, I prefer support ones. So maybe from one cost, it's Ash, so so I can play Kaisa, and uh, from two costs, Ezreal, so I can play Kaisa. So yeah, that that would be that would be my I'm favorite noticing, ones. I'm from, noticing um, a common theme uh, here, Pushek. Yeah, it's it's because of, it's because of Travis. He taught me. Perfect. We're gonna have the perfect Kaisa play coming out of you later today. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so, uh, I'm forward, you, I'm looking forward to it as well. You mentioned that you know the you've been had a lot of support from the Polish community. So I'm gonna ask you to go outside of the Polish community for this one. Which non-Polish player do you think is gonna do the best here in day number three? Uh, okay, so honestly, I don't even know all of the players that got in. I didn't look that carefully at the whole list, but uh, for sure, Kambis, I think. He was top of the standings uh, yesterday, and I think he is a great player, for sure. Uh, other than him, then maybe 
Hmm, let me maybe look at the standings. Sure. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm sorry for the pronunciations, but maybe Jadusor, I don't know, French player, I think. Uh, I recognize him from Ladder, and I think he's pretty good as well, so let me uh, let me uh, say him. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, one last question, Wojciech, before we let you go to finish your preparations. Is there anything differently that you're going to do today? Obviously, rank two yesterday is a great result, but is there anything differently you're going to do to try and get that and guarantee that number one spot for today? Uh, yeah, I think uh, yesterday I felt a lot of pressure because I really wanted to get to day three so I can get some points uh, to uh, have a chance to qualify to EMEA. But today I feel kind of relieved and just taking it easy and just uh, seeing how how good I can uh, I can do today and uh, don't really feel like I need to go pop one or uh, any any other score. Just uh, will do my best and we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Good luck. Thank you, Wojciech. Thank now, you. Before we go, of course, there's one last question you must you must answer. I'm sorry, we're not giving you a choice here. Is there okay. anyone you want to shout out? Is there any family, friends, players, teammates, family pets that you want to give a shout out before you head off, before you get ready for your games today? Okay, so of course, shout out to uh, all my TFT friends who I mentioned before uh, and the whole Polish community who are just uh, super supportive and uh, I feel very welcome in, uh, in the community. Uh, but also shout out to my girlfriend Alicia. She's my best cheerleader, so uh, I need to shout out her for sure. Awesome, love to hear it. Thank you so much for your time, Wojciech. Good luck in today's games. Looking forward to seeing you top those leaderboards. Thank you. Oh, always, always refreshing to hear from a player, honestly. And mm. I was really appreciative that he went with me on my awful question, pigeonholing him into a one-two. He was just like. Um, I hate 2-1 augments. Uh, if I get another 2-1 augment, I'm going to curse Mortdog's name, but I guess Raider spoils. I guess, I guess that's what I'm going to be doing. So thank you to him for uh, humoring me. Uh, of course, guys, before, before we head into the rest of today's preparation, we have some sad news. We have some really sad news, and you can see the color draining from our faces quite literally. These are the last games that we're going to see on set eight. And uh, I, for one, I'm going to miss it. So in honor of set eight, in honor of the beginning of Monsters Attacks, we have a quick video to remind you all of what we've lost. got crying recon shaped tears i don't think that's healthy you should get that checked out buddy but uh i don't know anything you guys are going to be particularly missing from the set i know opinions are very mixed on that every time we get to a mid set i know i'm, I'm excited to see glitched out i mean you know i think it felt particularly that we've got we've still got a decent amount of stuff sticking around and while you know i like as well we've got some of the units being recontextualized and all the new quality of life stuff coming in i've you know i'm feeling pretty good about we're moving on since we've, I think we're keeping the best stuff and adding in stuff that makes it even better. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I think that keeping the core of set eight, as you said, you know, set eight was such a fun set for, you know, competitive for the gameplay and everything. So keeping that core and adding a little bit of extra spice just makes it all the more exciting for the end of the year. Yeah, quality of life changes are going to be very uh, appreciated by me. But one of the things I'm really going to miss is recon. So let's talk about it a little bit. We're going to see it today. Wojciech has promised us that if he gets a 2-1 augment, it's going to lead to Kaisa some way. All roads lead to Kaisa. And that's really the name of the game for the recon composition. You can itemize your vein if you're able to get the spread shot augment. But generally, players have said she's pretty much useless. So itemize the Kaisa, roll for the Kaisa. You can see this traditionally with four recon and a threat frontline, which allows you to roll for units that are usually pretty uncontested. Kaisa herself only used in this composition. The threats generally drop in favor of other units that have stronger synergies in other compositions. So you're gonna be wanting to roll for those three star three costs. If you're not able to find them, however, expect to place in the bottom four. And that's pretty much all you need to know as a viewer to get through these recon games I'm sure we're gonna see today. Are you talking about recons, Liberia? I'm going to be talking about admins. If you know you're trying to run away with the recons, don't worry. This is a blunt. There's a Soraka there that can keep you pew pewing all the time. And we've seen how strong admins can be, especially if you can get the AP augments on the um, on the admins. You know that honored death uh, admins gain AP. You can itemize your LeBlanc, go for that three star LeBlanc, or you can go for that Soraka two star as well, and get that flexible front line, whether it be the threats, whether it be the Annie, the Sejuani. So you'll be seen throughout the whole of today all the players checking their admins to see if they can go for that ap route with the uh admins trait i can't believe we missed the most impactful admin of all omni toaster but we've got as well our spat items holders to talk about here you know spats a long history in tft of giving different ways to approach the game here in set 8 and going into 8.5, Spatula is giving a lot of different options, in particular for Belveth, also different ways to play her and make her just a little bit more effective, giving players more wide ways to approach the game. You see there, Soraka of course a big part of the Brawler comp, set a massive impact we've seen across the competition, with the Gadgetine emblem in particular incredibly strong. So I think we're at a really good point for Spatulas now where people do want them, but they're not completely game defining, just a solid addition to most teams. Yeah, Gadgetine Z as well, another one of those really interesting uh, adaptations to that Gadgetine comp. Really just stick it on anyone you think would benefit from damage reduction and additional damage. That's that's the Gadgetine way, that's what you do. Um, one of the things I do want to hit on briefly before we head over to a player interview, um, I, I know Recon's all about the threats, I know that Recon Emblem usually goes on a Belveth, but every time we get to late game and we see Belveth with the recon going, huh, uh, uh, I'm just like, that's just worse. That's just worse than not having the recon emblem. What are you doing, Belveth? This isn't a dance. You're fighting for your life. So I always, I don't know about you guys, but I feel a little bit bad about that. Are there any of your favorite spat holders that you do enjoy, though? I will say with the with the Bellof one, yes, you're you're de you're definitely trading off a little bit for safety there to stay out of trouble. I think for me the the Gadgetine emblem, I really like. As you mentioned, you know, there's so many different ways to play. We mentioned already the set being very strong, but just because it gives you damage reduction and damage amplification in the same item means it's enormously flexible. And I hope here in day three we get to see even more stuff we've never seen before, at least on stream. Yeah, we, we saw a lot of Heart Zoe as well, but we also saw like Heart Riven yesterday as well. So having that Heart Emblem to be able to amplify your team and give you the whole of your team that little bit of extra damage in them long, pro long pro prolonged fights is always exciting to watch. Always good to know about the meta, but of course our show is all about the players. So we're going to head over to an interview from our very own Impetuous Panda with Kevin Parker, one of the top players coming out of day one and day two of the competition. We'll be back in just a few. Hello everyone and welcome to Tea Fight and Tactics. I am Impetuous Panda, part of the Rising Legends broadcast team, and I'm joined today by Kevin Parker, not the lead singer of Tame Impala. I know that's, that's kind of the, the elephant in the room the moment we start this interview, but actually a very good, very talented, and very accomplished German TFT player. Uh, Kevin Parker, how are you doing? Thank you. I'm great. Thanks for having me. 
And from a competitive standpoint, not just uh, from a content standpoint and streaming, but from actually competing, uh, run me through the different sets, starting at you know set one, set two. You mentioned you were ranked nine. Uh, I, I know you've been pretty much ranked one on many different sets. And if not ranked one, you've been among the top 10, top 20 on that, which is a very difficult mm -hmm. thing to do, of course, every single set. I think it shows your consistency. Yeah. Uh, but run me through your, your kind of your achievements, the things that you want to highlight the most in terms of what you've accomplished in TFT. So at the end of set four, I, I played my first uh, competitive tournament, basically. It was called the Star Cup, mm -hmm. uh, like a European tournament where uh, I think the top four players of most of the bigger EU regions were like invited to this tournament. Uh, for example, Wet Jungler was mm -hmm. playing in it as well from Germany. I don't... Oh, yeah, and Loros as well. Um, and yeah, it was uh, it was like cast by... Uh, a German streamer that I that I know, or not streamer, like caster, like honestly, he's we we call him like the father of the German community. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, he's like, yeah, he he's one of the goats for sure. Um, so that's when I played my first tournament, and then I was saying like I might I might start streaming soon because at the time I was playing on like a really old laptop. Mm -hmm. um, and my FPS was like really bad and everything. So like when I was starting with TFT, I was playing on a really, really bad computer. Um, but then fortunately, uh, my mom paid for like a really good gaming PC. Uh, I'm, I'm still very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to pursue TFT yeah, more, uh, more competitively, more passionately mm -hmm. in every way. You're talking about TRCs though, Kevin. Uh, can you quickly explain to our viewers, we know the TRCs are kind of the regional competitions. Some regions have had TRCs for longer. The Polo Hilter League has been going on for, I think, since at six, for example, with a very structured land events as well, a very kind of, let's say, professional setup. Uh, last set, a lot of other regions started catching up, like the Hex League in France, uh, the Spanish level ups and, and the Master Cups and the Flash Cups in Spain as well. Uh, but the German format, uh, and pretty much all the formats are all a tiny bit different. Can you mm -hmm. run me through uh, how the German TRC works? Who qualifies? How you know how many play uh, games you play, etc. Yeah. So the first one was, uh, or yeah, the first ASL Meisterschaft was in six point five, and then ever since then it's been like um, uh, every every four months basically. Mm -hmm. And so there's open qualifiers that everyone who lives in the Dach region uh, can uh, sign up to, and then. Yeah, there's the open qualifiers. You have to get into the top twelve, which means you need you need like a really really good average, like mm -hmm. uh, two point or something, to to get into that top twelve. And then there's the closed qualifier where all the people who qualified from the open qualifiers play against each other, which is forty six people, uh, sixty four. I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is, is there any entry through ladder at all, uh, or is it only through this open qualifier? No, it's only it's only through that open qualifier, but there's no rank rank lock or anything, so mm -hmm. literally everyone uh, can try. And there's and no then, passing over from one last TRC to the next in terms of like maybe top fours of six point five or already you know get the bypass. Oh no, the th there is uh, the the first eight players. So the, uh, the first eight players always get to the finale, mm -hmm. and those who reach the finale stay in the league basically gotcha. so they're they will also play next season um we're ending the interview kevin but i want to give you a chance to give any shout outs you want to give to any players any anyone in, in general any friendships that, that you want to shout out that have made you the player you are today that have made you find the success that you've had as a player and maybe as a person as well yeah uh well th this this might take a while but fine. yeah Take your time. first of all first of all short, a shout out to my mom first things first because yeah as i mentioned she she paid for my pc and she's been uh my day one supporter basically um and then shout out to my real life friends as well who have been supporting me um in my journey and then shout out to memo and his discord uh and everyone on there, Wega, Max, Zaza, Lösha, um, Dark Hydra as well. Shout out to Salvi. Um, shout out to Nomi, Manio, uh, Two Beers, and just yeah, the the entire German community really.
we love players that love their parents. What can I say, man? That's beautiful. I I always love hearing family members included in the shout outs, girlfriends, all that, because it really is more than just the players that make it happen. Um, but of course, as much as we love hearing from our players, one of our favorite things, we also love, I, I love hearing from Impetuous Panda. I wonder what that guy's up to right now. David, David, are you here? Yes, Nibiru, I'm here, and Wido, I'm patting myself on the back for giving Kevin Parker the fabled interview buff. We interview on Wednesday, next thing you know, he's on day three, absolute most dominant player in this tournament. Yes, but again, you say you give him the buff, but he always makes day three. This is his third consecutive day three of a Golden that's, Spatula Cup as well. Magic, so <laughs> that, that is, that, that you, it's, it's, you have it like, you know, you have to, with like with returning false or whatever the, the proper English term is for, is for that, right? Like it's a, uh, it's always good. And uh, without hearing from our players, you know, and, and it, it's not scary to talk to us. You might even benefit from it. You might, and we can tell your story even better for the broadcast. As we saw, we heard so much about Kevin Parker. You'll see that interview in full on the Play TFT YouTube channel later this week. But right now, we know we're focused on this day three, on the 32 players that have made it here, and on the countries as well. One narrative is that France is no longer at the top dominating country in this tournament. It will be instead Germany, the country that Kevin Parker, of course, is from. Yeah, and that's how we kind of saw this what happened was in the first Golden Spatula Cup of the Dragonlands, where we, we had Salvi win, and the only French player was Phil Alex. And we thought, oh no, France, is, France, this is not looking good. And then Phil Alex wins the first two games of the day, and then he doesn't win the tournament. But there's a lot of really strong French players in here. Canvas, Pas Ball, fantastic couple of players. Jero saw as well the final piece of the puzzle there. But opening carousel here, David, full offensive one as well. Yeah, going to be a little bit interesting. Obviously, I think tank components are just very versatile in stage two. You don't get locked into one direction or another, depending on your next two components in this first stage one. So we'll see what players end up getting. And at this point in time, I think all of the players that are here today know very well kind of what spots they can go from, depending on their items, depending on their augment that, that's offered at 2-1 as well. And the direction they go in can kind of lock themselves into a certain tree and try and not contest each other. That's the main thing, I think, for this game one. Yeah, I hate being locked into one direction. I'm much more of a Harry Styles fan. <laughs> oh no. You, no, you laughed at that one. You laughed at that one. I got you, okay, David? It's like an it's internal fine. pity laugh, you know? This is, this is not the one you celebrate, Wida. We'll have a few of those today, but this is not one of them. We do have Adamant, though. Two Blitz. Uh, a bow, of course, is not going to be ideal on the Blitz. You don't really want to build Zizi Rock for the most part in most comps in Stage 2. But at least have it there to check the admin will be very beneficial. They were talking about it on top of show. You have to know what your first admin is and then decide if it's even worth playing around for the rest of the game. So we can slam RFC for tempo, David. If it was set six and you had a talent, you'd be very happy right now. But what do we do with RFC these days? Well, there is a unit. I believe his name is Jax. He has a very big staff. He hits people on the head. A very aggressive unit, to be honest. But with the recent brawler buffs, with the buffs, if you look at the, the past notes, actually, there was like five or six small buffs that all made it so that Jax is a little bit more playable. And we saw it a lot on day one and two. So that could be definitely an avenue that these players that have many bows are looking to, to go down because of RFC. And also, you can build a third bow for the Rage Blade. And also, small side note, Kevin Parker may, was first to challenge this set by spamming Jax. So he is very comfortable on that line. We're going to get a nice gold augment opener here. God may another double bow opening with a bell. So no stumble item for him. No eternal, no callus, or no last whisper. So when he rerolls that, David? That's wild. It was, it was a very, very AP heavy selection of Augment, which Gunmei is, of course, known to be. He's he's definitely said to me he is he thinks he's the best AP player this set in the world, not just in the NBA. That that's his real belief. He's a very confident player on AP lines, but with the uh, with the certain items he has right now, I think double bow and a belt. It's very hard to go into AP. Really does not want to use too many bows. These are as we mentioned, is not the ideal build in most cases. No, uh, but I would refute it to a certain extent with the fact that Jewel Lotus is a very slept-on AD augment as well. When you look at something like the Samira, for example, that damage amplification coming through her ability with that is an absolutely amazing bonus here. And got me with the clear mind plus underground open, and not the fall underground despite having that early Sona still looking for that s -reel. And of course, you know, players at home might be thinking, this player, how do you make it to day three? He's trapping his Vi, what is he doing? He's gonna lose the fight. But yes, my dear friend, that is the point. You are trying to make sure if you are facing another loose streaking player, someone that might be on level three, for example, you wanna make sure you're as weak as possible. And you do so by trapping your Vi in a corner. And as we see here, she gets surrounded in the end and killed off. 
we can see here, we, we spent a lot of the, the stage one here talking about Jax, and while Sante is definitely going to be playing Jax, early Brawler's Quest, early Gunblade, and an open bow to play from, so that is going to mean that he is probably going to be contesting that line if Kevin Parker decides to go in, so we, didn't, we don't quite know if that's going to be the case, though. And seeing now the recon start for Chuso, a player that I think has been slept on as one of the best players in Spain in terms of consistency across the entirety of this set, last set, and set six. He's not a big name like Aka Wonder and Snooty Boo, but his results speak for themselves. They do indeed, and he's and you said like, he's kind of one of those newer kids on the block. Didn't really succumb to what I would like to call the uh, the Italy incident of the Spanish scene during uh, set six, uh, uh, set seven, even sorry. Uh, that was the what I like to call the Italy incident, where the entire scene kind of just decided that playing Italy was was all they wanted to do, and then that thing got nerfed, and then they kind of had to find themselves again. I think they have found themselves. We had five players in day two, all five made it to day three. Talking about the country reps, looking at this lobby as well, Poland, Germany, and Spain represented multiple times by multiple players. Not surprising, these three countries are at kind of in the podium of representation for this final day. And then we have Zante representing Sweden, the only Swedish player, as long as you don't count Gunmei, who has kind of a, a dual nationality thing going, same as me. He, he Depends on where the success is, that's where he goes. You're you're actually the same person, but kind of opposite in a, in a way, right? Half it's Spanish, a, half Swedish. Story, actually, yeah, it's it's a it, it, it is the first time I found out about him. <laughs> there are a lot of those all interesting stories all around. You have Bruba with the Polish side of things as well, in and around again another Swedish person there, right? So, a lot of fun things, and that's what we love about EMEA as a region. There's a lot of crossover between both communities and casters and everything, so it's always nice to keep an eye out for this here. Kaspersky, a player that also has been doing incredibly well all throughout set 8, made Ultra League Finals Day 3, GSC 1, Day 3, GSC 2 as well, so a player that is on the, is on the up and up. And Gunmei with clear mind, trying his best to lose all these fights, selling off units, he can actually feel two more units than he currently is, but has sold them off instead, makes Econ of course, and traps his two-star now by in that corner, trying to make sure he loses. Against players like this, Kevin Parker also running a, a fairly weak board with a double kill on the back, but still, Gunmei should be losing here because he's able to trap that Vi and make sure he can get that five win streak, or five loss streak rather, going into Krugs. Yeah, and still kind of struggling with the fact that he hasn't found the Ezreal. Would have had the first cash out here if he had gotten that Ezreal, but now he's going to be only getting one cash out here in stage one. And with the nerfs to underground, that can be pretty significant. We talked about it yesterday. If you're going full in on the, you know, Lost Streak all the way to Wolves game plan, if you don't have four underground in, it's a little bit too slow, too ineffective, not really worth your time, in my opinion, coming into games like this. It's still fine to do so if you're planning to lose streak anyway. You get some amount of bonus, an extra component, some extra gold, but it's not something you're, you're revolving your entire game plan around. Absolutely not here. So Kevin Parker has two open bows and an open rod here, but it's going to prioritize that sword. So. We've seen two Brawler Emblems already. RFC Gunblade Slam is like what he's leaning towards right here with that pickup. This Jax line is going to be very heavily contested this game, potentially. It's worth noting as well, with Jax, you are, generally speaking, just looking for a two-star Jax on level 7, then going level 8 to round out the composition. So there are multiple avenues to approach here. Depending on your augments as well, especially with a Brawler Emblem, it, like you mentioned, I think it can support multiple players, although those players have to be playing slightly different boards. You could be leading, as you said, into just Jax 2, stabilize a level 6, level 7, go fast 8, and find a secondary carry, an Asol, a Soraka, something else that can actually put in some work where that Jax is not yet a 3-star and he can't do it all by himself. Where someone else might go full in on Jax, find that Jax 3-star because the other player is enrolling for it and still find success. Kind of back to, as you mentioned, the first patch of this set, we had four Jax players in top 4. We've seen it happen before, it can definitely happen again. It can here. So Sage is on the trade sector and has not gone level 5, so clearly invested in some sort of reroll angle right here. On the bench you can see a couple of Galios, as well as a Yumi, so I assume that's going to be the route that they're taking right now. In a close fight here, that is someone of course defending this win streak, needs to try and win two more of these rounds. Will do so here, still staying strong at 10 gold, level to 5 of course. In this case, and the player that I'm seeing now is Gunmei, already down to 68 HP. One more fight left, it's a big one. He might dip into that dangerous ter territory you don't want to be in at Krog, which is under 60 HP. Still no Ezreal either, so it's going to be on the slower approach here. Can pick up the Renekton and go in for a Brawler bonus. Should make this Vi a little bit more durable when she's left to fend for herself. Is... Looking like it's going to be a very heavy AD lean, a s random Samira here could be an absolute godsend for him, has that last Whisper already ready to get slammed. 
When do you think we're going to see him start uh, pushing levels on top of uh, this clear mind, David? Is it going to be three two? Is it going to be four one? Like, how far do you think he can take this? I think not too much further considering the HP is already lost and the fact that, as you mentioned, the underground cash outs with only three underground, you just don't get to that fourth cash out fast enough, especially in a lobby like this where players are, are definitely playing the strongest boards. They know exactly how to utilize all their shops, all their components to actually make boards that are extremely scary to face and that really pressure the lobby. So at this point, I think Gunmei won't be able to greet as much as he would like to in a, in a kind of a, lob a normal game on ladder, for example. A little bit of a chattish cheekiness going on there, both of them giving the thumbs up to each other after Gunmei's board gets absolutely rolled over, but it does guarantee the full loss streak. Kevin Parker's loss streak has, was broken by Gunmei, but he's still down at 73 HP, so still a bit of a gap to, to bridge there for Kevin Parker going forward. Kaspersky got a big upgrade as well, finds that Vi2 we saw early on, and he started off with True 2, so I guess already few upgrades on this board and not just upgrades in terms of the unit star quality but also in terms of the cost of these units samira and sejuani two premier four costs somehow found at level five Wida. these are the kind of things that really give you direction and at the end of the day these are high rolls that can make you uh, win out in a game like this or top four Absolutely. I've also got a brief look at Kevin Parker. Not going to be contesting the Jax line. He's going to be looking for a recon line, it looked like, with more of a Star Guardian frontline going on for now, just to stay stable, it seems. And this is a very strong spot here from Kaspersky, also able to make 30 gold to make Econ, despite being level 5. Doesn't quite have a win streak, had more of that win-loss, win-loss in stage 2, the only detriment to his current spot. But overall, as you mentioned, the two finds here and the two item slams are pretty versatile. You can, again, slam it on Sidwani later on. The GS as well will be good on not just a Silver 1, but it's a Silver 2 as well. So definitely going to be doing a lot of work in stage 3. Yeah, not really doing any like specific tailoring here in terms of the augments. Um... Has the shirt in, which is potentially going to give him something like the Endless Pizza, which is still a pretty strong augment. Has that early um, Gargoyle Stone Blizzard to kind of match that set. If that Sarut he ends up taking here, again, getting those str strong frontline items is going to be Alpha Omega for that situation to really unfold the way you want it. Had the chance to level to six here as well if he really wanted to, to get stronger, but again, not defending his win streak, I think it's not necessary, despite the huge uh, buff to his board that this Gallia would be getting two civilian and also just a two-star unit, a lot of HP coming into this, this board as well. Fall Brawler also with an option with the uh, Blitz yeah. on the bench here, so a different couple of ways for him to approach this uh, level six once he gets there. Gunman keeping on the last streak here. It's going to get a good loss, though, a two-unit loss in this at this point in the game. It's going to be massive when you are as deep in the tank as Gunmei is. But again, 9 out of 10, and it's going to be free, free fall. And Gunmei's board is not tailored. He has underground in, so can fetch for some mirror augment like the Daredevil. It's not going to chance it any further. It's going to be 5 yes. underground as well, David. This could get, yeah. this could get wild. And this changes completely what we were mentioning at the beginning. If you're playing three underground stage two, most of stage three, you just get too far away. But with five underground, the numbers are completely different. If you get two losses, that's a full heist already. And that means that in these next few fights, depending on how much Gummy wants to lose and how much he wants to risk here, he can go for one of these bigger cash outs all the way into Wolves. But he needs to make sure his losses are going to be as small as possible, Wida. Absolutely, and we'll probably like to see like a KL2 here, just to have something that can support this Samira and the damage, because there's no sure shot on the board just yet. Can't hold units like this Alistar, which would be a very nice slot in on level 7 because of the clear mind. So he has to showcase his APM and really be clear in what he wants to do here. Facing off against another Spanish player, Chusa, who has found a soul support augment as well, has a GS and the Shojin already built. ASOL overall, in the data, one of the worst forecasts in the game, but this early on to the game, the AoE ability does so much. And also, we can see right now, Chuso hasn't prioritized going for any anti-healing in this itemization, meaning that this ASOL is a gods and allows him to free up for a stronger defensive item or an even stronger offensive item for a secondary carry. One thing to note about 3-2 augments ending up uh, as a 4 cost is that it completely changes the pace and, and the outcome of these games. If you're leading into a comp that wants to highlight and put a 4 cost into the spotlight, it's fantastic. You get that 4 cost much earlier than usual, uh, but also you get that 2 cost 4 cost, or 2 star 4 cost as well a little bit earlier. So depending on what comps players were going for, if it was something like a Samira line, like Gunmei, or maybe more of a 3 cost reroll, like, like Recon for example, it, it could be better or worse to actually have the 4 cost this early on.
very interesting overview here being brought up by our production. We have the Jax carry for Sanchez, we read that one correctly. Kaisa carry for Kevin Parker, but there's also going to be the instant night for Mark, so there might be a bit of an overlap between those two players, while the rest of the lobby are going to be on those far cost augments. And Mark, of course, does have to build the hunt, which works really well with Recon, and similarly for Kevin Parker's second win. So as you mentioned, it could be a contestant happening there for both of these players, both German players as well that know each other. But at the end of the day, there are no friends in tournaments like these. You have to compete for yourself, and then think about your country as a secondary thing. Yeah, at Gunmei now, this is a way a little bit too big of a loss, and it's kind of the, the catch-22 that you find yourself in when you are playing for a clear mind, because if you roll down and you don't hit anything, you're going to find yourself in the precarious spot where you gave up all of your advantages and you gave up all of your gold, so you can't go for that massive level 8 all-in. So you now Gunmei, 29 HP. It's what we were talking about. It took so much in HP in stage two. There's, there's many times you can go for a five loss. You can still end up at, at above 70 HP. Not the case this game for Gunmei. There is going to be a Belveth that might be interesting. You can build a guard breaker onto this Belveth, and it does so much as well in this stage three, in this stage four. But Gunmei in second, a Pryo, that chain, going to try and get some more tank items online. Spat being left open for now. Setuani, obviously a very nice unit for a lot of players here. Sante taking this more for the Setuani, I believe, more so than the Spatula. Can't go for something like an admin if that's what he wants to end up on. Even a Heart Emblem can also mm -hmm. give you a, a another secondary carry out with like a full Heart thing on level 8. So keep an eye out for that. It's not only for the Setuani, there are some perspective into it as well. And Kaspersky does build this Giant Slayer very early into the game, but it will benefit going into this late game. We know there's Brawler players, we know there's a Super Size running around. That's going to be here on the board for Kaspersky. So, I've got a lot of eight high HP units that will get the damage obligation benefit on this Giant Slayer user later into Stage 4 especially. He can do level 7 here coming through as well, just trying to catch out some. We see Gunmei has now gone level 7, have invested his gold, did not hit any real impactful 2 stars. And going up against Kaspersky here is going to be a really rough and a big test for his board. Yeah, it's problematic for sure. And Kaspersky, I think this is a, a rule of thumb that you should always follow, especially if defending a win streak. If you can stay above 30 gold while leveling to 7 and 3-5, you should almost always do it if you are, especially defending a win streak like we see here. The 4 win streak going to try and become 6 as we move into Wolves for this Polish player. Yeah, and speaking of going into Wolves, Gunmei almost not going to get there. That's kind of the, the, the situation that we're finding ourselves in right now, but... You never know. This is the big one we've been waiting for. This could really amp up what's going on. No real massive items. Just a completed item to work with in the future. Now, the roll down here, we're talking about it. Needs to come in clean, but there are contests on the same but the two-star has been hit now. Oh. Echo to as well. These are really big finds here. You have, in TFT, the most important thing is having one main tank that you can really rely on and one main carry. And this has been accomplished here for Gunmei. Has the Echo 2, which is a massive four-cost upgrade as well as the Samira, with the Daredevil especially. He's at 18 HP, Wida. It is, this is going to be a huge benefit thanks to this augment. Yeah, and him to go with Morello is a bit of a, an unfortunate thing. I, it, it does pan out quite nicely with the Sichuani, but has Sunfire components that just stock on two of his two-star frontliners, so not really in a flexible spot for that as of right now. So just takes a maximum power as he, as he can get here, because it is just a free item, pretty much. As you're considering that you're, you know, if you're at 60 HP, you have HP to work with, you don't feel so bad about not slamming an item right away. But in this case, where he's in a dire situation, 18 HP, he's thinking, I have to slam whatever I can do, anything I can do to actually change the outcome of these next few fights. Might be the difference between getting an 8th place and potentially a 4th place if he sticks around throughout all of Stage 4. So, these Wolves components, especially important for Gunmei. And he's holding on to these Belvefs here to get that secondary carry online. It's going to lose a bit of value on the clear mind, but if he finds both the Samira as well as the Senna as well as the Belvef, then his board is really, really strong for level 7 board, and he can then utilize the data he's putting out and then go level 8 naturally and then go for the, the legendaries he needs to round out his board. Now at Wolves, looking at the HP totals across the board, we see a huge gap between 1st and 2nd, and then 7th and 8th, but the middle of the pack is in this 60 to 50 HP range, all very close together, and players now deciding to greet out or to stabilize and roll down to become stronger will be maybe the, the changing outcome in terms of who places where in this game. I think that the stage 4 is going to be very, very important with how the HP totals currently look. Yeah, and Sage now on the carry augment of Aurelian Soul. We saw him earlier on lean more towards the potential Yumi line here, but having to pay the price of this being free, free, four hero augments on free two and having to ditch the Yumi game plan entirely has found a two star Viego very nicely. That's going to take him a long way. 
and there's no quite, not quite really trait synergy between Aesol and the Renegade Ox Force comp, but there is a lot of just synergy in terms of how the ults and how the abilities work. We're going to see here Aesol all of a sudden ults the entire board. Everyone is half health, but not quite dead. And who comes in to clean up? That's going to be Viego, of course, working off of resets. So, well, I kind of uh, was hyping up the moment. Say just took like 15 HP loss here, but still, the, the synergy is there. So it's not the end of the world to have this Aesol augment. Bombs are rot as well from the Urgot here. So in terms of Viego itemization, he's in a pretty interesting spot here. We're going to go a complete downturn in terms of the tempo of the lobby going right into a silver. But it's going to be a big win for Kaspersky now, who is only a copy of Senna away from having Ooh. four shooters online or just finding the Ophelios, I guess, on the first roll at level eight. My goodness, goes level 8, one roll, Aphelios is found, Sure Shot Crest was found as well off of the Silver Augment at 4-2, and that means that it's 4 Sure Shot online, Super Size Zach with 1.5 items. I don't know about you, Wida, but sitting at 80 HP now, I think he's almost locked in for top 4, maybe even a first place. We talked about it all throughout this weekend. Sure Shots has fell a bit in terms of how much it's played, yes, but when it's played, if you're healthy, if you're in a good spot, it's one of the comps that caps higher than pretty much everything else in the game. Yeah, when you're looking around the lobby, if you're Gunmate, for example, so many other players now are going to be on this line and contesting you. Kevin Parker here has sent a, has sent a roll down, but it's only on, what I believe, four Kaisers at this point in time, which is also going to be a huge situation for him to deal with. And this could come down to Marx potentially contesting, and we haven't seen Marx's board in a little while, but it's very possible he's also playing into this recon line, and that makes it that much less likely for either of these players to actually hit their three stars. And we've seen it, this tournament, we've seen it all set. If you don't hit your three-star Kai'Sa, your three-star Ramis, you end up bleeding out to a fifth or a sixth, which is the direction that Gunmay might be going in as well. Six HP now after this loss. Yeah, and the big one here as well as Dalasom is in the lobby. We haven't really spoken too much about him overall. Had a little bit of fun on Twitter this morning, both with the TFT Esports EMEA Twitter account and the two of us as well, calling himself the, the anti-French player, referring to the tweet that you brought out earlier today, David, that for the first time in a while, we don't have French on the podium of representation in a day free. And the last time that happened, Dalasom also made it to the day free. So a little bit of a, a fun statistical anomaly that I have to work with. I think it's for sure the day three where the, we have the most Spanish players with five players coming in. Sometimes we only have five players for the whole event on day one. So, you know, if he wants to be cocky today, I'm going to let I'm gonna let it slide. Obviously, I have Spanish bias, so that might be really the reason why as well. But overall, I think Spain has to be very proud of what they accomplished in this tournament until now and what they can still accomplish today if they're able to get some good results in this game, one, especially in terms of the confidence going into the rest of the games. Yeah, first time we see Sansei's board in what feels like an entire stage. No gold to work with here, and only a Jax too. This port was looking pretty okay overall, but all of a sudden, it's kind of falling apart at the seams. Does have that Brawler emblem on the Soraka, the extra health scales with her ability, so it is kind of a hidden synergy that is just worked really well with how Soraka's traits works and with what Brawler wants to do going into this late game as well. Chuso does have a champion duplicator on his bench, so he has a chance to get much stronger as soon as he finds another Aesol copy. Felios on the carousel. That could be a big gunmate. Is he interested in that? It's a bit of an awkward item for him. You can go for something like the Godbreaker off of a belt, but I think for Gunmei right now, just getting into a potential for sure shot line, just getting a unit quality upgrade with that Aphelios from OCC and Ox Force versus Alistar is going to be a massive upgrade in of itself. Spain kind of not looking too hot right now. Seventh and eighth for both Dalisom and Gunman with Chuso on the opposite end of the HP spectrum, sitting comfortably in first place. So yeah, we're going with Shante now with the Swedish player. Does have the Tactician's crown here as well, which we didn't notice before. Uh, and he's gonna be staying on seven, finds LeBlanc here as well to, as you mentioned, play for that for admin. Yeah, his items themselves are in a bit of a an awkward spot, right? Two of his components now tied up in the Tactician's Crown has not found that range extension for his Jax yet to keep it safe while he's ramping up the Hero Augment. So it's not necessarily going to be fantastic for him. And he'll get to see Gunmay's board still level 7, but has a fully fleshed out front line. Samira 2, we saw the upgrade happen earlier in Stage 4, actually the end of Stage 3. But yeah, as you mentioned, Aphelios has been locked in here now to the board as well. The front line is beefy enough. You have the items that are split up, but still Redemption works onto the Sejuani, healing her as well, reducing the AoE damage that's coming in. And Samira, cleaning up house, three items with Daredevil, especially we talked about it. At six HP, you can't really get more benefit from this augment. Now it is a, it is 
Unless there was like an ice block type of mechanic after our last time where you have zero HP instead of one, that would be like the only way really, right, to get more value from from their devil. But looking at Scientist Sport now, Thousand Sport, sorry, excuse me, that's the, that's the two-way contest we're talking about that could have been a three-way contest, right? And Thousand kind of also paying the price of a bit, little bit of a weaker early game compared to to Sante. But his sport, I feel like, looks a lot stronger in general. Has the carries that you on Aukman, though. It's very unfortunate. It's the kind of game where you get offered Brawler Emblem early on in 2-1. You think, hey, I have a bow. I'll probably find more bows naturally or off a of carousel. It's fine. It doesn't end up happening. Uh, Builds a Rage Blade does not have RFC. It's going to be a problem for this Jax especially. So these are the games that you rely on the game to kind of, you know, not low roll you too much. It ends up happening. And now you have to try and somehow fight for maybe just top 5 or top 6. He's forced to slam a second Ionic Spark here on his Jax. And that goes, that's going to kill two key components. The Cloak for an RF for a QSS or a Blood First, as well as the Rod for a potential Gunblade or JG, right? So not necessarily going to be fantastic, but these fights themselves, now the, mi the most minor of differences could be the decision that ends up putting yourself in a spot where you're not going to go in going eighth because Kevin Parker, in the meantime, David, going out in eighth here. Unfortunate start for Kevin Parker, unfortunate start here for Sante as well. Goes down to one. It would have been so big for that was going to get the actual defining victory here against Sante because they are contesting each other on their comps. Would have opened up a few more Jaxes and Sejuanis and Sorakas to come back into the pool. Not a lot, but not a lot of gold to work with either here, right? For Dalasom. His board overall is pretty well rounded. You can, we can give him that for sure, but. It's not like he has, he's been able to position where he's saying, okay, I'm stable enough, I can sit with like 40 gold, wait until Sansei dies, which, which you'll sometimes see people do when they are contested and they know they're more stable than their person, that, than the person that are contesting them. So, oh. gets a blue buff for Soraka though, that's where you go oh here, right, David? Yep, blue buff is a big one, would have hoped to get another bow here, can still get it off of the anvil there, if he's able to slam an RFC on Jax, that might change things entirely, but really the bottom three on the current HP standings, I think they're just fighting for that fifth place position, trying to get maximum points, because the gap between that fifth and fourth place is just too big, you're going to face one of these high roll players like Chuso, and all of a sudden you're dead, so really it's the matchmaking that matters here, and trying to eke out any small amount of power onto your board for these next few fights. A lot of decisions here, though, for, for Sante as well, right? Like, looking into Ionic's box lamps, looking at a double redemption, potentially. Morello, Vi, Ionic. Like, there are so many things that need to be considered here, because he's going to make a Sephir, is going to make a third redemption. Very good admins for Sante, though, has on kill the Killer Wool, gain permanent 20 max HP, perfect for Brawlers and for Jax, and the 4 admin bonus is gain 25% attack speed. So overall, on paper, the admins are good, the comp is good, but as you mentioned, not a 3-star Jax, contested with Dalisom, and in the end here, facing off against one of the strongest players in this current lobby. And that will be, unfortunately, a big, big loss for our only Swedish player in this day 3, Sante taken down, I believe, in 7th, unless there was a bigger loss from Gunmei or Dalisom in this fight as well oh okay oh, triple elimination sorry to, to triple curse these people but they're all dead fifth sixth and seventh locked in for this game one we had five two and we have four players alive david this is one of the wildest scenarios that can happen when we are when you find yourself in a position like this where you get that four cost hero augment coming through on free two much like we saw with prismatic augments earlier in the in the seasons and stuff like that where you had uh, Silver opening into Prismatic and the tempo just completely shifted. It's very much the same concept here, and TFT Marks has been benefiting from that greatly. Exactly true. And now these HP totals are much more close together with Marks lagging a tiny bit behind, but we'll see if Chuso can continue this win streak. He's been going on a win streak ever since the later stages of Stage 3, still sitting extremely healthy at 81 HP. It gives him the chance to maybe stop strengthening his board, instead start thinking about maybe eventually going level 9 and trying to actually just win this game and not just top 4. Set with the frill. This is going to be like the biggest frill diff in history. Okay, never mind. Just a second there. Those uh, pickups from the road and hurricane. Almost doing enough, but Sage and Chuso on win streaks here. Kaspersky still struggling. Final upgrade for Mox here is going to be that Sejuan. He's going to move some items around here, trying to get some gold to find that set two as well, but that's not going to be a possibility. 
Looking at Sage now playing six Renegade, a comp that a lot of top players across this set have kind of learned over time, hey, Renegade Spat is actually fake. It's more of the Ox Force emblem that you want. Uh, Renegade is kind of a bait. You're forced to play these bad units. It's not really very good. But Sage is still making it work. I think it's it's really the awkward stage at the start of stage four that is most dangerous. Once you actually get the six Renegade in, you get the upgrades on the Viego, you get the Leona online. Things get a lot smoother in terms of how these fights end up panning out. Yeah, and then in the later stage of the game, you can start going back down to free Renegade as you find two-star Urgots and two-star Fiddlesticks and the likes of that. But another thing that's also interesting to talk about when it comes to the board that Sage has produced here, his item combination on the Viego is actually up there one of the best item trios when you look at statistics. You think that but he needs the uh, JG to crit. Yes, sometimes that can be necessary, but this combination of Gunblade, Time to Solve, and Ionic Spark is actually one of the, like, the highest passes in terms of the data. Let's look now at this carousel opening up. There's a Leona, but it does have an ace emblem, maybe not too beneficial for... Uh, well, I guess we'll see what exactly Sage wants to do with his board with the Six Renegade. It could be a viable option. The Morello on the Urgot is also a possible choice if Trusa wants to cap out with an Urgot too eventually. Yeah, I was looking at the Sure Shot emblem to see if there was anything that Trusa could do, but he's obviously not going to look that for that route. He is on this fretboard that is more centered around... Um, Aphelios, uh, Aphelios Beldef, as well as Aurelian Soul. Um, so that's not going to be the case here. Are you going to sell this Nunu though and move the Archangels around here, David? Like, where does this go? I think just trying to find the Urgot 2 really is the power spike that Chuzo was looking for. I'm surprised he's not trying to greed this out a little bit more, I think. Uh, depending on play styles, players would, would play this exact angle very differently, just trying to guarantee the win. Especially with 80 HP, Weed, I mean. Come on, this is a lot to work with. These are many different fights you can be econing up. Uh, I guess he just fought, felt he was a little bit too far away from going level 9. Yeah, I, I agree with your take here. I think that this is playing kind of scared and playing it way too safe. This is more of a... It's more of like a day one dead slash day two way of playing the game and not so much a day three situation, right? Because if you want to cap out the board when you are in a situation where you're still working with like a really soul ones and, and the likes of that, you don't have that high of a cap compared to a six renegade board, for example. You need to, uh, to, to save up to transition into a board that looks like the one that you're facing. That being said, to play Devil's Advocate, I think the, the big difference there is depending on how much HP your opponents have. If Sage had a little bit less HP, I think this play would be correct because if they're able to, if they're close to a big power spike going 9, for example, you want to make sure you're strong enough to kill them before they get there, and that might be the game plan for Chuso, but Sage is sitting at 40 HP, he's win streaking, uh, he has good internal feedback in terms of how strong his board is, and he is going to be going 9, so this could be actually uh, a bit of a problem for Chuso if he wants to win this game. See now where the Viego is able to pass to gets an immediate kill on this Alshard. The Oxford helps a little bit, but right away onto the Samira and onto the Ace. And that's the big problem with the positioning here for Kaspersky. The Viego got right into that backline right away. There's nothing left here to defend except for the main tank. But the main tank isn't tanking for anyone. Everyone else is already dead. The Ace will doing so much with the Renegade Spat as well. The last few Zach Blobs left alive. And that's going to be it for... Oh, never mind. It's a 1 HP survival here for Kaspersky. A very close one, but do you think he can really turn this around? Aphelios 2 would have to be the big decision, uh, the, the big change maker there, right? But the difference maker. But I don't think that's going to be the case here, really. I think that the, when you look at the boards from Chusa and Sage, there's just way too much going on. They're just way too strong, closing in terms of being capped out. I think that right now all the eyes are going to be on Sage, and I think that's going to be why it's going to be pretty difficult for Kasparov to make it in here. And I think that when you look at how the, the way this game play, played out, I think you take a third place and say, you know what, I started the day off quite well, push you into. The, the first lobby as well, so pretty good, pretty good way to start the day here for Kaspersky for sure. And there's two kind of little mental mini games being played today. Of course, everyone wants to win the tournament. This is obviously the what's on everyone's mind, but also just trying to do good enough to qualify yourself for regional finals, depending on the GSC points you get, in terms of your different placements on this day three as well. And there's Sage in position to go level 9. Can do it this turn, but again, you're sitting on a 7 win streak. You have all this gold to work with. You could panic and say, I have to go level 9 now. I have to try and get stronger. But really, there's no need to. You can continue greeting out, try and go for even slow rolling at level 9, above 50 gold, to try and guarantee you get a first place in this game. Yeah, if I had the big one, so it's something like Leona 2, etc., and also just whatever... Five cost you can pit you can fit into the board by going level nine. So as much goals you can get to work with that because those are gonna be pretty expensive transitions to make. We're jumping in now. Chuso, of course, did get 
the benefited four rolling for that Urgot two finally the upgrade but can this Aesol this Urgot this pretty much entirety of a threat board do enough here the gold is rolling in but a little bit too late for that not really much for Chuso to continue upgrading his board with the Aesol cast coming through the Velkos is huge on the Samira and the Aphelio stopping some of that damage and it could have actually been a big Fight win for Chusok Kaspersky, the Polish player eliminated. It is now Spain versus Poland for the top place in this game and the second place as well. So no matter what, you win here, right, David? That's, uh... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, that does not know. I am Spanish, I am Swedish, but I also live in Poland. So I have my hands in all the cookie jars, basically. Right now, the only level that I upgrade was to add a singular copy of Ramis. I believe he's looking to find a two-star Nunu here. Obviously, cannot put two Nunus on the board at the same time. Secondary Urgot could also be a nice little addition to the board. I believe that's probably going to be something that could end up buying a lot of time. You can see that Janna is rainy, so not necessarily a high priority for boards that don't want that starting mana. I would have loved to see Sage try and sack one or two more rounds. Uh, the, old, the only two upgrade with the Ace and the Gunblade would have been huge as well. The fact that he had had a chance to more consistently find the Urgot too as well. In this case, it's just maybe going a little bit too early in the end, but still good enough to win here against two. So it looks like the Urgot, the last unit left alive. There's two, there's three, there's four carries on the board for Sage. He's assembled one of the Exodia comps, Wida, overall across the entire set. If you played Renegade and make it to level nine, you're able to naturally fit in so many five costs that it's hard to beat you. Another thing that's also worth noting here in terms of trying to play Janna in this situation, it's, it's two, it's two Aurelion oh, Soul players going at it against each other, right? Like, this is the, one of the worst situations to be in, and the other player is also going to be a Viego. Like, it, it's carry. And it's carry Aesol Orcus for both of them, so either they're taking more damage or, this, or they're getting stunned. This is like a horrible situation, you need to spread this board out. And despite Juso being first in the standings, I think the, the biggest problem was taking so long to find this Ace Hole 2, which is why he was rolling an 8 in the first place. It looks like he was just stuck, knowing that, you know, if you follow TFT Fundamentals, you have to find your upgrade to your actual Hero Augment unit. In this case, it took so long to get it. The Ace Hole trying his best to Urgot as well, but I think there's too much power on the side of Sage. There'll be one more win here. Not the defining win yet, but I think there's nothing that can change this trend, Wida. I don't think so either. Not even a Shroud here is going to play a, a meaningful impact, I believe, right? These fights have not been close. Delaying the first cast of the Aurelian Soul is going to do a lot, but it's not like it's been a situation where you can kind of see an onslaught of damage coming through from Chuso's board to shut down Sage. And Aesol, I think a few patches ago, we see this this unit featured on both of the last two boards would be a bit strange to see, but in this case, Aesol did get an attack speed buff coming into patch 13.5. So it makes some sense that this unit is as strong as it is, especially when you're able to fit in uh, such strong cores around this unit as well, making him renegade in the, in the case of Sage, and just having an incredibly strong threat board for Chuso with that Urgot 2, with the Zac, with the Cho'Gath 3, which kind of maybe uh, messed up with the Recon players a little bit as well earlier in the game. Route is gonna land here on the Choga free directly into that Leona as well. So the Choga is gonna do a ton of work to start off this fight. Viego is also going to be on the opposite side of the Aesol for Chuso, keeping hit. Well, never mind. The Aesol has literally evaporated off of the map. An extinction event has certainly taken place here. Not dinosaurs, but rather just threats in this case. And that will be, I think, not the deciding win just yet. One more time, Chuso has to suffer the humiliation of defeat. Four fights in a row, I think, will seal the deal for Sage. Uh, 11 fights that he's been winning, so I mean, the, the feedback is definitely there that Sage seems to be by far and away the strongest player in this game one. And also now finds the addition of that two-star Leona with the Ace emblem, so the, the upgrades are just coming through and through and through, and it's just becoming way too hard for Chuso. Yeah, I would love to see him find something and play something that isn't this um, this Janna, but he hasn't found an, a Fiddlesticks at all, for example, to buy more time. Unfortunately, he has not, and just, there's just too much damage coming in from the Ren from the Aesol Renegade in this case. We saw before the, this, this Aesol on the side of Chuso got immediately deleted the moment these Meteors came through. In this case, survives at half health. Or got gold coming through, but not being too relevant. You can slam this glove on someone right now for some extra crit chance, but I don't think it'll swing the tide of this fight. We're seeing it yet again. Chuso taken down for a fourth time in a row, and Sage with a 12 win streak becomes the winner of game one, putting Poland on the map as a country that has to be respected across their performances in the last few sets.
Yeah, what, what to say here? Like, we just got to see a, a way that the game can play out, and this is something we haven't seen a lot of on stream this week, at least with these early forecast hero augments and how they just immediately change up the pace here, right? We saw that Kevin Parker, Sansei, Dallas, some detail players all kind of paid the price of having to either go for a free cost augment or a suboptimal augment. Yeah, change the tempo of the game completely. Some players, I, I'm sure, are you know cursing at Mordog for making them low roll. Why did they put them in this spot? But this is how the game works. You have to adapt to what you're being given. Some players will be in a spot to benefit more from it. If you're wind tricking, your board is already strong. I imagine Sage went into this Viego off of that hero augment and could obviously find a lot more forecasts like the Ace will to help out with that as well. So a very interesting game one. I think not all games will play out like this. We, we talked about in the top of the show, the 2-1 hero augment will, will bring forward a completely different game coming to this game too and potentially the rest of the games happening today. But we are ready for a very short break. We're going to have an interview with Portuguese players, the god, the actual god of TFT. And then we'll see you for the analyst test to break down this game one. I'm the God. Uh, my name is is Philip. I'm from Portugal, and uh, yeah, I'm a cool Portuguese guy who likes uh, this game, basically. Oh, uh, I start playing in set six, so I had set six, set seven, and set eight. So set eight is basically my favorite set of all time. I think my performances right now is the best, I guess, <laughs> because. I'm a first or eight player, so I may be first versus first or eight eight eight. But I I think I'm getting more firsts now, so my performance I, I think is good now. I hope. <laughs> I really enjoy them. I think the new format is really, 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 really good. And I said really six times because it's really good. Uh, because we are playing for uh, our spot, but also for our uh, our region, and uh, we yeah I really enjoy it because it seems like uh, players that aren't that well known like master or something they can win and enter and i think it's really good that uh, they open the doors to everyone i want to give to all of them i can say everyone's name but chilendario maestro tavas ipanina the those people but all portuguese and uh, like we are really like a family so all all the portuguese family I really want them to to get a shout out. They they deserve. Welcome back everyone, Nibiru is taking a step back for a second, so it's just us two for the time being, but we had a hell of a game one, Stuart. Right out of the gate here in day three, things go full acceleration, there's no build-up here, we're going max from the very start. 
very aggressive leveling throughout the whole game from every single, uh, pretty much most of the players, especially uh, Kasper Sky going for the early leveling, finding the early Samira, finding the early Sejuani. But the tempo of this lobby was just so, so fast. And like, we kind of saw that as well. Some of the players that were going for, like, you know, the brawler emblems that we kind of saw felt a little bit further back because when you're trying to go for like these three star units, maybe like the Jax, uh, like the Riven, and maybe the Recons as well, like the last place, um, we, we saw that the was it enough time to go for these three star units? I did like that Dallason did decide to bring in the admin four, recognizing that contested the brawls was never going to function. But this might be one of our truisms going forward. You know, much like the recons we've seen from before, maybe brawlers contested are going to lead to more bot fours. Yeah, the brawler can I mean, it's kind of like a throwback, really, to the start of the set. I think that's a, kind of a nice way to uh, end set eight with the uh, the competitive scene. Is like, you know, at the start of the set, we saw a lot of jacks. We saw a lot of brawler contests, and we've seen jacks rise up a little bit in priority because of the, some of the changes that have happened in the last few uh, patches. But for me, yeah, for me, it's when it's contested, it's very, very difficult to try and pull it out. And we saw that both the players that went for that brawler emblem at stage two one just couldn't find enough to try and get that top four finish. Let's talk a little bit about Gunmei though, in particular. You know, we did see some underground coming in extremely early in that game, alongside Clear Mine as well. So we knew there was a lot of potential there to have a huge explosive game. Stuart, from where you're sitting, you know, what, why wasn't the gun made with all of these ingredients didn't end up coming up hard and sick? Yeah, it's. I think it's a difficult one because when you when you find underground that early, I mean, stage four, one four underground, you're thinking, oh, this is amazing, this is great, and then you go for clear mind afterwards. It seems to be a little bit too much. You're going for too much econ. You're going for too much of that, you know, payout into maybe first place into an insane comeback victory, and it's kind of a little bit of a high risk high reward unfortunately it didn't work out for him uh, i think it is difficult but it's one of the days you know especially because it's the last day you're trying to go for that number one finish and sometimes you have to go for these risky plays like the underground like the clear mind but unfortunately this time around it just didn't work out and I'm unfortunately never going to be here for this post-game lobby because he was really excited <laughs> to see the Aurelian soul augments coming out in both of our top two players but We've, of course, got to look onto the rest of the day. As you said, our players looking for those high finishes here because there's only one spot that will grant you the title of Golden Spatula Cup number two champion. And we can see our players who've had the a little shakier of a start. Um, we can see, with only one game in, I think these maybe are not fully in order as of yet because we're seeing some eights and some firsts mixed <laughs> up amongst each other. But you know, as the, game, the day goes on, we'll start to see these separate out. There we go. Thank hey. you very much. <laughs> And we can see our players, particularly, you know, Gluteus, Kevin Parker, two big surprising German players who did not have the strongest start to the day. Now, Snoody down there as well. Some really big surprises, actually, at the bottom. Wodzczek as well, who obviously finished um, second yesterday, who we saw on an interview. Uh, we see some few other players as well as we go up to the top. You can see, uh, you know, Sage is up there that we just saw. Salvi as well. So some really strong performances. And Sage is one of the players that kind of we were talking about. Is like, you know, day number one, he finished the 14th. Day number two, he finished 14th. And he comes into day number three with the first. So it's a very, very exciting start for him. I'm sure we're just very pleased as well. The king is up on the top of the table doing very well. Of course, we've got at this point four players and four lobbies, which means we've got four undefeated players right now. We can't imagine that will last for super long. I guess for me, I'm really fascinated to see who manages to hold onto those top spots because those really high performing players, those are the ones that could potentially take the crown today. Yeah, for me, it's, it's still the first round. I think there's still a long, long way to do, go. we still got five rounds left. So, you know, the standings are not going to mean too much early on. But getting a good start and getting in the, you know, into the right momentum. And just make sure that if you are at the bottom of the standings, you know, you reset. It's the second game. It's only the early rounds. You've still got five more rounds to go to potentially turn things around. And we've seen it before as well. We've seen players from the bottom work their way up and it can still happen again. So from what you're saying, Stuart, you know, of course we saw some really intensely strong boards in the previous lobby. If you're a player who did finish in eighth place in the first one, are you, you know, what's your kind of approach likely going to be here? You know, are you going to try and get back into first place by going in for as many first and second places as possible, or just trying to climb up slowly game by game by getting the, the more reliable top fours? 
Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be playing on the back of your mind, especially after a, a bad first game. You're going to be thinking to yourself, it's like, you know, do you want to go for that, you know, one first place, try and go for that one high finish? Because you're kind of playing catch up from the start, which is never really a good thing, especially, um, you know, the last day and you're trying to get that number one finish to try and qualify for the regional finals. But I think if you just play it slow and steady, like I said, you know, reset is the most important thing. It is only one game. If you can try and play for an aggressive start, try and go for, you know, that potential one... Uh, first or second place finish but you know top fours like you said work your way up could be an also another option all right so our casters are ready do remember of course we'll be reseeding every single round so we'll be seeing a little bit of a different mix in a lobby too but in petrus panda we to please take us into another explosive game and you kind of fit we're ready to go we and we do as peter has mentioned have a bit of a different lobby two players coming back it will be of course stage and two so we are going into a kind of a winner's lobby after that first game uh but a lot of new faces new names as well and are there any you want to highlight specifically Peter? oh you are here. we got we got two now we need three more oh, damn. Perfect day I, went, I, I went the entire weekend without doing this but i said this this Turkish guy called Ging, he's pretty good at TFC. Uh, he is pretty good at TFC. I, I agree with you completely. Uh, I think. <laughs> Anyone else that, you, that, that comes up? I think maybe a GFC winner, maybe in the past. But Selby is also pretty good at TFC. And, and both uh, these players historically good, not just good right now, not just good this set, not just at peak form now, but they've been names that, if you ask any top top EME player that's been around since set two, since set three, give me your top ten performers in TFC in our region. These two names are definitely going to be there. Absolutely, and I think that the, one of the more interesting things about Salvi is actually the fact that if he hadn't had an, an off GSC and GSC 2 where didn't perform that well, this would be his fifth consecutive uh, day three of a Golden Spatula Cup, which is, which is pretty wild to think. And you think about the fact that he went to the final day of EMEA Finals, and he also, by the virtue of that, made the Western LCQ last set. This is a guy that knows how to do deep runs in tournaments. Well, Wida, chat says that the TFT is all variants and it's all luck. How is it possible that a player qualified to all of these day threes among, you know, facing off against the best players in EMEA? What a mystery. Uh, someday we'll be able to solve it. But for now, we're just, you know, left with being able to enjoy some great TFT as the second game loads up. One key thing to mention as we were seeing the standings in the top, well, in the analyst test there with Peter and Stuart, is the fact that we saw two players that performed so well yesterday, Snoodyboo and Kevin Parker, sitting at the bottom of the standings. Do you think we know the fact that they're already pretty much through to regional finals has an effect on this? Do you think maybe they, they've let their foot off of the gas coming into this day three? Absolutely not. We spoke with Snooty on the stream yesterday in the in the winner's interview, quote unquote, right? Where he was like, he did not seem like he has lost all motivation now that he has secured the qualification. And just from like knowing Kevin Parker, I know for a fact that that's not the case with him either. He had a really bad game, got the unfortunate log of the, log of the draw there with the reroll contesting from Marks coming through on the, on the vein because of the recons being contested. I think that he's going to find a better and more stable baseline now and can work his way back up towards potentially contesting here. I think he would love to improve in his positioning from the last GSC. For any Turkish fans enjoying the broadcast here today, our only two Turkish players are both going to be in this lobby, both Havali and Ging. Ging, I think the historically considered best player in Turkey, you know, by a pretty long margin. You know, I don't want to don't want to flame anyone else, but he's just that good. But Havali is a name that we've seen in many different GSCs. Definitely a player that's among that top five, top ten when it comes to Turkish talent, and, and has a chance to maybe jump up in those rankings today by putting up a massive performance and already on seven, eight points in this lobby. That means that they've already started off hot and they have a chance to continue this momentum throughout this game two and the next four games after that. Yeah, it's worth noting with Havali as well that he has made it to regional finals before the Rising Legend circuit took off. <laughs> if I recall correctly, he did make regional finals in Fates or Reckoning and finished in Fates, I believe, and made like 20th place in that um, in a quote unquote like close qualifier before the actual like 16 person regional finals or what do you want to call that. So there was the likes of Campus, Lalana, those types of players, part of Ball, who was the regional champion there. Giosco, we spoke about his quote unquote redemption arc yesterday, Panda, right? From being this degenerate oh, re reroll player into uh into a uh, a more of a flex player right i mean take There's us through a lot of this we are unloading with him 
a lot of redeeming necessary to actually call it a redemption, I think. Maybe he's loaded up 10% of that redemption he needs to get a whole lot online still to, to actually become a f truly flexible player. And this is not to say that Yosko is a bad player. I think the fact that he's chosen to degen certain reroll comps in certain patches, I think is completely correct. I think more players should actually get their ego out of the way and, and stop thinking about, oh, if I don't play flex, I'm bad at TFT. It's not always the case. Sometimes there are certain patches where certain comps are incredibly strong, and mastering those comps gives you a lot of success when it comes to just pure LP and actually just winning out games. There are also two units that share a specific trait that Giosco is pretty notorious for playing, David, on his bench right now, right? So uh, he was a, one of the... I think there were a lot of Spanish players, uh, Tanpop as well, back in Galaxies that were very notorious for writing me mech in chat and then just going, well, mech. Um, back then, Tanpop tried to one-trick that all the way throughout the Galaxies finals along... Oh, okay, hello? All right, so 2-1 Hero Augment, more dog. load them up, give us the League of Draven, we're ready to go. Giosco trying to get a first place in this game, and he's in a good spot to do so. Has a Wukong as well, has a GP if he wants to go for Draven Reroll with the Supers. But Wida, the one downside here is if there isn't a 2-1 Hero Augment, if somehow you get uh, a little bit inted by uh, later on at 3-2 or 4-2, uh, a weird Hero Augment doesn't fit with a comp, you could be in trouble. And you're also in trouble if someone contests you. King is sitting on two Dravens as well. But re remember back to GSC one day. Oh, okay, this two oh, one. Mortog. Okay, you can't listen to me, Mortog. Please, I was just joking. <laughs> it is fine, you know. He's just uh, for fun. He's just like, let me do this, right? So, but going back to GSC one, uh, we saw this situation kind of unfold as well in the final game where we had, I believe, Kafossil and Sharu both kind of contesting uh, Draven and. Kefossil going eighth off the base of that, right? Or something like that along those lines where Shari just played a two-star Draven for Tembo. But when we open up double League of Draven support, uh, double support Aukman here in the Ruthless Blades, I believe, uh, that is going to be an interesting two-way contest that we're going to have to watch unfold here. And we didn't see Giosko, but Ging for sure adopted the uh, mentality of no pivot, no scout. My spot is legendary. I will pick those, this augment no matter what. And then later after that, scouted it and saw, oh, well, Giosko, the D-Gen reroll player, is actually playing Draven as well. And we are going to spar this game, both physically and mentally. I think there's going to be some tilt that might come through for some of these players, depending on when they're able to hit Draven 3 or if they're able to hit Draven 3. We saw it yesterday in day two. Few players ended up 7th or 8th in the standings because they were not able to hit that final upgrade. And something that's also worth noting, back in the day when 4 Ace was, was all the rage, you could pick up Ruthless Blade and just play this as a support item for your uh, for your Ace units, right? But 4 Ace is so hard to get online, the nerves to set and all these stabilization things really plays a big part here, so I don't think that's no longer going to be the case here. This is going to be a straight up reroll contest. And similarly to yesterday in that game six where we saw things like basic play, playing that Lux carry augment, we saw the, the reign of anger coming through. I'm very curious to see what lines these players have taken because if there is one situation in TFT that locks you in the direction from 2-1 and gives you very little flexibility, for better or for worse, it is this very early hero augment. We do have a, a few of production telling us some of the possible augments that have been picked and Burning Spirit is one of them. Three different players have picked up this anti-support augment. Thankfully, this is one of the more flexible lines. Yeah, this could go into Viego, it can go into Talia, it can go into any other sort of AP reroll situation, even go into Gadgetine, as we're seeing right here, because if she has this flexible thing, then you can kind of start building that out with Misfortune as a carry instead and lean into the Anima squad. So this is not going to be as big of a contest as a double Draven player is going to be. Can this still be a win here for the Draven? The BT has been built. Recent buffs, getting the, the plus, the extra AD from 10% to 20 are a, a big difference, but apparently not big enough for Ging to win this last fight. The last axe will come through, kills off the Annie, but the Lulu survives with that Gadgetine Giant Slayer helping her deal a little bit of extra damage in this fight as well. And the Ogre's just going to come through here thick and fast. Right? Gets a two-star Blitzcrank, and it can even then switch over to getting this LeBlanc online to get that spell sling and get even more AP for bigger shields on this Annie. And we're seeing it there. Havali also picked up an interesting augment, especially considering what happened yesterday on that game. Six unrelenting force, the Vi carry augment. It popped off yesterday, securing one of our players of top four in that crucial last game to make it to day three. 
Yeah, I spoke with Alana a little bit afterwards. He was in that lobby. He was not happy with how that game panned out for him. He was playing the more Woj line of the frontline fencing Fiora, I think it's safe to say. But you can see Giosco has slammed that Infinity Edge. So they are just going to try to see who is going to... Like, who's gonna falter first, right? Because BT and Finzi, these items are both best in slot for Draven, so it's not like they're compromising an item so far either. And we saw when the Augments came up, it's actually a three-way contest on the Dravens. There's actually Juso as well that has the Ruthless Blade. So this might be a big problem. And now I think our players will be tested on what they can do in this situation. Can they pivot out of going for Draven 3 or only relying on Draven 3 as the final carry? Minor correction here, David. Uh, Juso is on Rock Solid instead of oh. not on Ruthless Blades. Our observers failing us for the first time this weekend. One time out of seven million. I'll take those odds. I think they're definitely very good for the information we're being feeded. I, I'm, I'm like honestly unsure like what carousel priority is going to look like this game with so many things being up in the air. Like, do you go for a spatula if you want to play for something like a Zoe potentially? Right, that's also something that leans into uh, the burning spirit line. You can go for for hot Zoe as well. So there are so many opportunities being open. It's about knowing what's the right way to go about it. Talking about the right way to go about it and seeing the board here, seeing the shop, especially for Chuso, I'm surprised no one tried to go into the Yumi line. Uh, we talked about it. If you're uncontested, especially if you have the Hero Augment coming up already, where it will be straight away uh, a, a chance to go for Yumi. I guess maybe scared about all the different Dravens and going into supers. That, that's the one problem where Yumi is... There are no secondary variations, really, outside of maybe Star Guardian. It's mostly just Yumi plus supers. Yeah, and that's the, the thing as well. There are Draven lines that don't involve supers. There are just straight up defender lines. We saw that tried yesterday in a lobby where there were a lot of AP, so it didn't really pay off. But in this lobby, there's also going to be a lot of AP just due to the nature of the Burning Spirit. So whoever has to go for the defender line is going to be paying the price. And rock solid and augment that if this patch, if this was GSC number one, you would think Juso uh, did not sleep last night. Clearly did not prep properly. What is he doing picking this augment? But that has all changed. Recently, Malphite has become a unit, not just a trade bot. He's evolved to become an actual unit in TFT, a pickable unit that you can actually, uh, again, give all the spotlight to. In this case, extremely fun to watch as well. I don't know if you've had the chance to watch some top players playing Rock Solid in this patch, but the amount of burst damage that a Malphite can do. When you think about Malphite as this support guy, but no, in this case, he does become the star of the show. I have been on the receiving end of this, and it, it is, it's definitely a sight to behold. In terms of Sage admin board here, he slammed the spat here earlier on. It's going to go for a four admin centric board instead. It is going to be 25 AP for the rest of combat for the team, as well as 15 permanent HP. Let's see what exactly Sage can do with this board. For now, it's going to be a four wind pick, so a good spot for Sage. A player that, of course, we saw won the last game is on that positive momentum going forward and has a chance to maybe win this fight as well. Unless Giosko's Draven can say something differently here. Last kill on Annie, it's gonna be only the popping LeBlanc left. The Ramus Cast does not come through, but in the end, Draven should be winning these 1v1s or else I'd be very, very surprised. And the win streak comes to an end here right before Krug for Sage. Much more important than could initially th seem here, Wida. It is definitely important. He is. In and around 40 gold, so he does have that interest at least building up over the course of these couple of rounds. But it is going to be a loss of around 10 gold, which is, that's pretty significant in terms of just building that economic stable point for you. Because if you are going to try to go for more of a reroll centric line here, get the Camille upgraded, stuff like that, then you would like to see that gold. And I'm not really sure exactly where Sage is going to go this game. A second admin spat, for example, could lead into some pretty wacky situations. I think for the case of the Burning Spirit players, uh, you would be a lot more worried if every other reroll player is on a different line, especially if they're not going all into supers because you think, oh, they're all going to cap out. I might be in big trouble once they do finally hit their upgrades. But in this case, there's so many players contesting each other. I think players that are playing just more traditional TFT, going for that fast stage strategy, playing a, a more you know non-reroll centric comp, they're feeling pretty good about themselves right now. They definitely are. And... Any one versus any two is not that big of a deal unless you want to prioritize having any extra permanent tank. And with her gaining this permanent HP due to the nature of this admin tree he's building on currently, I do think that he would like to roll for an any two free two if he feels like he's under pressure. Huge upgrade sitting on the bench right now. You would get a Lulu to start coming in. You would get Gadgetine as well. But because Sage lost that last fight before Krugs, there is no longer that massive intent incentive to try and continue that win streak. Instead, going to opt to try and go for the, the extra gold if he's able to win here. Hit 50, level to 6 on 3-2, and then decide if he's strong enough or if he wants to roll a bit to continue stabilizing, especially with an anti-2 potentially. 
Yeah, both of the Draven players, when you speak of the overview of the lobby, are currently sat in and around that first place spot. So, none of them have had to give up any power, and that's just due to how strong two-star Draven is. And I think Kiosko lost to Ging there and took a massive hit. Oh, we're doing silvers, David. Silver augments coming through for the reroll players. Featherweights is definitely going to be an option that many of these players will be looking for. Fifek, one of our youngest Polish players in this GSC, is not in going into this reroll route. Instead, has also picked up Burning Spirit and will be going for just immediate board strength with this Band of Thieves instead. Yeah, an interesting decision here, decision, decision here as well, right? Because he could have taken the Tiny Titans and tried to farm this underground a little bit more, but maybe he's just too scared of getting of losing out to some of these reroll players. Sage has uh, entered the Realm of Darkness. There is no sun in Poland. I can't confirm that, but this is a next level thing. Not sure where he is in the country, but he is in I a lot of darkness. But <laughs> right, it's just it's just a hair cam more than a face cam at this point, right? So, oh, there we go. Any kind of cam were appreciated. Doesn't matter. Well, not any kind of cam. So stick with hair and face, ideally. But anything that allows us to see more of our players, their reactions, how they, they you know, especially when it comes to, you know, all playing a similar comp, maybe in some cases, it's always going to be beneficial for us as casters and for our viewers as well. We'll see if Sage can win this fight. He did get that win streak broken, as we mentioned, at the end of stage two. Should still be one of the strongest players in the lobby, but not quite strong enough to face against our HP leader gang. Turkish player has almost three items on that Draven 2 star already and has picked up Stan United Silver variant. What do you think about this one, Wida? It's, it's, it's an interesting one for me, for sure, right? I'm not too fond of Draven as a line. I, I hate the fact that it's, it's, it, it's that much dependent on a lot of things, right? But I think that... It gives you some options in terms of spreading out if you want, if you have to go into a vertical leveling strategy instead, going for something like an Aphelios, for example, further down the road. I think that in that way, it's pretty good. And there's also a lot of value in having combat silvers. For example, second win we see from Havali here is one of the strongest augments in the game. But if you get to like second win two, second win three was removed because it was so bad, right? But second win one is just a super strong augment as well. Looking at the second augment picked up at 3-2 by most of our players. Pretty generic options all around. One thing to note, Giyosko, our Draven player, has picked up Knife's Edge. We will be seeing maybe the very rare Draven variant where you put him in the front line instead and he just becomes kind of this rotating robot that just throws axes in every single direction. Does that change his item priority to something like a Titan Resolve, for example? Or does that, is this just traditional item prior priority? I think it's going to depend on the components he gets, but you definitely lean a bit more than you would normally would towards Titan Resolve, towards the BT, of course, to get that extra shielding, get, you know, a bit of a, despite, obviously, you're going to get a lot of HP from mech, so already the Draven becomes uh, a lot more survivable. In this case, you might need that little bit of extra resistances as well to keep that Dra Draven healthy in that front line to get the benefit from Knife's Edge. Yeah, but Kiyosko is taking a tumble here. He was looking all too well at the start of Stage 3 now, but has been losing out. <laughs> Which means that his, he's going to be under a little bit more pressure compared to Ging, who is still at 93. And you you, can, you are going to be ending up contest. Uh, comp uh, you're going to end up consistently comparing yourself to whoever you are contesting in a lobby, right? So that is an important thing to keep in mind. And Giosko dives headfirst towards that bow, barely takes it away from Solvi there. I imagine he's trying to build towards the last whisper. We only see a tier up for Giosko to slam something, so I guess it won't be a slam just yet. Shiv, not really the ideal item for a Draven, of course, and that will be the case. Going to keep that bow and hope to get a glove component from this Wolves coming up in two rounds to try and make what is, in my opinion, the BIS for a Draven, i.e. last whisper and gunblade, or BT in this case as well, after the recent buffs. Finds a two-star Jax to pair with it as well, so it's going to get that mech online with a nice HP buffer here for this Draven. FIFA going for level 7 here as well, so a lot of interesting spikes coming in around the lobby. I imagine FIFA is maybe trying to even defend a bit of a win streak, not a full-on fiery win streak just yet, but could be a two or three win streak he wants to try and, and you know, make even more going into Wolves. But there's a Draven in the front line, getting the benefit from Knife's Edge, getting the extra AD up against a Volley Nick, one of the also stronger players in the lobby. We'll see if the Draven can do it all by himself. The Lee Sin will be dying any moment now, and it'll be Draven against the world. The Belveth tickling him on one side, LeBlanc shooting to start shooting her sig sigils at the Draven as well. And with Gunblade and the healing coming through, it seems like it'll be enough to Lee Sin somehow survive until the very end there. And not looking like he's going to pursue a Supers angle here, right? No Malphite, I believe. It's only the Lee Sin on the board as the only as the only Supers. He has the GPs on the bench, though, so maybe if he can find a late 
look into that. It could be an option for him. Speaking of someone that is definitely playing supers, that's going to be Chuso on this Yumi line, but still stuck with a rod on this GP. This is one of these itemizations that you might be thinking looks so weird on a mall fight, but you will understand once you see the damage that will be coming through. I'm curious if once the mall fight through comes through, Chuso will, will decide to, to leave this mall fight on his own in the front line to allow units to wrap around so that that ult does even more damage. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how Chuso navigates the positioning. This is still a comp that is very fresh to the meta, so I think the, the more minute details of how to position, how to maximize your chances of winning these fights uh, could still be developed in this game and the rest of the games today. And so a comp that definitely is new to the meta is what Salvi is playing right here, which is going to be the recon reroll with that early support augment from Ezreal. We heard at the top of the show Wojtek talk about how if he had to pick an augment to one that was a hero augment that he would want to, he would pick this Raider Spoils. The one problem with Malphite and something we'll be seeing, I think, throughout the rest of this game is the fact that his ult AI is not the brightest, not very smart, more sitting in the iron to silver tier when it comes to when this Malphite decides to ult. Many times he kills off a unit and then still ults in that process without having really a good target to hit and just waste the ult in that case. So something very, very relevant to see. We'll see how Chuzo can navigate around this, this small downside to this reroll comp. An interesting thing here to note as well, he is going to put the fully prepped Malphite into play, which means that he is going to use that remover that he picked up earlier on. Is he looking for a better item um, to put on here, or why does he not do the immediate slam back with the same components? I guess he's just waiting to see what the components are, keeping himself open, keeping his options open. I don't imagine there would be any changes at this point in time, I think. The Titan Resolve is not the best in terms of the, the stats for uh, this unit, but I think the Gunblade and the Warmogs are going to be okay in this case. You definitely want more pure stats and not things like uh, a Stompfire, for example, because you do want this to have ideal carry items because Malphite is the star of the show in this comp. Yes, again, as a build to scales off of his a his armor, so anything that you can get that in that regard as well is going to be a huge bonus. And then again, that is going to be those scaling armor coming through from that Titan's Resolve. Seeing the comp from our Greek player from Aug also going into the AP tree. As we mentioned, the Burning Spirit, Annie, is the one hero augment this game that gives you flexibility to play into Viego, to play into admins, to play into, you know, sometimes you're just straight up Gadgetine, you get Gadgetine Crest. But in this case, a strong enough line that Aug has taken, blue buff on the Blanc, two stars all around his board, and strong enough to take down Giosco here. Wait, did, was that a freestyle Draven Giosco had on this board? I believe it was. It looked like it in this case. I mean, he is the reroll player, but I wasn't keeping track of how many Dravens he had earlier in this game. So I'm not entirely sure of where that upgrade went just yet. Looking at the third augment selection here, Wida, anything that jumps out at you for Havali? I think Salishman is always an interesting one, but I, not at this point in the game. If you're going for five seconds like longer drawn out, with the combination off the second win, for example, I think that Ascension is a good one. It synergizes incredibly well with Soraka as a, as a unit as well, because she's going to survive very far into the round. It's going to get a nice bit of amplification coming through from that. And the one player that had a chance to not necessarily play AP with this Vicary Augment was going to be Havali. But in this case, it seems like pretty much the entire lobby outside of the Draven players are playing AP in one way or another. Yeah, and Ging is still on this two-star Draven, but again, using it more as an item holder and a, just a push over in terms until he can find potentially that for Ace Land we were talking about earlier on. If there's one player I am not worried in terms of trying to, to play more flexibly, more creatively, and find a way out of a bad situation, that is going to be a player like Ging. He's been around for so long. If you see his, his games on ladder and you see his final boards, they always look a little bit wacky compared to what is considered the absolute meta and the, these top tier comps that everyone's playing. We'll see what he can do with this Draven line here as well. The support carry augment, so not necessarily has to play a Draven 3, has to play into the supers, can do something a little bit differently. And a Draven 2 can also just do a lot in this stage 3 and this stage 4. Yeah, this Draven pretty much whiffed an entire ulti, actually, and it ends up costing Ging the streak he was trying to build. MF and Shop as well can start to hold those aces on this bench he wants to, but speaking of big hits here, this Malphite is going to deliver quite a few of those. Now it begins. I'm very curious to see if Tuso has played this comp before. As you mentioned, it's very new to the meta. You haven't had the chance to put in, you know, those, you know, 20, 30 games of reps that, that some players are able to put in with certain comps and certain uh, trees in TFT. And we'll see if he's figured out the positioning. I'm curious if he's going to just leave this mall fight on its own in the front line. I've seen players go for this route as well. Uh, and it could change the outcome of these fights for sure. Well, we, uh, we have a big old 
take it to the rock solid show here coming through, but not really been the deciding factor in this fight so far, I must admit. It feels like it's more so the supporting cast, but you can see how it just deletes the backline carries. As though, you right? say this, LeBlanc <laughs> gets sent to the Shadow Realm alongside Yugi and friends, no longer a part of the board for Sage, at least for this fight. Now, Sage has a, a lot of high end to work with here, sitting on 50 gold, trying to go for a level 8 roll down instead, so he's not going to be nervous about his position just yet. Let's recap now the HP totals. Fifek sitting very healthy alongside Ging, the only two players above 70 now halfway through the stage four at this, uh, well, stage four carousel. There's an Aphelios here, but as you mentioned it, so many players are on these very concrete lines that these five costs, these four costs are, are a lot less appealing compared to a normal game of TFT. No rod being picked up here. So like, we do see quite a few open rods all around the item components. So it makes a lot of sense. Why do not we get pick up? Oh, Salvi. He's, Salvi is still on a one-star Kai'Sa at this point in time. That's that. That's rough. Like that is uh, not what you've been looking for for sure here. And we saw him have some similar games to this in the in the last chance qualifier for the Dragonlance Championship as well. So this is not an unfamiliar position for Salvi. Again, worth remembering these are our top scoring players overall so far. So it's not like he is gonna be without a chance of potentially winning the title today if he does end up going 8th this game. You can see the reaction as well from Salvi, obviously not very happy, but he is a player that has worked on his mental drastically in the last few sets. I think he's one player that, there's some players in this position, uh, like, uh, you know, Cough Cough Gunmei, that they would not be able to mentally recover from the roll roll, roll, roll in terms of hitting. A Ramus 2 at 4-5, as you mentioned, still a Kai'Sa 1, despite the items being great, uh, the star level not so much. So we'll see. I think at this point, Salvi, he knows he's not going to really contest for a top four. For the most part, he's going to just try and eke out that fifth or sixth place. For him, the, the big thing here is going to be whether or not this board from Chuzo is actually going to be stable. Because he's looking at him right now and seeing the people below him win when you are at 38 HP in a situation like this is going to be absolutely draining. Finds another vein too, so he's closer to vein free than he is to Kaiser too, to a certain extent. But this Kaiser is just so far away right now. How impactful is this freestyle choke going to be, though, right? That's a big thing as well. You, you got to start making these priority decisions whether or not what's the most important thing is going to be. But he is going to take out that oh. Nila. Okay, finally finds the Kaiser too, but about around like seven rounds too late, though. Exactly. Is it too little too late? The augments are actually very good for recon, but as you mentioned, the star level power is not so ideal. We have second wins. going to be fantastic on both of these Cho'Gaths. Maybe try and get a second cast off after the first comes through. And the Kai'Sa now at a two-star level, gonna be doing a tiny bit more, but with other players also spiking, I'm not so sure it'll be enough to actually make it into the top four for this game too. And there's a thing to note here as well about second wind is he has the phony front line, which also gets that second wind value. So that's an additional front line that's gonna buy more time for this Kai'Sa to scale up. Meanwhile, this this Malphite just keeps on trucking. There's no other way to go about it. Aug finds himself in a position where he has a high top end, has that spell stinger emblem to work with, but he needs to go level eight and have a massive roll down shortly. Chuso will see now where he's going. I imagine this will be the six mascot angle. We saw it so often earlier in the set when the ideal Yumi comp, or at least what was solved for the time for that meta, was going for six mascot, was getting that Nunu online and getting even more healing for all of our key stars of the show. But in this case, similarly, it'll be that six mascot angle. That'll be the next power spike for Chuso. And speaking of power spikes for X player here, Ging finally finds his four ace power spike, has a lot of gold to work with still, and has found the Mordecai's already. So not the strongest of front lines, but he just needs to buy enough time for these aces to just really do their, do their thing. And we were talking about it, the perfect example. You see players that all pick the same augment and they have to decide, hey, if I just autopilot, if I just try and play three-star Draven reroll like all the other players in this lobby, I'm going to go eighth, and then you'll complain, you'll, you'll blame Mortog and all this, but this is how a true competitor adapts to the situation. And as you mentioned earlier, you talked about the four ace possibility. We saw it a lot in the ace meta a few patches ago. In this case, it will be the route the king ends up taking. A bit of an awkward position here to be in, though. He can find himself almost forced to slam an RFC instead of making that secondary last. So he finds the... finding that... Um, TG here is absolutely massive as well because it gives the MF good items here. Obviously not going to make use of the cone here because he is going to be playing on the Exiles as well. So really good spot to be in for Ging. Only problem will be that set upgrade. You want to have 
this mecha at a two-star level. Facing off against Solly, maybe one of the weaker players with only that Kaisa 2. A big, big win for Ging here. Some players are in trouble now, Wida. 14 for Chuso, 15 for Aug, 24 for Solvi, and then a much bigger gap, not just in HP, but in projection with Havali, win streaking despite being the fifth player in the standings. Yes, yeah, Salvi is ever so close to finding that Vayne free, which would be a power spike, but it's not his primary carry. Yes, he could have moved these items over to the Vayne potentially uh, when he was still struggling to find that Kaiser 2, but decided to not go down that route either. So, a few more things to keep in mind as this game progresses. And Aug, the biggest problem we're seeing, why he's so low in HP, he still has that Soraka 1, he's donkey rolled all his gold away, trying to find this upgrade, trying to stay alive, and he's facing off against Ging, one of the stronger players when it comes to his projection, and his current board, and his HP totals as well, sitting at the very top of the standings. I'm not so sure that Soraka 1 can do enough, even with that Spellsinger emblem, giving her the extra initial AP, gets more of it from Hearts as well, but the MF is still alive, Samira's still alive, the mech is still alive, the Annie's trying her best to stall out, to buy some more time, but I don't think it'll be enough. MF last cast going to come through. LeBlanc, the last remaining unit. A big loss for Aug, but not big enough just yet. No, and free HP now. Salvi's Chuso and Aug all are going to have one clenched situation for themselves here, right? Because they're all going to be within touching distance of being eliminated if Chuso takes a massive hit, for example. So, going to keep that in mind. Ark also has Salvi in his pool, which could be an absolutely massive fight if he could go on to win that one. Such a tough roll down here again. All the gold has been spent, and still, you cannot find that upgrade for your main carry. Blue buff and GS on Soraka. And it's just not going to be enough. We'll see if this Nunu 1 can do enough here. Facing off against Havali, the player that we mentioned is actually win streaking, is not sitting on that Vi 3 just yet, but one silver lining here for Aug. Yeah, but this is kind of the the, the, the person you're told to not to worry about for, for Aug, right? Because this is a two star Soraka, fully itemized, working against a one star Soraka that is, while it's fully itemized, is probably not going to be able to do the work. Salvi also fighting for his life. This mob fight just chasing these. This is actually a really good matchup for Salvi. As we were talking about the problem with the mob fight, the ult AI makes it that much harder for the mob fight to get the ult onto the recon as they dash away. But in this case, it's still going to be a loss for Salvi. Still going to be a minus five. I think, despite the in theory good matchup with how recons play against that mob fight carry augment, Salvi was just too weak. It took way too long to hit any meaningful upgrades and never really hit that Kaisa three. We see now Ging is on a win streak after having fully stabilized himself after the transition into that four race board. So we spoke about this and this was going to be the situation looking into the game 2-1. We saw the double Ruthless Blades come through. So good spot from Ging here as well. And Kiosko also sitting relatively pretty so far has found himself in a position now where he's stable enough to at least put in some work. And the players that are going to be in danger are going to be players like Fifek, players that play a traditional game of TFT. They're sitting good in HP for now, but they're seeing that everyone that, that's lower than them in the standings have hit their huge power spikes. The Malphite 3, the Draven 3, the reroll comps have assembled, and these comps, when assembled, usually are considered these kind of Exodia comps. They're just this much stronger than a usual fast 8 board. So Fifek will have to try and bleed out to a top 4, but it could get dangerous with Chusong Giosco, both Spanish players trying to fight for that top 4 as well. Can there's also a twofold carry setup for Chuso, right? Has that freestyle Yumi alongside that Malphite. So it's hard. You have to deal with two different sets of carries here. This Yumi has gotten fully itemized along the way here. The Malphite stuck on that Blitzcrank for a little while, but now the Titan Resolve has also stacked all the way up to 25. The extra armor and all the extra stats coming through. And now finally reaches that clump of carry units, Soraka and LeBlanc trying to do their best to take the mall fight down. The Gunblade is so big, the double smash on the ground kills off both of the AP carries, and Chuso continues his win streak now up to three. You're talking about this positioning and, and how there are multitudes of ways of going about this, right? Because in a traditional Yumi composition, you would like to have Yumi second or third row to ensure that she can reach the backline carries. But you can't really do that positioning because you need this Malphite to be exposed so they can wrap around him so he gets more value from his ability. 
Exactly. This is what I was mentioning very early on in stage three. I was wondering if Tuso would adopt this final positioning on his capped out board. And that is going to be the case. Similar to Wukong in stage two and three, you want all the units to wrap around the Malphite because Malphite, there is no limit on how many units he can damage with his ability. It's all an AoE one melee range around the unit. Just going to try and kill off the main tank first. And this is going to be a ribbon instead of the set. And then maybe sneak his way into the backline. But no, gets stuck on the set and might be there for a while to detriment of Tuso's ability to win this fight. The Yumi trying to help as well. Both the Malphite and the Yumi now forcing down the HP on the set. The shielding comes through, redemption heals as well. But finally, they've broken through. The Malphite is on the loose. He's rock solid. He's going on his way to Samira. One more ult will decide the outcome of this fight. Another win for Chuso. Four win streak into this next PV round. And that is massive as well because he's trying to push to level 8 or even trying to find some just strong unit upgrades to exchange for this uh, severe, for example, is giving two civilian. I don't know exactly how significant it could be, but I feel like if you hit a two star fiddlesticks, for example, the severe is probably gone for a couple of rounds. And exactly. As I mentioned, I'm sorry to be a caster curse, but Fifek has already dropped from 31 to 9 HP. Again, with the, with the bottom players spiking as hard as they did with Giosco and uh, now Chuso boasting in the top four. This is the, the change in the HP standings that I was not hoping for, but definitely predicting with how this lobby has played out. Yeah, but that's another massive X factor here, David. Look at Sage, look at this board, look at this gold count as well here and it's going to be an obsidian it's going to be an orn item as well to to boot from this sack so a lot of x factors being introduced now this road down has to be absolutely massive here for saves if he wants to guarantee at least a top five and if you're forced to roll down here you don't have time to scout and you might be in big trouble if someone has gotten one of the you know considered the rat item in terms of the orn options a rocket propelled fist this late into the game could pull in one of your corner carries immediately obviously gonna get hounded on by all of the opponent's units and that could be the deciding factor in this fight we see it here sage didn't scout but does move his leblanc off of that corner carry spot just in case Look at this now, potential elimination map for Fifek as well. He goes up against this Yumi board and the Malphite. That's going to be an interesting one to follow for sure. But again, this admin has scaled so much HP for Sage, but is it going to be enough? That's the big thing. Double Polish for elimination here. And double Spanish on the other side. So Spain versus Poland in what could be the deciding match for the top four in this lobby. It looks like Spain will win on the left. It looks like Spain will lose on the right. The Draven taken down. Giosco taken down a notch as well, but he's sitting pretty healthy still at 31 HP. Drops down now to 13. Fifek taken down. Sage still alive at 3 HP. Again, fighting for that top four spot. Yeah, Giosco has been losing and it has to have some unstable streaking all throughout the game. So... This set too could be a big enough spike to a certain extent to help him at least get some more stable frontlining going on here. Has this full brawl line with that emblem from the Tome of Trades he picks up as his final augment. Would probably have liked to see something like a Celestial Blessing or a Second Wind even instead there. Awkward, he had the Ionic on the Leona, hoping to find the Leona 2 so he doesn't have to actually sell off that Leona to get the Ionic on the board and not lose out on the strength of an item for what could be the final fight for some of these players. Giyosko obviously sitting very low now at 13 HP, definitely a one hit away from probably getting eliminated. Similarly to Sage here, facing off against Ging, the strongest player in this lobby. He has been for a while, put out stages 4 and 5. He has a 4 ace board assembled, the Mecha as well. But all of a sudden, Aphelios is dead. It's only down to the two last remaining aces, MF and Samira, against Soraka and LeBlanc. Soraka versus Samira, the 1v1. In the end, it's going to come close. The Gunblade trying to heal Samira, but Soraka wins out with that Rage Blade, allowing those faster casts. Look at those life totals. Chusu staying alive at just a singular point of HP and has a matchup potentially in the pipeline against Kiosko. So potentially a Spanish elimination in the works. Look at this matchup pool. He has three players in the pool still. He does not know who he's facing. And this is going to provide some issues when it comes to the positioning because what, which, which fight do you gamble for? Especially when the damage comes out in such a bursty way, the right amount of positioning, the right kill on a certain unit right away that opens up a pass to the backline possibly for this ball fight could be massive in the end. It will be a very basic, very central positioning. Both the mascots in that front line and we see why there is a big clump here from sage if you're able to kill off this front line fast enough you can then access the leblanc and that soraka but right away the malphite taking down to 50 percent of his hp at the risk of being bursted down by leblanc not quite yet able to heal with the gunblade get the armor stack from the titans resolve as well and this echo is doing so much we'd afford the board for sage the malphite's dead 
And that could be the securing factor for a top four. Top three even as well. It seems that Yosko now has gone down in fifth place. The Draven contest not working out for him, sadly. King is going to win that one, even though it wasn't a direct contest. And that's going to be Havali looking in a prime position here to take the lobby. And what a storyline we had, the, the switch between Polish and Spanish players leapfrogging each other as we move through the stage six. Fifek unfortunately took that sixth place, lost out on that civil war, but Sage, fortunately for Poland, takes that win there, gets the third place locked in, and both Giosko and Chusa, both Spanish players, end up fourth and fifth. Here is a volley sport. It has a mana saying Syndra, David. That was his Orn item from that sack. And that is a strong combination because it gives you more to things to do on your board. You can just throw in these random units like the Urgot, the Fiddlesticks, just buy more time for the Soraka. And on top of that, it accelerates these four hard casts as well. So even two full combat power coming through from that singular item pickup. No mystery why this board is win streaking the vibe with unrelenting force, triple items, three starred by so much time. Ascension then kicks in, and your team can clean up while this Vi tanks so much damage. Mech versus Vi. The Vi not a mech, but pretty much as if she was, thanks to her hero augment. We'll see what this LeBlanc and this Soraka can do against that Samira MF backline. The Turkish battle on the right between Havali and Ging, and it will be Sage fighting one of the ghost boards here to try and win and stay alive for one more round. But in my opinion, I think Turkey's a little bit too strong in this game too, Guida. It seems like these two players have what it takes to win out. But Sage apparently has something else to say here. Will stay alive for one more fight. Yeah, that's going to be Gink going out in third place. So still in a pretty good spot. This is a top lobby in the, only our second game of the day. So all of these players are probably going to end up seeing a lot more of each other all throughout the day. And that can create some small little meta patches because then you know which players prefer to play this composition. I'm going to be more contested in that situation, stuff like that. So another thing to keep in mind going even deeper into the day here. Sage looking to, to see whether or not he should upgrade to this Alistar because he's holding a Nunu and an Alistar pair on the bench and that's gonna be problematic. And apart from the HP holds the projection completely different. Havali is greeting out to go nine and guarantee the win. He might just win here though with how strong his board is. A massive 13 win streak. The internal feedback is there. You are the strongest player. You have been for two stages. Can you win out here or are you going to be forced to actually go nine and strengthen your board even more to win this game too? To put yourself among the leaders in the standings going to the next four games of today. Havali Rock is still alive. The Gumblade, the blue buff proccing, continuous cast coming through. The hearts continuing to scale the damage coming from the Soraka throughout the entire fight. And now the last Soraka from Sage cannot do it. Havali will be winning this game too. And a great win as well. I think he really played this game perfectly. Yeah, I think that was a very great navigation of how you're supposed to play this game of TFT. And Havali, we spoke about him a little bit top of the show. He is back with a vengeance. He is still looking for that regional finals appearance since that back in set three and set four. And he is more or less guaranteeing it already with these two strong game ones here. And massive props to Ging as well. Ends up third despite being contested on Draven. Pivots off of the idea of re-rolling that Draven. Instead goes into, goes into a 4 ace board, which again, we, don't, we do not see very often at the top level in these tournaments. And still manages to get a good result with it. So huge props to, to both Turkish players really in this lobby. I think it was a great one to watch. That mix between fast state tempo boards and re-roll comps always makes it very interesting as players kind of leapfrog each other when they get different power spikes in these last few stages. Yeah, and someone that we're not going to be seeing today, but has made this final of a regional before, is going to be Magaki. We have a quick interview with him in the break, so don't go anywhere. So my name is Magarki. I'm a French uh, TFT player. Um, I'm playing for Team uh, Aegis and uh, I've been playing TFT since uh, set two. I feel like uh, this set it's a lot more flexible, a lot more complex and uh, as pro player I really enjoy playing it. Yeah, I prefer this uh, format because it makes uh, the regional uh, uh, tournaments have more importance and uh, it's nice to have uh, each country or each region with uh, different ways to qualify otherwise 
if you miss out on the ladder, then it's see you in six months. It's how it used to be, but now it's better. There are numerous ways to qualify, so I like it. Uh, best way to qualify is through the open qualifier and uh, to win this qualifier. And I feel like most players feel like the open qualifier is a lesser way to get into the Golden Spatula. But I think if you manage to win the qualifier, it means you're you're prepared for the real Golden Spatula just the week after. So I would say play in the open qualifier. So thank you for everyone who's been uh, following me and uh, like cheering for me in the chat. Et merci à, à tous les fans, notamment d'Aegis, qui sont, qui sont à fond derrière nous. Ça fait, ça fait plaisir. Got a little overexcited game number one. <laughs> Too much excitement to contain in my body. Vomited it out into the trash can. We're good now for a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about the excitement that's building up once again, regurgitating in my body about Draven. Because we were talking throughout that entire game about how many times we had multiple compositions contested. And Draven's not the only one, but it was a big one with those Ruthless Blades. I mean, this is something we're carrying across from our first game. We're seeing, you know, with the Brawlers contested in the first game. Now in this one, having the Draven, you know, coming into Ruthless Blade straight away. And also having a three-way contest for Burning Spirits. Our players really don't seem to care if they have to go down the path most traveled. Yeah, it was really interesting to see the 2-1 the hero augments that we kind of talked to, about at the start of the day as well. We were thinking to ourselves, you know, if we get them 2-1 augments, then what are we get, what are the players going to pick? But it's all about contested, contested. It's all about all these players playing to what they're comfortable with. And they're just like, I don't care if you're going for the same thing. I'm also going to go for it as well. But the one thing I want to highlight is Ging's, in, uh, Ging's insane transition from the Draven, realizing that he was contested. So didn't actually go for the reroll Draven, but actually went into the four ace pither. And that transition there made it so that he was able to get that top three finish. And of course, we can contrast that with our players who took the Burning Spirit. You know, Aldwin and got the Annie in a tremendously more flexible unit, sending you over to the Renegade path, into the Spell Slingers path, into, you know, Oxforce, and all that good stuff. So they didn't necessarily have to leave the composition in the same way that our players did. I do want to, of course, shout out Giso for bringing in one of my favorite Aldwins <laughs> on the patch. Rock solid, amazing open. We see it making massive impact. I just don't know if it was this, you know, this was the lobby for it. Yeah, I did. Me, I, 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 go, go ahead. Yeah, for me, it's kind of bringing back echoes of game four of yesterday where we saw a similar three-way contest on multiple augments. We had two people going Hextech Retribution, two people going Burning Spirit, two people going Raider Spoils. And the results of that game were similar to this one, where the two people that made it out were the ones that weren't contesting. So I think one of the things that I want to keep an eye on as we go deeper into the day number three is how these contests go out. Like you guys were mentioning earlier, Burning Spirit, definitely one of the more flexible uh, contested augments. But if you're looking at like contesting Draven reroll, different story. 
Especially with Sage as well, with the with the Burning Spirits, we talk about the flexibility. We saw six admin in the end as well. The admins that he was able to get was you get the AP for the rest of combat and the permanent HP. So it's one of the one of the better ones. And when you're checking them admins in the early game, especially because he got the admin heart and he got the admin spat in the early game as well, which allowed him to easily get uh, six admin and allow him to get that top two finish. Uh, but it's interesting to see with you know with that kind of contest and also with recon as well. You know, kind of fit mm. with the recon is very interesting to see. It's not as successful as previous days. Yeah, and of course, we were, you know, we were talking about how it was going from 8th into 7th, so we've got to keep a close eye on how that develops. But let's take a quick look at our standings. As we can see, we've had a few players whose round 2 has similarly been weak along with our round 1s. Yeah, my eye is drawing a Salvi's performance so far in these first two games, starting off the day with a second place, following it up with a seventh. So, bit of a wash as it turns out, but the name of the game is just keeping that consistency, not letting yourself get tilted by these early first two games. As we take a look into the top side, Havali has actually got the number one spot at the moment, tied with Sage, so even though you know, we still haven't got that two first place finishes, but a second and a first is enough for the moment to give you that little bit of a gap, but it's still very, very close. There's still pretty much nothing in it right now. And again, still a good mix of players up here towards top. Of course, we do expect to see a lot of German players up here. But again, we are looking to work towards seeing which one of our players are in the position to go in forward and take the crown here in the Golden Special Cup number two. We're going to find out sooner than you would imagine because we are going to head straight over to a break before we get into round number three. And before that, we're going to show you a quick player interview. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so my name is Balu Antares Maroni, I'm 28, and I was originally born in Germany, uh, but I'm currently living in Spain since pretty much uh, since I was five, and I'm more known as Snooty Boy in the gaming community. Okay, so the, the thing that I enjoyed the most about this, uh, this set is that I actually think they got the grasp on the hero augments, they've been getting much better at that, and the first month I was pretty much playing non-stop, like 12, 14 hours, so I'm really enjoying it. Usually when we're uh, almost at the bit set, I'm kind of tired of it, but I'm still in the mood of gaming 8, 10 hours a day, so I'm really loving it. So TRC is definitely have to be important because like the reference we have in, in Europe is uh, France and their system revolves around their, their national competitions, their TRCs, right? And they've always been a step ahead and they've kicked their ass forever. So I think that Spain is actually catching up is really important. Myself, I've always been good at ladder, but struggling with these tournaments. And now that I've been playing in these much more often, I think it's getting better. Oh, so I've been competing in pretty much all the Rising Legends competitions ever since it existed and even before it was called Rising Legends. But I think uh, this, uh, this year has been my best performance so far a GSC one where I got 10th. I think I could have done a bit better, but that was still pretty nice for me because I actually get a, a real shot to get to the European Championship, which was pretty much my dream ever since I competed. So that's pretty nice. Of course, everybody who supports me every day, thank you very much for the for the cheers every day. And everybody who's enjoying TFT, keep on doing that. Uh, this is an awesome game. We're going in the right direction. Have a nice uh, day and uh, thanks for watching.
Welcome back everyone to the Golden Special Cup number two, final day as players from all over the EMEA region battle to call themselves champion here in one of our only three Golden Special Cups of the set. My name is kind of it here with Stuart. Stuart, we're heading into lobby three as we're getting close to the halfway point. Yeah, we're getting really, really close, and I think this is a moment where players have to start to step up. They have to try and bring their aim game now because we're getting into the midway point, which means that the players that are going to be sitting in the lower standings have to try and find something to try and creep back up. And we were talking about this before, you know, some of our players in the standings overall definitely have a long way to go. We, of course, we, you know, we've seen it in tournaments from for forever, including at the Dragonlands Championship itself. It is possible to climb back up, but it does require you to start putting out some incredible shifts. And based on what we saw in our first two games, the kind of ball that's going to get you first and second in day three has got to be miraculous. Yeah, I think it's absolutely insane that we're getting these crazy aggressive lobbies. We're getting these crazy transitions, crazy contests as well, as we can see our lobby on screen now. A few familiar play faces uh, that we've uh, seen from before. Uh, the one player as well, uh, we have got um, Degas as well, which we casted ourselves over in the rest of EMEA. He was the uh, one that, if I'm not mistaken, actually got first place as well from that qualifier. So excited to see him perform. Oh, no, well, I think, it, uh, no, that was Dan Stars. He actually got fifth place. Oh, yes. So that's what makes it even more impressive. Digger's part has actually gotten to day three because there were already four players who finished out more strongly. But getting into the Golden Special Cup, all sins are forgiven. If you get to day three, you've done incredibly well. Yeah, day three is definitely something to be proud of, but it doesn't stop there, counterfeit. You know, you want to go no. that one step further. You want to make sure that, yes, day three is amazing. Yes, you're in the top 32 players, but you're thinking to yourself, when you reach day three, you're like, okay, now I can potentially reach the finals. What am I going to do differently, or what am I going to do to try and make that next step to try and get into that finals position? And shout out to Mordog, thank you for the raid to our stream. Again, anyone who's coming in for this for the first time, this is the Golden Spatula Cup number two. So we're, today we will be crowning ourselves another Golden Spatula champion who will get a guaranteed ticket to the EMEA Regional Finals. Everybody else who finishes today will get some points towards that competition, but only the, the best performing players will get guaranteed spots or close to guaranteed spots. Yeah, we are currently in round number three as well. So most of these players have still got a long way to go, but Snoody, one of the players that sitting on seven points, so not a lot of points to start off with, kind of sitting in the middle of the standings. Has a bit of a flexible start here, has a lot of units that maybe he can look to pivot into. You've got a couple of duelists on the bench. Um, got a two-star Nasus in there as well, but nothing mm. too surprising just yet. Like no, no sort of direction. Yeah, well, we, we did see the setter coming in again immediately. Oh, nice solid. Game. Yes! Not We've again. been good, Stuart! We're going to get... <laughs> well, we know. We saw before. Two-way contest on Ruthless Burning. Three-way contest on Burning Spirit. Maybe based on what we saw last game, we're going to be seeing our players being a little bit more hesitant for just going straight away for the best augment they can grab. <laughs> These two one hero augments every single time, it, it just brings a little bit of joy, but also a little bit Ooh. of what's going to happen this game. But wow, this is a really, really strong start from Snooty. You got the um, Vi in there. You also have the Jawless. The dual gauntlet Sam as well. So this board is Snooty's definitely going to be looking to play aggressive and try and get his early win streak. Yeah, the unrelenting force we saw in our previous game. Get Vi up to three star, throw in some more Aegis as well. She's totally unkillable. We're also putting out a decent amount of damage. There's also the possibility for Sydney Boo to fit in underground if he can find just a little bit more room. But uh oh, we've uh -oh. got more explosive boards coming. There's a lot of carry augments coming. We got Gunmate with the Reign of Anger as well. Lots of carry augments, lots of fire coming into this round. We haven't seen most of the hero augments, but this is the first two. As if that's anything to come by, there's going to be another aggressive lobby. We've already had two crazy aggressive lobbies so far. I think this is just what day three is all about. You know, as we mentioned, you know, the players will get some amount of points towards qualifying for the media regional finals for just getting to day three at all. But there's only one spot that guarantees it absolutely for certain and also attaches the title of Golden Spatula Cup winner to your name for the rest of your TFT career. 
And we have to, we can't forget as well that there's still, you know, money on the line as well. You know, even if for the players that, you know, can say quote unquote have already qualified, they still want to do well. They still want to perform well. They still want to say to everyone else in the region, look, I am the best player in this region. So they want to try and look what they could do. Another oh. carry Orgwood. We have the lead in <laughs> carry Orgwood as well. This was. Uh, I, I would say most people's worst nightmare with the double double leasing meta, uh, which uh, I think a lot of people are quite happy is. Uh, I, well, I say no longer a thing, but I think it's, it's still quite popular. Uh, but yeah, a lot of carry augments. Yeah, that's cleansing safeguard, absolutely nightmarish. Managing to get past Mujiwara for the time being, which will mean that he'll be knocked off of his initial win streak. Sneedyboo and Norby will remain up the top, but it's been a pretty explosive lobby so far. Really good start. Oh, we got a we got another Draven as well. Another carry augment. I, I I feel like everyone in this lobby just has a carry augment. I, I don't think there's any supportive augments in this lobby, which makes it even more exciting because that means that we could see, be seeing some supers being contested. We could be seeing some rerolls as well, which we do see. Uh, we've got uh, you know double Vi augments. Got the Camille as well by Degas. Mm. A lot, a lot of interesting augments actually to have to see if the there's going to be some contestion yeah i mean it's, it's kind of arguable whether or not even you know the few carry, uh, support we've got here are kind of really supports as much as we see raider spells yeah hugely powerful the camille augment you mentioned before just means more damage across the team so everybody no matter how they're approaching this game is looking to make a massive impact early on and I kind of want to bring back something we were mentioning on the desk before. You know, we are talking about how Recon just hadn't made an impact so far today, and how that can maybe be playing into the style our players are playing overall. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think we've seen Recon so far go 8th and 7th, and they've been uncontested both times as well. And that just shows how aggressive and how quick these lobbies can be, especially with these 2-1 hero augments as well. You're going to be seeing the power spikes early, and it doesn't give enough time for these Recon players to maybe Econ up, to maybe look for the slow rolls, look for them 3-star carries, because by the time that they're even close to 3-star carries, everyone's already hit their power spike. I think we get a testament of that on the right-hand side. Very few players, with the exception of Salvi, leaving anything unslammed so far. There's been a tacit agreement between the lobby that they're going to go all out. Remember, this is at lobby three, so the lower half of the table. We don't have massive separation as of yet, but if you say take an eighth here, your chances of winning the competition are almost entirely out of the window. Yeah, we do see that Nuki here has taken boxing lessons, one of the more flexible augments, uh, for sure. Gives your team a little bit of extra bonus health. Does have the jacks in there as well. This is a comp that, a bit of a throwback where you would just take this augment, go for eight brawlers and just win out every single game with the jack mm. carry. But you got underground in the early game as well for Nuki, so could be looking to try and go for, well, trying to carry on the, the you know, the loose streak, but winning the last round definitely wasn't good for him. Yeah, at least the underground is a little bit agnostic to soften the blow, but you're right. I love, and I'd love to see Nuki longer term going for brawlers again. We, we've seen it be very, very effective. And that boxing lessons, of course, the HP to get multiplied up by going heavy into the brawlers just means there's so much tougher of a front line to deal with, unlike right now. Yeah. <laughs> unlike right now, I mean, I, to be honest, as I mentioned, you know, losing rounds is not too bad. It means you get some more stacks on your heist, which means you can try and look to go for the payouts a little bit earlier. Only a BF sword. I obviously did receive a little bit of a nerf in the uh, most recent patch, so it means that the early underground heists are not as strong as what they were before. But if you can keep on going up, actually, it might be Nuki might be thinking here whether to take this, because, mm. you know, BF sword is a pretty good component to take, especially when you have a bow and a glove to play with. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, and absolutely will mm, decide to go for it. So immediate power. I'm curious to see if Lucky will keep it in the underground and maybe fish for a little bit more. Uh, for the time being, he will up against Gunmei's Reign of Anger board. If we're talking about players who want to be going down the Brawler route, Gunmei is definitely another one. And we know what happens when Brawlers get contested. Yeah, brawlers get contested. You're just going to be holding hands, seventh and eighth, baby. That's exactly how it works. But you can see Laser Corp as well. I think Laser Corp is probably cop that we haven't seen a lot over the past three days. It's definitely not as uh, popular as what it was a couple of patches ago when it received some crazy buffs. But with a few nerfs in uh, some of the recent patches to some of the units and also uh, to the trait, we haven't seen a lot of it. But with the Reign of Anger, uh, you're probably going to be seeing brawlers with the Laser Corp there as well. 
Hopefully we'll get a chance to check in with Tropical. Yes, we will, because we've got another carryover. I know you're oh, a big fan of this. Kingslayer coming in, so maximum health and increased damage. This is massive for you, especially if you get anima stacks in, that'll work for it. You know, if you can start throwing on Warmogs, he just becomes an absolute tank while still doing damage based on max HP. Already has five Silas's as well to his name, so he's going to be maybe potentially looking to reroll. Didn't level at all, so he still is level four. Doesn't have the best of econ, though. Uh, as we can see, the econ of everyone is the players like Snooty at the top, only on 20 gold, but a lot of players with a lot of gold in this early game. Do you think that he's going to look to re... Oh, okay, I said he didn't have a lot of gold. <laughs> Mod Dog was just like, oh, there you go, have a, have a little bit of gold. This should help you hit, get in Silas three. Well, that's what happened. More dog turns up and his blessings are many and multitudinous. We've got some more anima score coming in, so it'll help reinforce us already. This is aggressive. There. Very aggressive. Got a few more talents. You can see actually re -roll. It seems like there's a poppy as well being re rolled. There's six poppies. You got a Nasus in here as well with the anima squads. Didn't find any three stars yet, and this is. Ri Two-star Riven's not too bad, but wait, what are you going to replace it for? Didn't even have time to level up in the ends. Oh, boy. Well, not messing around at all as we go check in on what Gumbay is up to. So remember, of course, Reign of Anger. For again, for anyone who maybe hasn't seen it as much recently, the Renekton will gain a bunch of attack speed and then 2% per 100 missing health. So again, it's not based on max health, just on missing health. So the more health he has, the faster he will attack. You're probably surprised as well to say that, you know, carry augment plus warmogs, but because Re uh, Renekton, especially three star, already has a lot of damage, sometimes we see some itemization go towards more tankiness, you know, maybe Titan's Resolve, Bloodthirster, and we got a Prism ah. We Think Fast, but he already has a Renekton three star, Ooh. so you don't even really need Think Fast in this situation. Oh boy. I say I wouldn't mind at all seeing some gloves coming through here because of course we know the brawlers love to have anything they can use to reinforce them as wow throwing the gloves onto the jacks who presumably was intended to long term would be the secondary carry potentially already finding a two-star jacks as well look at that six brawler already a three-star renekton this board from gunmate is looking absolutely Insane! I mean, I will be very, very surprised if he loses an entire round in the stage story. Yeah, welcome to the gun show. This is really terrifying. We talked about this on previous days. If you just don't have the ability to do massive single target damage, like if your damage is spread out a little bit, like say with a Jinx as we're seeing here, you just don't have the capacity to take down beef this big. You see that there was actually a Poppy 3-star found here instead from Tropical. Instead, that side is 3-star. Still waiting for one more Silas, unfortunately. But you can see Tropical has no Econ as well. So he tried to play aggressive. He tried to roll down for that Silas 3-star with the carry augment. But unfortunately, couldn't hit. And you're seeing the kind of consequences of that now. Not being able to hit that 3-star Silas. Because on the other hand, you got Gunmei with this 3-star Renekton wrecking through everyone. Yeah, an absolute wrecking ball. It's, it's a, it doesn't even compare right now, and the rest of the lobby absolutely needs to take notice. So checking in on our HP bars across the field, we can see Mujiwara coming in and rocking out the win streak at the top. Deyeet Spada and Tropical and Salvi, all 70 HP and below, suffering because the pace picks up thanks to these prismatics. If we're taking a look at all the prismatics now, we've got Battle Mage for Diga, so probably looking for Renegade, Golden Ticket. We've got some preparation happening, Electric, Car Electric Charge. We've got Admin for Snoody as well. Uh, so a lot of interesting prismatic choices, but a 2-1 Hero Augment into Prismatic is probably... I mean, it's what we expected with day number three counterfeit. It was like aggressive lobby <laughs> into aggressive lobby into, you know what? Let's go for a third aggressive lobby in a row. I mean, those switches exist on Mort's desk for a reason. It's to provide maximum drama when the moment calls for it. And here on day three, we need all the drama we can get. Sunny Boo taking the loss, but keeping the underground in play with a four admin active right now. That's extra mana and extra AP across the team. Still holding relatively strong towards the top of the table.
And there is a Soraka here as well with Bell. Probably an item that you don't really want on the Soraka. Maybe you can go for Guard Breaker. But is anyone going to pick up? It's going to be Tropical picking that up in the end. So it's not going to go in the way of Snoody. He's just going to be picking up a tier. Already has the admin. So you're trying to look for tier components to try and get into, you know, maybe some Soraka or LeBlanc items. So we're coming back to Salvi in a second, I believe. Of course, the one of the players in the competition, in fact, the only remaining Golden Spatula Cup champion pre-existing, as finds two upgrades in a single shop. The thumbs up is all you ever need to give. <laughs> thumbs up, indeed. I mean... Yep, yeah, they're just giving it all to you. You can see Raider Spoils giving your uh, strongest Ezreal with his, you know, his nearest ally a temporary artifact. You're probably wondering, why is this Ezreal being on the front line? Well, most of the time in the early stages, you want to try and, or pretty much throughout the whole game, you want to try and put this Ezreal in the front line to give one of your front line units a item. You know, the artifact could be a Blitz Crank Hook. And if he gets a Blitz Crank Hook here, he can hook it in, but no, gets the Randwins instead. So it gives him some AoE armor. So most of the time, players like to prioritize the front line item Items instead of them backline carry items. It can be absolutely devastating. The lobby's gonna have to take notice. They could just immediately take the L. As uh, Salvi is having a little bit of trouble with this League of Dragon Draven. Remember, he's getting a gold uh, percentage of the time when he kills a unit. In this case, he gets four gold per round. I mean, that's the kind of thing that could absolutely be happening the whole way through the game. Yep, exactly. And you know, we've got a little bit of gold, you've got preparation as well. Prep three, one of the uh, one of the more insane, I would say, prismatics, especially when you're going for like a reroll comp. We can see Muji's. Do you take this? Do you take an Edge of Night? I don't think Edge of Night is the best. It looks like he's going for a more AP route, so it's not the best, but what would you do? I think Muji could afford to. Afford to no, it's not. Oh, he's going to take wow. it. Wow. is on a win streak. And he's on a lot of HP, so I thought maybe he would go further deeper into the underground, but maybe he's prioritizing keeping that win streak going by making his board as strong as possible. Really interesting. Do you, so do you maybe just reforge the Edge of Night at the later stages of the game? Because because you have that reforger, maybe you can, you know, ride that a little bit of RNG luck and maybe look to reforge it at later stages. Does it put the um, Edge of Night on the Nila for now? And nothing... Yeah, it's really in that's really interesting because like you said, you know, 88 HP, level 7 already rolled down a lot of gold. You would have thought, okay, I can keep on going. I have enough HP to try and get that lit the you know the high heights, the high level heights. Yeah, well Mujiwara from Egypt did come in second before in the Dragonlands Golden Special Cup number three, but barely missed out on being able to play at the regional finals, which was a real shame. I think Ooh. maybe there's just a sense of how dangerous the situation is as Snooty finds the Manamune. That's going to be a whole lot of cast in a hurry. <laughs> I think I love Snooty's reaction to that heist. As soon as he saw the Manamune, his face dropped. He was like, oh, yeah, look at him. He's like, oh, that's not that bad. That's pretty damn good, you know? I already have a LeBlanc <laughs> with me, uh, you know, and a Justice and a, and a Jeweled Gauntlet. As, uh, unfortunately, we are going to uh, be getting a Ooh. pause. Hopefully, we'll get that sword. But yeah, I love Snooty. His face there, Calter, his face just said it all. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole thing, isn't it? This is why we love our players on the cameras. You know, TFT as its baseline has always been about the players and about their individual personalities. You can see that so much more clearly when you can see their reactions to what's going on. So we thank all our players who have provided those ones. We can see Salvi deep in the tank up at the top there. This is a huge moment for them. You can see, you know, this is very well a defining moment for their TFT careers here. Even players like Salvi who've won a Golden Spatch Cup before, there's never any guarantees of what a given day of TFT is going to look like. You don't really have a, a moment really where you have a pause mid game in, in, in TFT. So it'd be interesting to, you know, think about, you know, what are the players thinking about at the moment? Are they thinking about, you know, what, what potentially their next moves are? Are they maybe just like trying to think to themselves, trying to get calm? What, what do you think they're doing counterfeit at the moment? Because like I said, it's very uncommon to see a, a pause really in a, in a TFT mm. game. Oh, absolutely, and I think that kind of threw the players off. I think, particularly noted for Salvi, you actually saw him sort of taking a second to be kind of meditative there mm -hmm. and make sure he was centered and he isn't getting thrown off because there's a ton of information in any given TFT game you need to keep track of, you need to keep your focus. So doing that while the pause is going on and not, you know, letting any of that leak out, letting yourself relax too much, but just stay focused is so important and we've seen that our break will be brief, so our players should be able to hit the ground running. 
I think Twitch chat hit the nails on the head there. Maybe they're checking tactics.tools, maybe. Maybe they're checking, like, huh, should I maybe go for this augment? Is this a pretty good augment to go? I would have been interesting if it just would have been before a <laughs> before a hero augment or something. It's like, huh, which one should I take? Which one should I pick? But I I'm sure these players have a lot of experience. They know exactly what traits to go for, as we can see. I mean, they've, they've got a lot of experience checking yeah. tactics.tools while they're playing. It's fine. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Quick alt tab here and there, you know, you got the fast thing is you need the fast fingers to just click the d key every so often you know pick the unit so i'm sure alt tab is not that different <laughs> all right we check in with gumbay up against snooty booster snooty has no streak going and it, fascinating itemization on the renekton there bringing out the ginsu's rage blade which is interesting because <laughs> renekton already has a massive amount of attack speed I think it's very interesting. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, normally you see like a, more tanky items, really, or more, maybe a healing item for this Renekton, because like you mentioned, it already has a lot of attack speed, but this just means this crocodile is going to be even scarier than what it was before. You thought he was attacking a lot before. Now he's going to be attacking even more. So we get a hero prismatic into a gold augment. What do you think Snooty might pick Ooh. up here, Counterfair? We know we've got the admin in place, so I've been thinking, I'm thinking, of course, we're building a lot around our casters, so it makes sense. Right now, we've got a massive mana injection for the Sablanc. The mana zany EO does mean that a lot of the damage is going to be front-loaded in the fight. You know, she gets the first cast, and she starts casting again and again, so a lot of that damage is going to be going into frontliners, hopefully looking to delete them and then get into the underbelly of the squad. Not to mention, you know, Snoody's admins as well. It has the, you know, your team will gain mana and also your team will gain ability power for the rest of the combat as well. So she's getting more mana, more casts on this LeBlanc. And as you said, she's going to be very, very scary. But as we take a look at Norby's board here, post a lot of free stars. Yeah, preparation super. As you noticed before, preparation is adding an extra layer on top of how strong these units are. We'll get a chance to go up against Snoody Boo, who's roughly in the same spot in its lobby that Norby is right now, right towards the middle, Salvi uh, and Digger's partner down at the bottom of the table, so both these two players looking to try and maintain a mid safe position that can take them into the late game without having to worry too much about getting wiped out. I think the interesting thing as well is you see a chilled gauntlet slam as well by, uh, by Norby, mm -hmm. so I think that just kind of just relates to how aggressive these lobbies have been because we're getting some item slams on some units that we don't normally see but it's because the you know players want to keep their hp high they want to keep the momentum going oh this is everyone's worst nightmare look at the bench norby your one-off <laughs> malphite your one-off jacks but still has a lot of hp to play with so i think he'll be totally fine with his position well, yeah, I mean, he's got enough HP to last for the time being, but Digger's Partner and Salvi, as I mentioned before, down at the bottom, definitely do not. We check in with Salvi, who noted before, Salvi ran the recon comp in the last game we saw on stream and came seventh with exactly the same hero augment as well. What a thing it would be if that happened two games back to back on stream. Might even get an 8th here as well, we'll have to see how this fight lasts, this is two of the bottom players fighting it out, but it does look like the recon's gonna come Ooh. on top! Degas just survives on 3 HP, but yeah, like you mentioned, like you mentioned, recon's not having a lot of success today, maybe not as much success in previous days. No, no yeah, we would think that the golden ticket would be absolutely the way to make this composition work, just to speed up, as we do see the Renekton <laughs> just absolutely... I'm really wondering what our third item on Renekton is going to look like here, because right now he's an absolute tank, and the only piece missing is just the damage to go with all that attack speed. Yeah, like I said, maybe a, maybe a healing item, maybe a, a, a Titans could be, you know, really good here for the Renekton as we take a look at the hmm. carousel. There is no Felios. I don't think anyone in this lobby is playing Sure Shot from what I can remember, so... But there's no way this bow goes the whole way. Okay, I was going to say, if no one picks up an Aphelios with a bow, I'm surprised it even went that far, to be honest with you. But uh, that shows, so it's just, yep, yeah, the trying to be picked up as well, which it is rainy weather, so it will give um, a little bit of extra mana if you do want to play uh, that Janna in the end. So, let's check out my diggers here. We were also seeing a board which we saw be very successful in the previous lobby. We are throwing the Threats and the Renegades together. This is Threat level maximum, so Diggers Partner looks like he's in the middle of transitioning, perhaps, to a more Threat-centric board. Right now, Viego is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I guess he was a little bit unfortunate, maybe, with the, um, with the last Augment choice. 
As you can see, you got threat level maximum plus renegade. This is something you don't really see too often, but that's the thing with the Viego is that your frontline can be very, very flexible. As he comes up against a very scary board, though, with Snooty, this might be the last we see of Degas. At least we have got the silence on to the LeBlanc, which will cut down some of the damage. But yeah, Viego getting right into the middle of things and just ripped to pieces. End of the line. And that will be our first elimination. Salvi does take a loss as well, but does not go out. So only one elimination this round. And Salvi only on 9 HP. You can see that, you know, the top six players are quite close to go. Well, the top two are close together. And then the next four are very, very close. And you have a big, massive gap uh, towards Salvi. Take a look. We haven't seen... Uh, Muji's board for quite a while, but with this carry Lin Lee Sin augment with the Echo 2 style, it's a really, really big front line that allows the back line like a LeBlanc to keep building up. Yeah, I really like this as well. Yeah, with the heart in the mix, just keeping the round going for a long time can work really, really well. Itemization not fully online as of yet for LeBlanc. We do know LeBlanc is contesting this lobby, so we shouldn't necessarily be expecting any three stars coming through. No, quite far away. Speaking of three stars, Salvi looks to be very, very close oh, to this no. Kaiser three star. One away. I mean, you only have the Thieves Gloves on the Kaiser as well, so maybe not the items uh, that you are looking for. It's going to come down to this last fight. I don't know if the recons are going to be enough counterfeit. No, you're right. It's really unfortunate itemization for Salvi. I think also as well that we're sending the Ezreal items onto the back line where we can see they're doing absolutely nothing to keep Vayne alive. Salvi takes two sevenths in a row with the same board and the same augment. Something's got to change for him. Yeah, he definitely has to switch something up and it's, it's kind of the, the, the theme at the moment today. You know, Recon has gone seven, eighth, seventh, seventh in the first three rounds of today. And that just shows, you know, because we have these 2-1 or 2-1 uh, hero augments, because these lobbies are going very aggressive with leveling and with rolling down, especially at 3-2, it doesn't allow you to, get, you know, have enough time to roll down for these three stars. And one of the reasons the pace is staying so high is Gun Maze Brawlers here. We expected big things and you called it exactly. The Reign of Anger Renekton now be backed up by the healing from the Bloodthirster. So you thought you couldn't put him down before. It's going to be even tougher now that he's got the max HP shield. <laughs> more attack speed, more healing. I mean, what, what more do you want? What more do you want? There seems to be a lot of Brawler players actually in this lobby. We see another Brawler Ooh. player here as well. Jax as well with the Rapid Fire Cannon and the Giant Slayer. Obviously has the uh, Vi Carry Augment in there as well. Yeah, I mean, this is the one which we're looking to be, you know, the massive carry. I mean, this is, all, you know, this is pretty much the classic setup here. We've got the Rapid Fire Cannon, which means Jack stays out of trouble. We've got an incredibly strong Vi frontline. I guess the question is whether, you know, Vi 2 for the time being can remotely compare to what Renekton 3 is putting out. I, I think I got a bit mistaken. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I think this is actually the uh, the Vi. Yeah, the, it's the Vi support augment that we're looking at. My bad. I thought it was. Oh no! I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting my I'm getting my purples and blues mixed up. It's actually the other board that we're looking at, Snoopy, that has the oh no carry augment. I'm getting my blues and purples mixed up now. I guess <laughs> getting color I mean, I this is just too crazy. <laughs> These things happen on the battlefield. There's so many carries going around. But it's a reasonable thing to assume that any hero we see on the board is going to be carry. But at least, even with just the support augment, Jinx RL's board is strong enough for three item jacks. A little bit non traditionally itemized, but still working pretty well. Yeah, you have that rapid fire cannon for the extra range. You can see you just put Jax in the back line. That's exactly what you need to do. And this is a bit of a throwback to a comp that was, I think, a few months ago was maybe everyone's worst nightmare. You see like three or four Jax players, everyone just having two star Jax. Obviously not as strong now. But, you know, Nuki's not in a bad spot, currently sitting at 26 HP. But there's a big gap, as I mentioned before, between the top two players, Muji and Gunmei, and the rest of the lobby. Well, I'm going to eat my words. Snooty Boo has managed to find three-star LeBlanc and maybe can claw himself out of this four-player pack in the middle. Oh, this is against the three-star Draven. <laughs> Look at the LeBlanc damage. The damage on top of the banner uh -huh. as well. She keeps casting, baby. 
But this is the problem we were talking about before. A lot of this LeBlanc's damage is front-loaded, so she's now no longer got a casting speed item. It is good enough to get the job done, though, because once the rest of the board is done, the damage just starts to focus in. Sunfar Cape as well puts Norby down to Elimination Zone. Tropical's still fighting and also takes the L. I guess we've resolved our middle pack situation because two players are close to dead as well. Yeah, you see Gunmei actually losing this round as well. So two oh. top players were going against each other. And we can see Tropical's position at the moment. This is the player that had the Silas in the early game. As we take a look at the, the roll downs coming in, we're looking for the three stars. Oh boy. But as you said, Nobby has been playing very aggressively with his econ. The League of Draven allows him to just play a whole different game because the more kills he gets, the more he gets paid. So he can spend that money to get more kills and more gold. And not really the position that he wants to be in, though, unfortunately. You would have thought maybe with the League of Draven, he would have at least been level 8 for now. But instead of going for levels, just going for more um, more rerolls and trying to go for more three stars. Instead, we take a look at the picture in picture. We see both our bot two players batting it out to see who's going to survive. I don't like Nookie's chances up against the Brawler board. The Draven board should be interesting because it immediately gets reduced onto one unit and there's not a lot of single target damage for the Anima squad at all. Misfortune you can see kind of glancing off the Draven, so I think that's going to be good enough to keep Norby alive, but for Nookie, it's going to be a pretty tight end of round. Yeah, the reign of anger in here. Look at that, the Sejuani stun into oh my gosh. In overtime as well. And that actually knocks him out. The, oh, I'm so close in the end, but Nuki goes out in sixth place. Oh, wow. I had my doubts about the Renekton itemization, but I've been proven very wrong. That was nightmarishly strong. And now Norby and Snooty Boo and Tropical all around 10 HP. A single life remains. Gunmei and Mujiwara ruling this lobby. And they are a step above the rest at the moment. You can see the players picking up their items at the moment. Tropical actually went for the Jawless Bat. Snooty went for the second Giant Slayer, I think he, he put in in the end. So just getting to a little bit more damage onto this Soraka. But even with this three-star LeBlanc, doesn't look like he's in a very, very good, you know, positive position at the moment. Only 10 HP. Well, I mean, the board does look good, but yeah, I think the lack of levels and the lack of gold are really hurting Snooty, just because things are picking up. Mujibara has kept the win streak at 82 HP, which is wild. Tropical getting a two-star misfortune as well. This board may be strong, but we will be seeing an elimination on the right-hand side of your screen. Yeah, Snooty is going to come up really, really hard against this Radiance Dragon's Claw. You can see the LeBlanc is tickling this Silas. The three-star carry Silas. There is nothing that this LeBlanc could do. As I say that, maybe it's enough, but the misfortune damage in the end as well. It's going to be close, but it's not going to be enough. Snooty's going to go out, but it looks like we're also going to get a knockout on the left side of the screen as well, potentially. Or is the Draven going to be enough? Draven 1v1ing against LeBlanc gets the win there. And that's the problem I was talking about for LeBlanc with the you know, with the initial mana pumping in. If there's a tank strong enough to deny the initial damage, you fall off a cliff. Snoodyboo out in fifth. Remember, we are in lobby three. So our players need strong finishes if they've got our dream of contesting for the crown here in the Golden Spatula Cup number two. Yeah, all these players around the middle of the pack at the moment so every single position every single point matters to all of these players and will be going for the level up in the end just putting in a poppy one star oh you never know it could be the difference we'll have to see here imagine if the one star poppy just you know clutches it all out <laughs> it's uh you're going up against the reign of anger renekton though so i'm not too sure about that one well i suppose at least renekton is putting out physical damage which is <laughs> something but yeah, I mean, the rest of the team is very, very strong as well. I think Norby's going to struggle to get more than his current placement. Over on the other side, Tropical with a fascinating approach. The Kingmaker, of course, popular for a little while, but dropping off the radar oh, no. bit. That's mean it's a super strong front line. The, the, the Draven in the end as well actually took down the Renekton. So the three-star Draven actually was enough. And the Renekton, he actually was able to, you know, walk around and target the Draven. But there just wasn't enough damage in the end. And the Draven three-star, it was enough to come up on top. And we're going into stage six. And this HP, you know, again, you still got that big massive gap, though, between the top two and the bottom two. So every single fight is going to matter. As you say, the, the points that Norby and Tropical get here could very well be the difference. You're going third or going fourth. That could be the one point that keeps you from being able to compete for the top of the table and get 
those maximal points, even if you can't win the competition. But you're looking at over the balls we've got here, Mujiwara, like, man, we mentioned him before, came in second on one of our previous Golden Spatula Cups, looks to be you know, in pole position here in Lobby 3. For sure, our last Egyptian player standing as well for Muji, so it would be really great for him and really great for, you know, the MENA region as well to be able to, you know, see that, like, oh, you know, Muji's actually doing it. He's actually doing it insanely well. And, you know, it's a great step up and being able to potentially win this lobby. has so much HP to play with. Look at that. I could just go to level 9 now if you want to. So, yeah, go, go to level 9. Does it even need to roll? I don't think. I think you just sit at level 9 and he's completely fine. Yeah, and I love this setup we've got here. You know, we've got a load of HP, a decent amount of gold at level 9. Gunmate is getting some upgrades in, but surely, surely we see it. Okay, yes, we definitely see an elimination this round, but at least their fate is in both of their hands. Yeah, Tropical versus Norby, both of them are going head to head right now to see who's going to come out on top. Is it going to be the Draven? Is it going to be this Silas? I love seeing the Silas coming through. It's such a throwback to before. 1v, almost 1v1, but Draven's a little bit stronger. Tropical will be heading out of here in fourth place. Norby, very, very thankful he's going to be able to hold on and get the top three. My God, and you know what's crazy is that these two players battled it out a few rounds ago and Tropical was able to come out on top, but, but the, the positioning in the end, I guess, from Norby was enough for him to win that round, focusing on that Silas, bursting him down and getting that damage on the Misfortune. That could be the difference as well, you know, fourth and third place can still be the difference. Yeah, I mean, and Norby's on a win streak as well, as you said, as we got the three star coming in. So this is a, remember, a cleansing safeguard lease in. So that is a significant upgrade. And Mujiwara's still got a lot of stuff he can still build up stronger to try and end up this game in first place. Is the same thing going to happen again? Is this Draven going to target the Renekton and take him down? The good thing is the Sejuani is on the Draven, so looking to try and CC this Draven as much as he can. Draven is stunned for the moment. Renekton's bursting through that front line. Yeah, I mean, that's very deliberate to try and reduce the amount of uptime that Draven has. Now we're in a bit of an awkward spot as the Brawlers the block stun. Daxus for a second. That's going to be massive. The heal is dependent on getting the cards off. Renekton is strong enough. Norby is out of there. And we are left with two Titanic players to battle for first place. And you could have seen the reaction from Gunmei there. He's so, so happy about that because he was so worried. He lost that round a few uh, He lost that battle a few rounds ago. But he was able to position the Sejuani the same side as the Draven. And the Sejuani was able to get onto the Draven, stun the Draven a couple of times. That means that damage output was not there and as we look forward to our battle between these two and keeping on the Sejuani again we have got the upgraded Nunu coming from Mujiwara and it's going front and the center this is a beastly tank that is going to be drawing these melee brawlers around the place as they try and chase it and Nunu for now is just going to be rolling around the Renekton is straight onto the back line already again oh Gummy's boy positioning is absolutely insane Renekton's tearing through this back line we do see the Renekton being drawn back for a second but yeah you made a great point about the ability to lap around the flanks with the back line is gone I think it's going to be all she wrote for this Nunu we've still got a few more rounds in the tank to see if the Gummy can fix his positioning <laughs> the Nunu just turned around and just went bump. It's just like, goodbye. There's, there's nothing else left. That was absolutely insane. I thought that maybe the auto attacks was going to be enough for the Nunu to go down. But Nunu just turned around and was just like, nope, not today. But there's still a few rounds left here. All right, so we're keeping very close eyes on where this Renekton goes next. Lots of items coming in. So we have got a Shroud, and we know that the Brawlers do love to clump themselves up. You mentioned you know, how important the Sejuani is going to be in terms of how the matchup plays out. If she can get shrouded, that will slow down her impact considerably. Positioning is the key here for both of these players. Gunmain needs to try and position this Renekton. You can see the Renekton is in the second row because you want to try and get this Renekton to wrap around. Last minute switch as well from Gunmei. Is this going to be enough? Is it going to wrap around? Soraka is on the opposite side though. 
Yeah, there you go. Exactly as you said. Renekton walks right into the back line. Mujibara has got a few extra friends to bring in, but... Just say, there's tons of good stuff on Mujibara's bench, but with the Syndra being taken out early on, he's not going to get to make use of most of it. And actually, the Syndra bringing in the Urgot there was probably enough crowd control to be able to... Oh, wait, or is it still going to be enough? The attack speed's still there? I don't think it's going to be enough, though. This three-star Lee Sin, yep, it's going to be another round over to Muji. Ooh. This does make sense though, you know, the Draven two cost reroll shouldn't be able to compete with all these five costs coming in. The Brawler board built around a three cost reroll and a one cost reroll as well. You know, from a you know, set design perspective, you should imagine that we shouldn't even be entertaining the notion that Gunmate's one cost reroll should be able to fight all this five costs. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like over time, Gunmei's position is just going to get weaker and weaker. And because Muji is level 5, and you can see on his bench as well, 2-star Fiddlesticks, 2-star Urgot as well. So if this Syndra, and I, he even got lucky, he got a Spirit Shoujin on the Syndra as well oh, with boy. Rapid Fire Cannon. So it's all about what's the Syndra going to bring in, and it's going to be that 2-star Urgot. Yeah, that's what you said. It's difference maker before. Also, we see Renekton getting caught up on the Sejuani, so he's not lapping into the back rank, where Soraka is waiting. The healing is good enough to keep the Lee Sin up, and Renekton locked in place. While the bench empties onto the ball for Mujiwara, he has reached a whole different level. Renekton goes onto Soraka and will get immediately deleted. Gumbe is exploded, and Mujiwara bringing it home for Egypt in Lobby 3. Beautiful performance from Muji in the end, an absolutely stellar performance from him. And as I mentioned, you know, positioning was the key really in this lobby. You, you see the, the position of Gunmei trying to predict where the Soraka is going to be, where do I position my Renekton? But in that last fight, you can see that Renekton was actually stuck on that, you know, on the carry Lee Sin. And that meant that you're not going to be able to do that much damage. You can't move into that backline and try and get rid of the backline carries. Oh boy, that was absolutely wild, but we're not going to be slowing down at all. We, we will take a little break just to allow our players to catch their breath. Our analyst desk will be returning. Of course, in the meantime, we will have an interview, so we'll catch you folks in just a few minutes' time. That's why, that's why I am named myself Elia TFT because I'm not that creative. I'm from Germany and my goal this year is just to get day free so I qualify for regionals. I really enjoy playing this set. It's so much better than the last set like the hero. Hero augment mechanic is really fun, especially now that they, they introduce four rerolls and you don't need to waste, yeah, you don't need to save your normal augment reroll so you don't get more dog that often and I didn't really like the dragons, so that's nice that they are gone. That's pretty hard to say, like, if, like a lot of good, really good players, like like the friend drones, like Dub Double, German Legend, Salvi. I played versus him in German League and he, he, he destroyed us really hard, so he's probably one of the only people I'm really scared of in Germany, but yeah, that, that's that's a hard question because there are so much good competitors and it's it's always decided by like who got the best opener, who got a good day, like who is com and who is comfortable on the patch and because the patch is really fresh, it's really hard to say right now who's who's gonna be the the most difficult player to play against. I wanna shout out the German community, especially especially Memo and his Discord. Because they're the reason I even I made it this far. Without the support of German of the German community, I would wouldn't have been been I wouldn't have gotten that far in TFT. I would probably have stopped at like reaching Challenger, resetting and quitting. Home. 
Welcome back, everyone. We're here to break down everything that happened in that game three. I am, of course, Petrus Panda, joined once again by Wida. And Wida, the trait to highlight, the, the units to highlight are the brawlers getting up close and personal and finding some success, but also not so much of it for some of our other players. Why do you think this was, Wida? I think it's due to the nature of some of these early augments that came through, right? I think for, uh, when you look at Gun Maze Board, for example, very clear priority on Brawlers, and all these players were also playing into either a cleansing safeguard or were playing for more transitionary boards. And then you have someone like uh, Tropical who was going for something that didn't involve Brawlers at all, also didn't end up in all involving Brawlers, but kind of whiffed on his free one, on his free one roll down, and actually managed to save that game in a very ex a very impressive fashion, because we've seen players that have whiffed those roll downs before just full on tilt and go eighth. We did see some boards that were very brawler centric via both support and carry. We saw a Jax reroll player, we saw Gunmate on Renekton reroll, which kind of had that Jax reroll as a support later on to hit that second power spike later in the game. And of course, Mujiwara playing the now bug fix and now very appropriate and morally okay cleansing safeguard board with the Lee Sin. Had a very good start early on. And the, the key thing to distinguish here is that despite all these players playing brawler boards, it's not the same brawler that is a star of a show into these comps. But for players like Mujiwara and Gunmei, who are favoring Renekton and Lee Sin, these lower cost brawlers, they found their star of the show three star very early on, and then they were able to, again, capitalize on that and get first and second. Players like uh, Nookie, for example, the complete opposite. He's trying to go for Jax reroll. Everyone's stealing his Jax as just a support unit. Even the Draven player had a Jax three before him, and that makes it so impossible for him to hit his actual spike and finish him in the top four. So I think it was a little bit unfortunate for some of our players who thought they were A-OK -okay to play certain reroll comps, and in the end, it was not the case. Now, and I think that like, this entire game is kind of like why so many people are starting to talk about like Mujiwara as a player in general, right? Because we saw this during GSC 3 of Dragonlance where he came in and finished second place and had a good shot of winning that as well. But he just plays like such a different style because he's so removed from a lot of the traditional communities. He doesn't necessarily play a lot of EOS ladder or anything like that. So it's not someone that people are used to seeing, but it does have this super flexible play style where he's going to just prioritize whatever he's hitting and play around that. We saw it yesterday when he started slamming the Archangel Staff, something that you prioritized and talked about yesterday as well, David. Exactly. Also, a lot of thing to mention as well in terms of the items. Radiant Relics were, was picked up by two different players. When you are playing the super tank kind of role, Aug was playing that Kingslayer with the Silas as the main tank, had that Radiant item to put on him. Similarly for Mujiwara with that Sunlight Cape on the Lee Sin, you're able to get that much more value out of this, this juiced up item because you're putting it on a, on, an, on a unit that you want to make the star of the show. You want to have those three items. The stronger those items are, the better this unit will perform when it comes to trying to carry the entirety of your comp. And that was the case. One last note I think we have to mention, uh, at this time not, not a happy one, it is of course Salvi once again playing Recon, not finding success despite the fact that he's rolling for three star units. You're thinking there's a LeBlanc 3 on Snooty board, there's a, there's a Jax 3 somewhere else on the Draven board, surely I can roll in this three cost slot and find my upgrades. Was not the case for a second game in a row, I think it's just something that players have to understand with Recons. It is a comp that sometimes you can do everything right, the game will not give you the right answers that you need, and you will go seventh as we've seen in the first three games today. Yeah, he didn't have that golden ticket to really help him along, but again, he didn't, couldn't get his economy under control. So let's take a brief look at our full standings so far. And for Salvi and Snooty, these two players now, they find themselves down towards the bottom of the table alongside Kevin Parker and maybe a little bit of surprising fashion. Campus, yesterday's first place finisher, also finding themselves in this bottom half of the table, David. Look at the top half though, Sage, a player that I first saw in set six, dominating the AP trees with Malzahar, with Mutants, and just a very young player at the time, still very young, but still also very dominant. We're seeing it here, 22 points after three games, we had a 8-7-7, might be in the projection to end up with above 40 points on a six game day, which is when you know someone really was dominant all throughout the day. And this is the day three of a GSC, so I think even more impressive. I think our casters are gonna be ready to go. We have game four lined up for us and 
I'm hoping to see maybe some different hero augment choices, just maybe normal augment choices at 2-1. All right, thank you guys. Of course, we're not here to see anything remotely normal. We're here to see the bleeding edge of TFT. My name's kind of a along size, Stuart. So far, we haven't even had a chance to really catch our breath here in day three because our players have been so off the charts and nothing is gonna change there because we are headed to the very top of the mountain, Lobby One. Sage at the moment has that little bit of a gap, but you know, Poland doing insanely well here in day number three, the second most represented, uh, re uh, second most represented country, sorry, uh, in day number three, and both of them sitting at the top, and both of them are in this lobby trying to make a name for themselves. Yeah, and I don't think we've maybe given enough time to Poland as a region. To have the first and second place at this point is incredible. And particularly for Sage, you know, you know, to come into this one, Sage has been an incredibly consistent player, but we didn't expect him necessarily to be the most explosive player as well. No, definitely not. You know, day number one, 14th place. Day number two, also 14th place. I guess they, you know, had some good sleep last night. You know, just something clicked, <laughs> I guess, in the morning. And now you're just like, okay, now I've got that little bit of a gap. And the gap, even though it's three points, three points can still be a lot. Because, you know, the points at the moment is, you know, it goes eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So it means that, you know, getting that difference and getting that early lead, you just need to stay consistent and try and stay out on top. So let's check in with Kasperky, one of the top players in this lobby. So remember, as we saw right back at the beginning briefly, Sage is on 22 points. Kasperky and Marks on 19 points. Sasa, Ging on 18. And then the rest of the lobby on 17. Because we're at lobby one here in round four, we are starting to really have the conversation about who could be champion today. Yeah, definitely. So we have to keep an eye on the them top three to see how it goes. You can see... I'm going to be switching boards. Nothing too crazy so far. Oh, Champion Duplicator. I mean, you'll mm -hmm. take that, I guess, you know. Nice juicy jump Champion Duplicator. Okay, it's not the lesser Champion Duplicator, um, which, you know, actually might be quite okay because we've been talking about it a little bit, um, you know, with these aggressive lobbies. We're looking for maybe like these one or two star rerolls. Unfortunately, well, maybe for some fortunately, <laughs> we don't actually get a hero <laughs> or good in stage two one. I mean, Gersko could take the trade sector and decide to go down a reroll route again. We've certainly seen he's more than capable of it before, but Ascension certainly seems like, you know, keeping things nice and generic would give them the most options. We do know Triforce can be good, but as I mentioned on the desk, while there are a lot of three comps going around right now, so we know the recons have been disappointing. Uh, so what do you do here? Do you maybe take the trade sector? You have a few pairs. Do you play aggressive? Rerolls oh. instead. That is very interesting. And I think he did have a duelist on the bench. Yeah, he has a duelist on the bench. Hand okay. finds a Fiora as well. So this is looking like a little bit of a pivot into a duelist angle. Yeah, I mean, earlier in the day, we, everyone was talking about the whole knife edge being one which hadn't been seen a ton of. But when it comes out, it makes a massive impact. Kostowski... Uh, going instead of a raw damage output, going for the rich get richer. And based on what we've seen so far, Stuart, you know, are you more favoring you know, picking an aggressive one like Yosko or picking something economic like we see from Kaspersky? I think with the way that the lobbies have gone, I, I much prefer to see these combat augments, you know, like the Knife's Edge, because we're seeing that these lobbies are playing so aggressive. We're seeing a lot of roll downs at stage 3-2. We're seeing a lot of Ooh. aggressive leveling, duelist spat as well, so this might be... A little bit of a contest contestion here. We're already seeing two duelist players. We'll have to see what the other hero augments are, but a scary looking Draven early on. Yeah, I mean, doing a great job of carrying the duelist. So, you know, to touch back on what we saw earlier on for Giosco then, we know the Battle Mage is very you know, flexible. You can play a whole bunch of different compositions with that, but mm. you do prefer a few. Knife's Edge, I'm assuming, isn't anywhere near as flexible to be able to change path as they will actually get to look directly into each other's eyes. Yeah, both the duelist players are going to be going head to head, but yeah, I, I think I do. I think that it's basically with Knife's Edge, you're basically most of the time only playing duelist. There's very rarely that you're going to play be playing something else. We did see a Knife's Edge Draven, uh, you know, a few lobbies ago, which was very very interesting. Uh, but I don't think with no Dravens that he's going to be picking up that. But yeah. Not as flexible as Battle Mage, but this contest here with the double duelist. Normally with duelist, you want to play for that early aggression. 
And we can see that early aggression is being levied out across the lobby, though, Sage being the recipient of it, as we have had some news about the other augments coming in. So we've had a couple of Rich Got Richer players come in. A Threes company, of course, we know is very proper as well. But Juso's option is the one which I'm finding most fascinating. They've taken the mascot crest from the beginning of the game and mm -hmm. immediately slammed in mascot four. Could this be a potential throwback to reroll mascot Yumi? Could this be oh the boy. time? Oh, that's the that's one big throwback. Mascot emblem, you've got the Poppy 2 star. To be honest, he has a lot of upgrades on his board as well, and has already slammed Archangel Staff. Not normally not the best item for AP units, but in the early game could definitely be enough. I mean, I suppose the mascots are gonna be sticking around for a long time, so at least the archangels will get time to stack. I suppose, you know, talk to me about what, what are the defining factors of playing a kind of a mascot comp like this? Because I presume, from what we've seen right now, a big part of it is having a front line that will refuse to quit. Yeah, the, the big thing with mascot is that because your frontline units most of the time are like, you know, one and two star units, that's when we're looking more towards the reroll, especially because the carry is most of the time Yumi. But then you can also use this mascot in the early game, which has, you know, got this really big heavy nerf a few months ago, but has been recently we've seen buff after buff. So maybe looking at it for, as a more tempo point of view, trying to get that early win streak, trying to get a little bit of tempo and then look to transition a little bit into later stages. Let's take a quick look around the inventory as we can see that we've got actually quite even split of players who've been slamming early on and players who are keeping their cards close to their chest. Speaking of cards though, we've got Sasa who's brought out underground from the beginning and is on a lost streak. Lost streak is the name of the game. Sunfire board as well for undergrounds. Does have it's gonna be potentially keeping the Kaiser on the bench as well. Maybe looking to Ah, oh, this is interesting. So he's getting... Does he get rid of the Ezreal to stop the four underground and play Brawler? No, he doesn't. Okay, switches in the end. But this is interesting. So he puts the KO mm. in the front line, and that's because maybe he's potentially trying to lose the round, but try not to lose it too hard to keep this lost streak. I mean, we always know this is the dance that our underground players in particular, our lost streaking players in general, always play is trying to make sure you don't you know, throw away your lost streak, but also don't get completely run over on the board. Unfortunately, in this case, Chuso is going to be running over Sasa, sending him down to the lowest in the lobby by a decent margin. Yeah, Sasa, one of the top players at the moment in the EU ladder, currently around the, you know, the top 20, so I'm, I'm sure he knows... You know, he's thinking on the back of his mind what the best option is to go for in terms of, you know, how he, he can reserve his HP, how he can also get the full benefit from Grund Underground. And also with that GP2 star, it's kind of interesting. We, did, we didn't get to see, you know, what the round's going to be looking like, but I, I think it's even a situation where you just get rid of the GP2 star and you just say, okay, I'm just going to full loss streak this, you know, entire stage and then look to try and upgrade my board when I hit level 6. It does make me a little worried for Sasa that he's you know, making the thought of he needs to make his board stronger to avoid taking these massive losses, but oh my gosh, Havalinik has already found a misfortune and has also got the jeweled lotus as well. This misfortune is going to hit like a truck. Oh, pretty much perfect items as well for the misfortune. You know, the Spirit Sojourn gives you the extra little bit of mana. Static Shiv may be not the best, but a little bit of extra mana will help and a little bit of extra shred as well, allowing her ability to do a little bit more damage, but yeah. We saw some high rolls earlier on with like Samira's in stage two and Sejuani's mm -hmm. in stage two. Now we get a misfortune as well. Like, I, I don't know how lo how much longer I can cope with these lobbies counterfeit. It's absolutely <laughs> wild. <laughs> As we said right back at the beginning, we are in Lobby 1. These are our best performing players in the entire competition. If you thought things were wild at the lower tables, it only gets absolutely crazier from here. Looking at our streaks in the lobby right now, Juso, who's brought out probably, uh, sorry, Juso, who's been bringing out one of the most unusual approaches to this game, is also the only person with a big win streak. And also another person that has a misfortune as well at stage two. Like, what? we got two misfortune drops at stage two already. I mean, you, you know, like you mentioned, a bit of a different and unique approach, I think, from Chuso. But I think it's a, a, a approach that's definitely um, kind of, uh, you know, different, but also, a, a, you know, kind of one, one that's working out very, very well. With the Poppy 2 star, being able to heal up that little bit with the Sunfire Cape as well for the front line, allows Misfortune to ramp up and do a lot of damage with the ultimate. 
Something that's jumping out at me here with you know, Jusso, uh, Jusso being in the lead at the moment, I did notice from all of our other players in the lobby, there's a lot of unspent gold right now across the field. Unlike our previous lobbies, people don't seem to be throwing it all in to try and maintain a win streak. No, maybe a bit of a slower lobby this time around, especially because we don't have the hero augments uh, at stage 2-1, so that's maybe why the lobbies have been a little bit more aggressive. But as I mentioned, you know, this front line is so difficult to break through, and it allows Misfortune to build up and deal a lot of damage. I mean, I know that this is going to be one of those situations we maybe will have to just wait and see, but for Chuso, you know, longer term, oh, actually, win. we'll come back to that moment, that notion in a second, because we've got our augments coming and got a little too carried away there. Uh, so for Sasa, this could be a big turning point on the underground loss streak, which has been going on since the start of the game. Second wind is going to be the choice here for Sasa. Sunfire board into second wind hasn't slammed a single item yet as well. Sitting on 55 HP. It's going to be going for the level up anyway, but I don't know if his board is good enough, even with you know, some of the upgraded units, because you've got no items on this board. But to be honest, mm. what items do you slam here? Double glove, double, you know, double um, bow is not the best option, really. I could imagine that Sasa would maybe hope to bring in the Samira at some point, so maybe a last mm. Whisper could we get a wayable with, but I mean, you know, this seems to be a big risk Sasa is taking, going deep into the underground, and we can see with their opponent coming up here, the balls are getting stronger and stronger, but Sasa is mainly staying pretty much in the same spot. Now you can see Marx's board here rolled all the way down to zero gold, got the Jax 2 star with the rapid fire cannon and that Hextech gunblade, so he's going to be hitting from range and healing a lot as well. And that is a huge, huge hit for Sasa, and he has to be thinking on the back of his mind what he's going to be able to do to try and turn this one around. Sasa was four stacks away, or four uh, underground stacks away from being able to cash out, so I imagine we'll be seeing that after our next round is completed. Looking across the rest of the lobby, though, Chuso remains undefeated. Kiosko in second place. We've got a lot of players around 80 HP, and then we start to drop off with Ging and Marks down at around 70. Joel, this is still going to be name of the game here. We'll have to see, you know, with Locket, Nyla 2-star as well. Again, another player that probably rolled down a lot of gold at level 6. It's normally what you see with Duelists and especially Brawlers is that because most of the units are very low on cost, you know, like the Nyla, uh, Nyla like the Jax, all these 3-cost unit, 3-star, three 3-cost, three, uh, three sorry, units, you want to try and roll down a 3-2 and try and get the early spike because if you're playing something like Duelists, loose streaking is not the best option because you're just going to fall off when the later stages come down. So we have a trick check on our admins, or rather, once we check on our augments, we can see that there is going to be the admin in place uh, over on a Ging's board. I think we might be able to... Uh, we have got a screenshot of that one that is, so we'll just relay to you folks what uh, is going to be going on there. So we've, at least we know we've got one admin player in the lobby. We've been seeing a ton of it across. Uh, it's going to be extra ability power for the, for the team coming in. So we know at least there's going to be one big caster player. Now, one big admin player, a few duelists as well in this lobby. We still don't know what direction really Sasa is going to go in. Looks like Sasa actually used one of his bows and one of his gloves. So maybe like you mentioned, Counterfeit, maybe, you know, trying to go down that Samira route with the short shot. We'll have to see in the end. But I think over eventually he had to slam something because he's already sitting on 31 HP in stage three. Not looking good for him for now. Oh boy, yeah, uh, of course, we've still got a ton more items come in, so there's presumably going to be the cash out death to Mana Manazane. It's decent, it costs nearly, you know, it costs two thirds of your HP to get to this point, Sasa, so I think you've got to take what you can get. Maybe not the best that he was looking for, because you can see he's already slammed the last Whisper, so Mana Zane maybe not the best, but if he can find maybe... A few more units. Are you trying to roll down, trying to get some upgrades here? Nothing. Um, it, it, I, to be honest, I don't think the board really upgraded that much, to be honest with you. It's not, I don't think it's, we're looking in a really strong spot here for Sasa. No, I don't think so either. I think it's going to be a longer term process and Sasa does not have very much time to make it work. For now, I guess it's going to be at least trying to soften the loss. So the front line is staying remarkably strong. The Mana Zenny means that when the Misfortune does cast, she will cast a couple of times in short order. And it actually is good enough to take a round off of Juso. 
Okay, Chuso dropping a little bit health. Must have lost the round previous to that as well. So maybe Chuso kind of falling back a little bit on that strength on the mascot, which, you know, as we mentioned, is a, is a bit different. Something that is really, really good in the early stages, but does fall off as well. But it was enough to give him that early win streak to give him enough gold. But now it's looking about trying to transition. When we get to stage four, we're looking to try and transition out of these mascots, maybe into something else. So Sasa ended up, you know, in terms of his own transition here, you know, we've got the Manazania, we've got the Death Defiance as well. I'm not a massive fan of the backline Death Defiance we saw from before, only really kicking in at the very end of combat. The front line has been good enough for now, up against a very aggressive AD, well, much more AD-centric lobby than we've seen previously. You know, for sure, we can see on the other side, Sage with the Duelist. Look at the Draven go. Duelist Draven. One of the first times that definitely I have seen it with the preparation on the bench. Maybe looking to try and find the Duelist, but it's not going to be enough. And Sarsar's going to win another round. So maybe, maybe I was wrong. Maybe this board is a little bit strong enough for now in stage three. But maybe when players are going to go into stage four and trying to roll down, that's maybe, maybe where it might fall off a little bit. Now we're keeping a very close eye on Sasa. Sage is the one who's kind of standing Ooh. in Sasa's way right now. As we check in with Chuso and talk to me, Stuart. What are you seeing? I see a Samira, I see a Zed, and I'm thinking to myself, how do you fit them in? And to be honest, I don't think there's any way you fit them in, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a bit unfortunate because only when you see a Samira, especially, uh, we, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but Samira is one of them, uh, you know, champions that you can bring in on one of them units that is really, really good, especially because of this ace trait. And we're seeing the same with Misfortune as well. When you find that early ace, whether it be Samira, whether it be Misfortune, you can slot it slot into pretty much any composition and and it's enough in stage three to give you that extra HP and allow you um, to win some rounds. If we take a look at admin here from Casper. I just want to take a second while we've got the econ up showing here. I know that both Ging and Kaspersky both have around 80 gold at this point, as well as Juso keeping things healthy at 50. So we are Talking about you know, the approach to the game overall here at Lobby 1, it does feel like our players are marshalling their resources extremely carefully. It's definitely not as aggressive as the last rounds, that's for sure. You can see 83 gold. The rich get richer. It's still going strong. Still 59 HP as well. I think you're looking at probably 4-2 here when the next augment comes up. Is this going to be a hero augment counterfeit? Are we going to get lucky? Maybe five cost augments, or are we just going to get another gold? Well, Chad, one of our admins did give us the reminders of the stats here. So it's an 87.5% chance of seeing a hero augment. So players have been Ooh. setting up, but it won't be as big as we thought. It's a 3 4 3. No five cost augment, which our players maybe would have been anticipating. Exactly that. You can see the roll down and oh no, it's. I think you have to go for aim assist here. Oh no, it actually goes no. for the what? That is really surprising. You see the board, you see the items, and you think to yourself, I mean, maybe it's just for hacker. Maybe you just play three hacker here. I mean, it is the support augment, which, if I remember, gives you a little bit of extra attack speed for your whole board. Hmm. So it's not too bad, to be honest with you. But I was thinking maybe aim assist as well, especially because you've got admin. Another Zed augment coming in as well, as you can see, um, the uh, support augment. You get a little bit of extra attack speeds for the rest of your board. Double support Z Augments coming in for this lobby. It's content for the week is definitely the less favoured of the two Z Augments generally. Uh, but maybe Sage was taking a slightly more conservative path and just said, you know what, a Z is good enough. We've got attack speed out the wazoo. We can always use some more up against Chuso's mascots board. We have got a mascot and Zack now in the mix. By misfortune, a little bit of time, but it's not quite enough. How does, I'm thinking at the top of my head, how does Zack interaction with mascot work? Does it mean that his little blobs also, I'm guessing it doesn't. It would be no. a cool interaction if his little <laughs> that blobs would be also. Wild. <laughs> Imagine if the little blobs also worked with mascot. You just got two little Zacks running around and just healing up a lot. But I, I don't think yeah. that's the case. But yeah, that would be very, very scary. But yeah, it's fortune making rain. Another support augment getting a little bit gold. 
Well, I mean, this is a great place for Shusa to be here. You know, he's got the HP. Oh, sorry, yes, he's got the HP to hold on, so he can get these three player combats in, get the twenty gold. I mean, this is basically an economy machine in a single augment. We talked about, you know, maybe our players being a little bit disappointed in the augments they've got. I think for Chuso, he's pretty damn happy. I think he's very, very happy. He allowed him to go up to level 8. It allowed him to roll down a little bit of gold. And the great thing, as you mentioned, with this Augment is that he's going to be getting that economy back from this Augment. So it means he can play aggressive. He can roll down. Unfortunately, didn't really find the units that he wanted to. No Misfortune 2-star. No Sejuani 2-star. You know, no Zac 2-star either. So the board is maybe not as strong as what he wanted. Maybe it's going to be enough, but that's a carry Misfortune Augment on the other side. Yeah, and this is the bit of a problem here. We noted before that Havali picked up the Misfortune extremely early, so Chuso would have known this was the case, and he's going to end up being slowed down considerably on hitting the two-star Misfortune now that it's directly contested. Now, as we take a look, as we go through the carousel, we can see Sasa is actually now on a win streak, mm. uh, which is very surprising. So maybe his board has been upgraded a lot. You can see we've got both Syndra and Janna as our two legendary units here for this carousel. Probably not two of the best ones that you would hope for. Especially Syndra. I think Syndra is an interesting topic because definitely hasn't been one of the most popular um, five-cost units in this set. It's not like a, a you know, as, you know, like the other ones that you can maybe slot in, like the Fiddlesticks, like mm. the Urgot. But as I say that, there is a Syndra on this board here with the admin. I mean, this is one of the contexts, absolutely, we can see Syndra coming in. As we will confirm, Ging is running Berserk, and we have seen exactly how ludicrous this can be. So, if the combat runs long, traditionally where heartboards get really, really strong, this allows for the Soraka to just murder everybody. To star Soraka in as well. And just a reminder with Ging's admin, remember, he's, his two, uh, two admin was every five seconds. Your team will gain ability power, so more damage mm -hmm. for Soraka. And guess what? On top of that, your team also gains ability power for the rest of the combat. So this Soraka is just going to be hitting and hitting, especially like you said, with the Berserk. Ging is looking in a very, very comfortable position. It's all about making those rounds run long. Right now, it's only a two-star Lee Sin. Itemized, but still a two-star Lee Sin holding up most of the front line. But it's good enough right now to keep the good times rolling. Gink is towards the mid of the table, so it's pretty okay with where he is. As Chuso ha gets handed out a loss, will actually slip below Ging on this top of the standings. Now, kind of a bit of a... Um, a, a bit of a, uh, you know... Uh, Going back to the overall standings uh, at the moment, we can see two of our top two players are currently sitting in the bottom four. You know, uh, Sage sitting in sixth. You can see uh, Kashba also sitting in eighth place. So they might give a little bit of a chance to, for more players to maybe close that gap onto Sage at the top at the moment. I mean, this it will be a hugely important result here in round four, particularly if Sage, who's currently three points ahead of anybody else, goes out early on. You're absolutely right. It closes the distance. It means that it's many, many more players can potentially take the crown here. We've only got two more games after this to determine who will take home Golden Spatula Cup number two crown. We'll have to see what this lobby is going to finish off with this misfortune carry augment is doing so much damage and the jacks has just been stuck on the zack for so so long the stun from the jinx as well few more auto attacks oh no the misfortune is still not enough but wait there's a fiddle i didn't see the fiddle <laughs> it's a surprise fiddle sticks the fiddle was kind of in camouflage with the mascots that were sitting on the edge of the board and i didn't even see the fiddle he just popped out of nowhere surprise i guess i was surprised as well as we check in with Giosko and, of course, the lobby overall, we noted before there was a ton of gold in the mix thanks to the rich got richer, but now our players have been more aggressively spending money. I think some of that might be having our two Polish players down at sub-20 HP. This is where things get interesting. We're going to go into stage five now where every single player is still alive. And the, to be honest, the HP is looking close as well. You know, we got a little bit of a gap at the top. Then we got 42, 44, 42, 40, 31. And even though Sasar is on 31, a seven win streak, the biggest streak in this game at the moment. So I have to see what difference that he's going to make with that little streak that he's going on at the moment. 
I think the bad news, particularly for Sage and Kaspersky down at the bottom, is that you know, we've got the players at the top of the lobby who've still got a ton of money to work with. Well, Gearscott's going to spend that money as we watch there. But it's so hard to climb back up the you know the scoreboard if you don't have the money to do it with and your opponent absolutely can do what they please. Yeah, we're taking a look at the, the board here as well. Actually, the bottom two players going head-to-head -head at the moment. We oh, could no. be seeing a knockout here, counterfeit. This would be devastating for the Polish fans if one of them ends up knocking out the other. It's going to be pretty tight on how close the round goes as the Zeds pass each other's ships in the night, walking up and deleting the Soraka. Now it's a Zed battle, Faker Ryu, one more time, but Sage doesn't take enough damage to be eliminated. Ah, uh, Sage is not in a good spot right now to start Echo, Echo here, and this... This support Z augment that we were talking about earlier was like, huh, this is actually really interesting that he's gone for support Z with the Soraka carry in the back line. You can see Sage at the moment, his, he's shaking his head. He knows he's in a very, very difficult spot, especially with only one star Zeds. Oh my gosh, so again, taking stock of where I can see Sage, we get worry written onto his face. It's running an incredibly powerful ball, but it's still not quite coming together. You see from the number of points here, Sage is of course always the player to watch right now. Because if, you know, if things stay the same for Sage, if he just hits the top fours and the like, he's got that cushion of points, which should keep him ahead of the pack. But if he goes out eight, as it seems like it's going to happen, all bets are off. Exactly, and that means he's only going to get one point, so he's only going to go up to 23, and that means that that gap is going to for sure get closer. Maybe not from this lobby, but maybe from others. Puts in, put, takes out the Aphelios and puts the Dusk Wave in, so changes the gun around. What will be the, di di the difference here? We'll be able to soften up more targets, but we won't have a single target damage for these Omega tanks. We do have the pick up on the ribbon on the back line, but the Zed that is did. gone just like that. Huge stun across most of the board. The Felios is still alive though, barely surviving the hail of bullets. Sage holds on, pushing Nick into a potential elimination territory next round. A duelist with the Aphelios was enough in the end, and I think the difference was actually him switching his uh, guns right at the end, going for the Dusk Wave, going for that AoE damage, was actually enough with the high attack speed as well from the duelist, so Sage lives to fight another day. Oh my gosh, Volley Nick, as you noted, the Bunny Mercer, we've got the two Misfortune players in this lobby, but because it's contested, Havali Nick, who hit Misfortune first, hasn't actually hit Misfortune 2 star as of yet, and might even die without that happening. That's absolutely crazy. I, imagine hitting a Misfortune uh, in Stage 2, and you don't find a single one all the way up until Stage 5. Like, oh, it's it's so sad. It's so, so sad. But maybe we're going to see, oh, this could be the knockout round counterfeit. We've got Volley Nick uh, going in 3D vision against you. So it's the two misfortunes, but one is definitely much stronger than the other. The ults to fight everything as the front lines. That mascot Zach cheering all the way through. Well, not even cheering because he's not even dead yet. This board is so much better than its opposite number. Uh, Volley Nick gets dropped out. We've got to check to see if we might have had another elimination as well. We have! Sage is gone and goes out in eighth. Eighth place for Sage, and every single player in this lobby at the moment is probably going absolutely wild. It's such a crazy result for all the rest of the players, but unfortunately for Sage, going out in eighth place means that he potentially might lose that top spot, or at the very least, the, the standings are going to get a lot closer now. Oh, for sure, particularly if any of our players are on 90 points, like Kaspersky or Marks get in, who are only, they're only three points behind in the first place. If they hit a top four, Sage can drop down dramatically, but there's still a lot of volatility. You can see our HP across the lobby is not high for anybody. Only Gyosko and Chuso have got any sense of safety at all. Every round counts now. Every positioning, everything matters. Brings in... And Nyla in the end to get a little bit of Star Guardian here with the... This is a really, really interesting comp from Kaspersky, but mm. this could be a knockout round for him against this scary board of the Soraka. Level 9 as well. It's a super scary board, but the Zed positioning is perfect. Goes straight onto Soraka, so won't have the time to build up oh. and go berserk. We do at least have the Syndra chucking and stuff onto the field, but I think... That could easily just be the end of the round immediately. Without Soraka, 
I don't know if this board can win. The, the healing's enough from the Zed. This Bloodthirster, the Edge of Night as well, is going to be enough. And that does mean that Kaspersky stays in this game. And actually, Marx is going to go down to five HPs. we got three players on single-digit HPs now. And we can see that our top four, three players at the moment in the current standings can all go bottom four in this lobby. And that's going to allow for some pretty major leapfrogging. This is what we want to see, of course, at this level of competition, that we are running for the finish line for everybody towards the end. Gang on a lost streak right now, that Berserk Soraka needs to stay alive or none of this works. Needs to get the positioning right here. We're going to see our picturing picture. Ging on the right, Kaspersky on the left. One of these players could be going down now. We'll have to see how this fight, fight it continues. The Rackers everywhere you look, but the Brawlers are so beefy. You just can't plink them away. When you've got the Hexet Gunblade on the Jacks, you need raw focus damage. And for Ging, a sense of dread sets all across. As we will see one, maybe two eliminations, dying of cutscene, dying of getting hit in the face with a lamppost. It's all the same. But the question is, what is the position going to be like when we come back? Oh, there's two players knocked out. Ging and Kaspersky. Kaspersky does get a fifth in the end and only by a few HP. But Ging going out in sixth place. That does mean Marks is able to get a top four finish. And that he's the highest points for any player in the lobby. Marks has got to be extremely pleased right now because he's got at least a one point ahead of Sasa and Gink on the table. I think Sasa will be the next one up to consider where they're going to end up overall. But this top four is building up to be massive. And these boards, of course, as we expected, off the charts. Exactly. We're going to be seeing what the next round is going to be. What is the uh, what is the positioning and everything going to be like for these players, especially when you don't really know who you're going to be up against. It's going to be a matter of positioning. It's going to be a matter of what is going to happen. Her got in there as well with the little bit of frontline. You can see, actually, did Sasa put in? Yeah, Sasa put in two ergots just to give him a little bit of extra econ. I think he was actually able to get a little bit of extra econ. Remember, Sasa was a player who was down at 30 HP with Underground in the early game. Yeah, what a recovery Sasa has made. I think we, this came up yesterday, of course, as well. You know, all of our players, of course, they are ridiculously good. Even a 1% advantage is going to be taken when the opportunity presents itself. As Shuso is now in on 18, point, 18 HP, Marks is probably the only player likely to be eliminated this round, and we'll get to see it face to face. We'll have to see. Maybe Chuso could get knocked out as well. But to be honest, with this two-star Felios in the backline, with the two-star Misfortune as well, both full items. And this mascot, Zach, I think is the big thing in this lobby. A mascot in general. It's something that I did not expect to see. But the Rivens on the Misfortune in the backline, will it be enough to take him out? Echoes of our Reign of Anger and Exum from before. But yeah, the multi-threat composition that Chuso's got going on here is so hard to deal with on an individual basis. Soraka will be torn into, and Marx is gone. Kiosko barely holding on. Oh, and Sasa is actually top of the lobby now on the win streak, level nine as well. Actually, I think every single person that is left in this lobby is level nine. Chuso level nine, Sasa level nine. So we are really hitting the late, late game. Everyone is going to be trying to go for the legendary boards and trying to get the units possible. Oh, boy. Giosko is definitely playing on the very edge here. I love the double locket with the newly nerfed Nila. Still very, very good. It feels like so much is going to be based on where this uh, Zed will land. We do have the split carries, but it's going to be the Aphelios taken out immediately as we keep our eyes on all three remaining players. Yeah, as you said, the Zed positioning was absolutely you know, insane here, going on straight on top of that Aphelios. But the problem is, Aphelios is not the only carry in this comp. You can see the Misfortune building up over time. What is this cast going Ooh. to look like? Is the Zed going to go down? He is! Yosko, head and hands, I'm sure, at this point. The Misfortune just too damn stronger. The four-item Misfortune with the Archangels we were a little iffy about. But yeah, you start critting off those Archangel shots and everything dies. 
absolutely insane. You know, the positioning of the duelist is so important, but it's something that we were talking about. But now it comes down to our last two players. Sasa in this lobby was down to the bottom, 30 HP. As I mentioned, you know, it's a very, very strong player, very, very high up on the ladder, and he was able to climb back all the way into our top two, and this could potentially be our last fight of this round. Let's see if Chiefs has got what it takes. Mascot from the beginning of the game brought into an end game nightmare. The throwback composition from Sasa. Aces for days. Misfortunes on both sides of the field. Morkaiser rips through the front line. The mascots cannot stand in the face of all this firepower. And I think it's going to be the end of there. One more cutscene. Sasa brings himself back from the brink and heads into the final two rounds with a magnificent first. What an insane performance by Sasa. Throughout the whole game, we were talking to each other. We were saying, you know, is Sasa going to be, is he going to be able to do enough? Is he going to be able to turn it around when he was sitting down at the bottom on 30 HP? But the underground in the end, the Samira in the end as well, was enough for him to turn it around. Another insane lobby. This, this day has got absolutely everything. I think this really did answer our question, which is kind of be floating around for the entire competition. You know, when you're in this situation where there's so much at stake for the players, do you want to take a huge risk like going deep into underground for the possibility you turn around to your lobby and get the first place? In this case, it worked out amazingly well. I have to think this is going to influence our players going forwards. Yeah, definitely, especially with Sage going eighth as well. I'm really, really curious to see the standings as well, which I'm sure our analysts will go through. So I'm very, very curious to see if that gap has maybe been smaller or maybe someone has even overtaken Sage in that number one spot. All right, so stay tuned. We are gearing up into going to our final two games to determine who will be champion here at the Golden Special Cup number two. We head to break where we'll have an interview with Lusha. When we return, our analyst desk will break down game number four. I'm Lesha, I'm 28, I'm coming from Germany, but I'm currently living in Norway and, well, playing TFT for fun. And since I like competing, I guess I uh, also got pretty good at it, playing for fun. So yeah, excited to be here. Mm, I really like the units in this set and traits, especially threats. I think uh, threats are very flexible and uh, I like that. Um, I'm a bit torn um, on the set mechanic because on the one side hero augments introduce uh, a lot of cool unique ways to play champions like they add new dimensions to specific comps but uh, i'm not really a fan of having such a strong indicator on uh, what to play when you pick it so um, i think it's an interesting mechanic that could certainly be uh, improved and maybe tweaked a bit to make it uh, well more flexible as well after picking it I think there are lots of players that have a good shot that can be considered the best. Um, I, I mean, obviously, Saru won the first one, uh, which was a strong showing of, from his side. But, um, well, obviously, I myself have a good shot as well, right? I think I had good performances uh, on ladder in the last weeks. My first GSC was decent as well, hitting the finals. Uh, and then we have other legacy players like Double, Basic or Salvi, who I always think can win a tournament. Um, I would like to thank everyone that's supporting me, like in my stream or on Discord or wherever we interact. Especially the other players in the German community, uh, in the German community are well, always very friendly, eager to help and also are always good for some trash talk. Um, so yeah, thanks for that and see you hopefully all on day three.
Welcome back, everyone. Ready to break down this game number four. I am still in Betches Panda, joined still by Wida. And Wida, this game, uh, fourth game of the day, but finally a game that didn't revolve around Hero Augments at 2-1. Uh, what does that change for our players? How does it change in terms of their, their you know, play style and their thoughts going into the rest of the game? I think that especially is for something like we, our key feature is going to be highlighted for this specifically because it allowed Sasa to play a normal game of underground, right? There was no random spike on free two with a four cost augment. There was no two one hero augment to, fo to force him off of this, or there was nothing mm -hmm. else. It just meant that we got to see a lot more well rounded boards in double A where people had time to kind of sink into it. And you pair that with those early uh, misfortunes during stage two that also then led in turn to some of these hero augments also getting those upgrades through. It ended up like really ramping up the pace towards the back end of the game. And it's also a very similar game to Canby's uh, in, in the end of that day one in game six. Very similar, very low HP, sitting down at 30 or 20 going into Wolves, but still stabilizes it and just continues that all the way into a second in the case of Canby's, but a first here for Sasa. One more player that I want to highlight, not just because of my Spanish bias, is Chuso. He picked up Mascot Emblem at 2-1. This is, you know, in some patches you would say this is not a pickup unless you're trying to play a reroll Mascot comp, but he played Mascots the same way you would play something like a Brawler, just playing around this front line, having four mascot early on throughout stages two and three, playing very open to whatever the game gives him. In this case, as you mentioned, it was a misfortune. And then leaning into just a good mix of frontline and HP with backline carries, ended up going into that ace composition at the end. So he played a very, I think, flexible and creative game of TFT and was rewarded with the second place. In a different way, a little bit more inflexible is Giyosko played, as we talked about, that duelist start with knife sets, with electric charge, with a somehow a very early Nyla 3, and he was stable stages 2, and then stage 3, hit the Nyla 3, and continue that stability all throughout stage 4 and 5 into that third place. So I think, uh, as we mentioned, a very unique game of TFC compared to the first three today, and, and very cool to see as well how these players were able to navigate it. Another thing to worth, that's worth noting with Gioscos when we're playing this game out, he picked up Gifted as the hero augment, but he also had an Archangel Staff stuck on that Nila. Couldn't guarantee the locket every time, and I'm uh, unsure whether or not that cost him in one or two fights, which is a minor little thing to, to keep in mind if you are going to be playing for something like Gifted. And seeing the rest of these highlights, I think you guys are probably seeing a lot of Zeds, a lot of Sorakas. This was, for one reason or another, the most contested four cost in this game. And as it tends to be in TFT, if you're three-way contested, everyone will probably hold hands in that bot four. And it was the case for players like Ging, who picked up that Berserk, the Soraka carry augment, had a lot of guts to do so, but in the end, got a sixth place and was not able to transfer that result into a top four. Similarly for, as Stuart was mentioning on the cast, a lot of our top players coming into this game ended up bot four, which means that the last two games are going to be that much more exciting. All the points are going to squeeze down together into uh, maybe ties or maybe just one or two point differences between first place and something like an eighth or a ninth place. Yeah, and for King specifically, he, he got caught in a, a little bit of an awkward situation with so many hackers being in play, or like just said, potentially. In one of the fights, he got caught out by, I believe it was uh, Sage's, uh, or Kaspersky, sorry, Kaspersky sack that was hacked onto his Soraka, which meant at the eventually he would lose the fight. But I think that if he wins that fight instead, he has a very good shot of making top four, and that's just kind of how you can lose the matchup rotation once in a while. It must have felt kind of bad for our duelist players seeing Kaspersky picking that Zed Augment despite playing fully into AP. Picking Zed, of course, for some of that hacker benefit for the rest of the team. But overall, those are less Zeds in the pool, especially considering Kaspersky picked the Augment, rolled a few times, and found Zed 2 immediately, making it that much harder for our other duelist players to stabilize. Anything else you want to mention, Wida, on this game? I think it was it was a fun game of TFT. It was, it was very creative overall, as we mentioned, but there was a little bit of contesting overall in, in the bottom end, especially. Yeah, I think that like the, the misfortune freeway right, ended up costing Havali pretty pretty deal. Despite he found that finding that very early one, he just couldn't find a two star at all. Meanwhile, we saw you know we saw Chuso hit it. He also had to make it rain, which meant his board ended up being really cracked towards the back end of the stage, as well as Sasa who got that extra gold from the underground and the, the extra opportunities from that going into the four race, also contesting and eventually probably cost Havali at least one placement. And we're going full circle to the meta talks from day one. You talked about it with Anima Squad. It, the one thing that can doom your game, no matter how good your start is, no matter how many stacks you're able to get for the trade, is the fact that if you don't find Misfortune 2, you're going to start losing every single fight as we move into stage five. And that was the case for Havali, unfortunately. Seeing now the standings here, Stinky Buser not able to claw back, not able to make a comeback, just not a good day of TFT for the Polish player. That is some as well. I imagine uh, from last night's celebrations, did not recover in time either, sitting at the bottom end of the standings. But looking at the first page, Sasa takes that underground cash out into a first place in the standings. Yeah, now it's back to back. And the player we haven't seen on stream today really a lot, at least it's part of all. 
all of a sudden he's just there just doing his consistent thing all throughout him. We saw yesterday his willingness to open for it and how much that actually means in terms of him being able to turn that into tournament wins potential. We still yet to see him win that big European tournament outside of his face regional championship, obviously. So this could be his day as well. And a tactical tactical play by the French. We got into this last lobby. It was the, the leaders in the standings. I saw no French flags. I'm like, okay, these guys are not doing well today. We see two Polish, two Turkish, two German, two Spanish. But all of a sudden, Potable second and Canvas and Jedis were both in that top 12. So they have a chance still in two games to make a big comeback and have a good showing and maybe end up as the champions of this GSC number two. We do have a break ready to go, and then we're going to jump into game five. So enjoy this break with Swedish player Witch. Okay, so yo, uh, my name is Witch TFT. I'm from Sweden. I'm 26. I mean, to be honest, I started playing this set, uh, so I haven't really seen a lot of other sets. I played a bit in the end of set seven, where I remember I played Lagoon, and I used to play double up with my friends, but that's about it. But so far, I can tell this. Uh, I love this set. Yeah, it's pretty good. I think it's very feels very balanced, it's like. I have a lot to learn in TFT. Like I said, I'm still new. I have I need to learn like the more of the basics, like economy and all that. Shit. And also, I feel like TFT. I feel like it's very like it's based on your knowledge of the patch. Like last patch, I felt unstoppable. I felt like I was the best player, like on the server. But in this patch, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm down 700 LP since the patch came out, and it's been like a week. So I have a lot to like practice and take in before the golden spatula starts and it would be kind of cool to win it the first time you play like in the first set you play but i know the competition is like the competition is really good so i don't really have any expectations going into golden spatula all i know is that i'm gonna play for first rave that's all i know i mean my goal is probably to improve try to like compete as much as possible and then go like all in in set nine when I have all the basic knowledge and like feel like I understand the game better than when we like climb for real and compete for real. Big shout out to all my like Twitch viewers who still support me to this day and have been doing that since I started streaming. Welcome back everyone, we are here with GSC number two, day number three, and only two games left to go, Stuart. We've seen three games dominated by Hero Augments at 2-1. This last one was more standard. What do you want? What is your wish coming into this game five? Oh, I definitely don't want to see more 2-1, no Hero Augments, I think that's for sure. I think they were very aggressive. I mean, I love aggression, especially with like how crazy we were seeing with like the all the roll downs. But maybe something, you know, bit in the higher end. Let's let's have a look at them, maybe like five cost hero augments in the later stages. That's something exciting going into this crazy experience and crazy high level lobby. 
And it will be the French players finally making a showing on stream. Canbiz, who won day two, is here, maybe trying to win this day three, a bit away from the current eight or the current point leaders right now, but can definitely close that gap in the next two games. Also seeing Kevin Parker started off not so hot compared to his day one and two, but is now back in this pack, trying to catch up to the leading pack in this day three. Now, this is Lobby 2, so I think the players that are going to be in the top four here is going to be very important because it means that they're going to be able to close the gap on that top spot and trying to win this GSC uh, number two. You can see Snoody also climbed back up as well. We didn't have a perfect start today, but hey, little celebrations happening at the start. We always love celebrations. I would have loved to see one of those little legends just trip in that opening celebration. <laughs> I think that would add a very comical, uh, you know, little flair to the start of this game five, which maybe our viewers need. Our players definitely do not. This is all serious business, a lot on the line, especially for players that didn't make day three in GSC number one, finishing second, as well as, of course, first, might also guarantee them a spot in regional finals. And of course, there is a prize pool behind the scenes as well. These players are trying to work towards in these next two games. Yeah, for sure. For players like Snoody, pretty much guaranteed already into the uh, into the finals. I think for him, he, you know, you still want to perform very, very well. Uh, you still want to, you know, make a name for yourself. Like you said, there's still money on the line. You know, if he can get that first place as well. Um, so I think he, they, you know, the players are not going to set back. They're just going to be full out aggression again. I'm expecting crazy levels and crazy aggression coming into these last two games. A rod component for Snoody. Lulu picked up off of that shop. He did say that yesterday in the winner's interview or the interview he had at the top of show or at the end of the show yesterday on day two he said that he was just gifted so many lulus he had to play lulu reroll on a few of those games yesterday and he did find of course a lot of success finishing third in the standing so maybe a similar start here wukong two star one of my favorite upgrade units to play in stage two just leave him all alone in the front line everyone wraps around him and he just starts hitting every single one of the opponent's units in the face with that mighty staff of his you know, it could be crazy as well. Two one hero gun into cyclone. Let's get let's get it. Why not? Get Stuart, you have to make a decision. Is it two one hero augment or is it not? You oh, said it wasn't gonna be, now you want it to be. <laughs> I was just thinking now with this okay, it's not going to be. But I was just thinking with the Wukong, I was like, you know, if you get the Cyclone, you know, the carry Wukong augment, then maybe it could be something very interesting for Snooty. But what do you think is the best option here? And uh what's what would you go for? I mean, just from seeing the TFT we've been seeing on this day three, Brawler Emblem has to be the option, especially if you're not contested. We'll see what the rest of the players have chosen as well. I imagine Snooty has been scouting, has been looking around to see how many players might be angling towards the potential jacks. The only downside is we don't have a single bow yet on this component bench for Snooty, and you want to have at least two, sometimes even just three or four of them to build. Uh, I think the, the best in slot for jacks most of the time is going to be RFC Rageblade and Giant Slayer in most lobbies. Yeah, for sure. You do have the uh, the rod there, which is one of the components for Rage Blade. So um, if you can go on like a loose streak, if you can try and get that carousel priority in the early game, try and get the you know the extra bows that you need. Uh, we see cluster, cluttered, cluttered mind for uh, the side of. It says Kevin, oh yeah, it's Kevin Parker on the top side. Yeah, I was trying to get confused. I saw Canvas on the top side. I was like, wait, is it his board or is he Bob? He's he's just going on a little bit of his wonders as the fight's Plus happening. The players always do this. So we have to set up some rules. You can't cross the half of the board to not confuse the <laughs> casters because it happens very often. I feel your pain. Uh, but in this case, Canvas is picking up Admin at the very start here, and he could also be angling towards Jax. His Admin will be, when an ally dies, Admin's permanently gained 15 health. He does have a bow on the bench, but I think he knows, checking out some boards, that maybe it's not the best idea to try and contest other Brawler players in this lobby. Keeping them admins in for now, trying to get a little bit of HP in the in the early game. Maybe realizing that he can't win the the early rounds because you don't really have much of the upgraded units. Maybe if you had Camille two star, you could maybe try and push to go for a win streak. But realizing that you're in the lost streak here just means that if you put that admin in, as you mentioned, you know when ally when the ally dies, admins gain the permanent health, so it might help in a little, little later stages if you can get them stacks in the early game. Seeing the augments there, uh, a lot of direction already decided from the Ooh. augments. I'm seeing Mujiwara definitely could be leaning towards this Jax as well with the scope weapons. Of course, Belveth is also a suitable carry to synergize with this augment later into the game. But the one I like the most and the one we're currently seeing on the opponent side of the board here is going to be that Gadgeting Crest. We saw it pop off yesterday from Giyosko. He got a first place with that Gadgeting set with the Mecha obviously leaning into that damage reduction. And I hope to see the same here from Ging. Yeah, we're going to try and try and so. Oh, there's the two star Camille that I was talking about, and a two star Blitzcrank. So <laughs> now I feel like Canvas is in a bit of an awkward spot. But yeah, we'll take a look at 
Gadgetine, finally got Gadgetine online. Got the Warmogs, double Warmogs for Riven. It was going to be very nice for game. But yeah, like I said, set with Gadgetine. Also, we've seen, we've seen like Zed Gadgetine as well. has also been very, very good. Mm -hmm. Just any unit that could benefit a lot from the damage reduction. Also, the little bit of extra damage that it could be, uh, bring. And of course, Gang here uh, had to slam the warm of the components he had open going into this stage two, trying to get a win streak going, which he has until this point. But that means that the really the best in slot for that set you team is not going to be met. You really want more resistance than just pure HP because the mecha trait already gives HP, and that makes you lean too far into that stat to really find optimal value from it. But sometimes, as we mentioned, best in slot is fake. Sometimes you have to slam what you can and try and keep going, stay healthy, and keep this win streak alive. Do you think that's kind of like how the day has been going? Is is you know because of how aggressive the lobbies have been, we've seen lots of item slams from everyone. So is it? Do you think it's a case of you know I I have to slam an item here? I want to try and carry on this win streak. Oh, not just the day of TFT. I think this is just high level TFT in general. The the one misconception I think uh, players that don't play the highest level have is the sense of urgency. They are not aware of how much pressure is going to start mounting up, how it snowballs into uh, big losses in stages three and four. And I think slamming components is one of the key things to learn, fundamental parts of TFT if you want to find success uh, going into kind of a win streak in stage two. You can actually see the, some of the components on the lobby leaderboard on the right. Actually, not a lot of players have slammed any items. I think a lot of players are trying to go for a loose streak. So, you know, it, sh it just shows, you know, the top two players at the moment, Kevin and Snooty, both slammed items, both on the 100 HP on the win streak right now. Exactly that, but I think, yeah, not clear direction for most players. They don't want to commit to a certain item tree just yet. Uh, but we do see a clear direction from Kevin Parker playing Recon, a trait that his German compatriot Salvi did not find success with in games two and three. In this case, though, we'll see if Kevin Parker will find that success playing Cluttered Mind here. Going to get to seven much quicker and going to be able to essentially roll on seven and find these upgrades possibly a bit sooner going into Wolves at stage three. Especially when you're playing recons, you are already going to be having a lot on the bench anyway, whether it be, you know, another two-star Kaiser, you know, we're trying to go for, you know, three-star Vayne, three-star Threats as well. So I think it's a great augment in to be with Threats because you're already going to have a lot of units on your bench anyway, so it just gives you even more benefits. And Havali Nick on that calculated loss, I think it makes sense, obviously, for him to be trying to go on a loose streak here. And the opposite for Kevin Parker, who does guarantee the four win streak, one more, and that's going to be all the gold he'll be able to reap going into Krugs. Very smartly here, trying to make it so his bench is a little bit uh, less costly per unit slot here, trying to make sure he has the benefit of Clutter Mind, while trying to keep his econ as high as possible by keeping the one cost here instead. Does find a two-star LeBlanc here. Do you put this in? Do you just maybe go into, yeah, potential admin here? Uh, for Kevin Parker. Especially with the fact that you're trying to defend a win streak and you might face yeah. Snooty here in this game, in this, you know, round five of stage two, I think it's definitely worth it. And that's also a Samira in stage two, Stuart. I, I feel like this has been kind of what's happened the whole of today. We've seen at the start of the day, we saw an early Samira and Sejuani at stage two. We've been seeing Misfortunes at stage two, now another Samira. I guess more talking just blasting all the players today. Day three, oh. final day of set eight as well. The battle of the wind streakers. Jax has done some Jax DD things, running right into that backline. Kills off one unit, might kill off a next. Able to bypass all the tanks. We see that the Blitz, so healthy with that Gargoyle Storm play, but Jax does not care. He's killed off two carries. Can he kill a third? The answer is going to be yes. Samira is strong, but now she's gone. Really big win there for Snooty, and this is probably one of the, the biggest fights because Snooty now carries on at that win streak into Krugs. I mean, Snooty's going to be on a lot of goal, but I still think Kevin is in a perfect spot uh, in the position, even after losing that round. Jedizor trying to take a page out of Sasa's book, underground number four, or four underground rather, all of this stage two, going to try and emulate that same very big cash out at the end, going into Wolves, going to 4-1. And again, the more, most important part, we're going to try and emulate the stabilization that Sasa was able to get after that cash out. Exactly. We're going to see what the uh, the drops are going to be here, what the item drops are going to be. Probably gives him a little bit of a direction where he wants to go into. Obviously, with Underground, you could be quite flexible. You could maybe go into AD route, or you could pretty much go into an AP route, which I think he kind of doesn't really have a choice here. It's like AP or kind of out, really, with the items that he just got dropped. 
Yeah, that is going to be the case here. And uh, again, he's going to have to return as well. So he's going to try and go for that 70 gold uh, mark to try and get even more interest. Going to take this, I think, very, very greedy. Um, has that GP, which is, I think, for the gold you're paying, just three gold for this two-star GP. He's going to do a lot of work in terms of not winning fights. You still want to keep losing here, but at least killing off units is the important thing because that two, four, or six HP you save each one of these fights gives you the time to actually get those bigger cash outs. We saw at the start of the day as well, you know, a player going for underground and going for, I believe it was clear mind at the start of the day. You know, you're talking about with being greedy with underground. It's like, how far do you go with underground? How far is enough for you to, like you said, maybe making sure that you have enough HP? Um, but like you said, with that two star GP already being able to kill off the Silas, this gives you a little bit more HP to work with. We'll see what exactly Canvas is angling towards. Reminder for our viewers, his. Admin was when an ally dies, admins permanently gain 15 health. So he could be looking at a Camille reroll with the IE and the Titan Resolve already built. 3 2 Augment. Is it a hero Augment? That's the big question. And it's going to be the big question. If it's 3 2 Augment, it could work very well because it could be the Camille Augment. What's it going to be? Oh, it's going to be here. 3 2 Augment. 2. Canvas may be rewarded if he finds that adaptive defense is the carry Augment for the Camille. And he's already level six, so I assume he's picked his hero augment and he's ready to go. Yeah, ready to go. Maybe you already found the Camille the first time. Didn't even need to use any of his four re-rolls, which I think for most players, I, they've been really enjoying that you can now re-roll these hero augments four times. So you can try and find the one hero augment that you want, or maybe you have a little bit of flexibility, especially because it doesn't take away maybe re-rolling the normal augments as well. Godmay has to roll there for the six. There Duelist picked up the recently buffed frontline fencing. And yes, it will be the carry Camille. I spoke it into existence. You're welcome, Canvas, for the O-Cage business there. Find what he was wanting for. Find what he was building towards because this is, of course, a scaling admin that gets you AP every time, every fight that you're, you're committing here. Exactly. That means that the Camille is good. <laughs> Already has two of probably the best items, I would say. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you probably want a healing item here for the Camille. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a final item, you know, like the Bloodthirster um, would be pretty much uh, great here for the Camille. But already doing quite well at actually killing off some units already. Yeah, exactly. These units like Camille, like Draven, got uh, kind of a hidden buff with the BT going from 10% AD scaling to 20%. And definitely will be, I think, the item that Canvas wants to look for in this case as well. Uh, unless he finds maybe an admin at 4 admin that heals Camille as well, maybe that's the one reason not to go for it. But overall, BT, I think, should be the next option. He already has a sword on his bench as well. And are you going to be looking for levels here? Are you going to be looking to roll me? Or we're going to be take a look at Snooty, who took Evasion... Uh, which is going to be helping out the whole of his team with dodge chances. Has the Brawler, has the Jax as well. So this could definitely be looking at going to, you know, a bit of a throwback with this Brawler Jax comp. Might be contested by Mujiwara, who has picked up scope weapons as his first augment and has Reverberation, the Riven Carry, as his second augment. Talking about Mujiwara, a player that played Cleansing Safeguard earlier in the day. Kevin Parker has also picked up the same augment and will be focusing on Lee Sin and those hearts in the back to try and win fights in this stage three. But looking at Muji now, it will be just this Riven as a main carry. Archangels and Titan Resolve, two scaling items to help this Riven stay alive and get as much shielding as possible on her allies and on herself. I think Riven's one of them uh, units as well that a lot of players uh, feel is like, oh, you know, Riven's just a tank, but you'll be, I think you're very, very surprised how much damage Riven can actually do to the whole of the, the board. And you can see here, pretty much was the difference here for Muji being able to win this round and carry on, uh, carry on going. But yeah, only 10 gold though for Muji means that he's rolled a lot of gold already. Seeing the Samira here on the carousel could build into a Runans if anyone is looking for a sure shot carry. Of course, the stabilization difference between a Samira 1 and a Samira 2 is so, so massive in a game like this. Is, is Canvas going to get the Negatron cloak here? Oh no, he just doesn't get it. Muji just takes it underneath him, so he's not actually going to be able to pick up that Bloodthirst. Already had the sword, probably was praying that he was able to get the Negatron cloak, but Muji just grabbed it right underneath his nose and took it away from him. So instead, he just picks up a glove. We're looking here, yet another player trying to go down the recon experiment line, seeing if this time finally it'll work out. In this case, it will be the Starcross to support Kaisa Augment, uh, helping herself and her, or her closest 
ally as well, the vein in this case for Havali. But right now, the HP total is not looking too bad. Usually, we see this huge difference between uh, first and second, then there's the middle of the pack, and then there's that big gap between seventh and eighth. In this case, not really. 55 HP for Didizor, who is actually playing the Rising Spellforce Ezreal. I think the big thing here for Havali as well is you already got a two-star choke off, you already got a two-star Ramus, and that frontline threat should be enough in, in this stage three to be able to basically let your backline ramp up, especially with the Vayne and the Kaiser with this Rage Blade as well. And you can see that it took a long, long time to get through this threat front line, and it's gonna be the difference for Havali winning this round. Biggest difference, I think, as well, is going to be the four recon. Four recon and six duelists, the two biggest trade spikes in stage three. No matter how strong you think you are, if someone's able to get these traits online with a few of the upgrades along the way, it's going to be very hard to beat them throughout the stage three. Maybe finally we'll see Recon go in top four this game. We're ready to see Recon Don't go. Don't jinx it, Stuart. Is, we're ready to see Recon go eighth and seventh today. So we'll have to see if maybe Havali does try something a little bit different with Recons to maybe try and get a top four this game. We're seeing here, and uh, I think one of the augments, the hero augments that has had the worst stats all across the set, but can still work. It's not something that all of a sudden you pick it and you're going eighth. It's not all the case. If things pan out, if you get good items for Ezreal, if you stay above the time of the lobby by finding an early Vi 3 and an early Ezreal 3, you're going to be in good shape to actually top four and sometimes even win out lobbies. I've had this, I've seen this, and I've, and I've done it for myself in a very high level competition on ladder as well. But we will see. 70 gold to work with here. Rich got richer, of course, stacking up that interest. And this is a play that we were talking about at the start of the game as well. You know, how greedy do you get with this underground? And you can see you got Rich Get Richer, you got the Ezreal as well. So just trying to get as much econ as possible and just slow roll to try and hit these three stars. If you can slow roll and hit these three stars, and like you mentioned, it could still be enough to try and get you a, a finish. And as you can see, still winning rounds as well, especially against Muji. One key thing to note with both this Ezreal carry augment and also whenever someone is playing Jinx in Stage 3, you have to be wary of your positioning. If you clump your frontline, uh, you're usually not very punished in Stage 3. There aren't that many AoE abilities coming out outside of like Rammus and Cho'Gath. But in this case, with someone that has an itemized carry Ezreal like we're seeing there, the clumping up, it, some major frontline just disappears way too quick and you lose fights because of it. Similarly with Jinx against Anima Squad players. Now the AoE damage is a lot. You can see the gold as well coming on the right side. Kevin Parker only on 20 gold. So must have looked to try and roll some gold. Does still have a lot of HP um, to work with. See frontline fencing Ooh. here for Gunmei. Lesser champion duplicate up. I, you'd take that if you're Gunmei. It's good, especially in getting your Zed to two start early on, but it's not as important as it would be in other comps. Other comps, you rely almost entirely on having your four cost two start. In this one, the power is a bit more split out throughout all the different duelists, and it's not gonna be as fantastic as it would be for other players. But still, of course, a, a good little surprise for Gamay to have here. You can see that he's actually frontline in this Fiora as well. So you can get like, you know, more auto attacks. That means you get more stats and everything as well. Gunmei actually going all the way down to zero gold. So probably realizing, and this is the thing about Duelist, is that Duelist kind of fall off a little bit. If you don't really get that win streak in the early game, which you expect with Duelist, most of the lobby gets these high power spikes, especially like this Jax, and just rips through the whole of the Duelist without any problem. Snooty has given up Hispanic nationality. He is now Chinese. Hacker Zed is online, <laughs> jumping into the backline here against Gunmei. We'll see how much this fabled comp can do. You hear whispers all throughout the set. Play Hacker Zed, he's so strong, or Hacker Jacks rather. We'll see in this case, he is gonna be winning this fight against Gunmei. We'll see if he can win the rest in this stage four. One of the only ones on the win streak at the moment with Havali and does, hey, there's a little bit of a gap happening at the top now as we do get silver. So we've gone from hero into silver. Look at that instant pickup from Gunmei. He just saw straight away. He was just like, yep, okay, duelist, eight duelist online. But still, not a lot of gold to work with. We're trying to maybe look for this two star Zeds. Might be enough though. We talk about the six duelist power spike in stage three. Similarly enough, eight duelist is a massive trait power spike in this stage four. Let's pick up the vein too, as well as we take a look back at the Ezreal. If Restar does come in quite early as well, still has 60 gold to play with. So still a lot of gold to play with. Still has another potential item here for this Ezreal. What, what would you say is like the, the best first, uh, third item or the, the core third item here for Ezreal? If you're able to hit a Vi 3 where she is going to become that kind of pseudo super tank as well, Gunblade is a big option to just have that, that really just two unit 
carrying everyone else on this on this board really. But if not, Giant Slayer is also a good option. Just damage amplification for that JG, uh, just to get even more burst, trying to kill off these units right away, and ideally trying to find time to position your Ezreal so it doesn't get one shot by Kamz's Camille. I, you know what the crazy thing is? I was looking at the uh, health bars, and Cannabis just hit this Camille three star this round as well. So they maybe just hiding it. So we've seen some of the players do it. You know, hiding until that last second, and maybe making the other players realize, like, okay, he doesn't have a three star Camille. Yet. I don't have to worry about positioning. Last second, three star Camille, and that's enough for Cannabis to win this round and slowly creeping up back on the leaderboards. And stages like 4-1, 4-2, where players are generally a little bit distracted with picking augments, rolling down, striking their board. This is where the hacker players really start frothing at the mouth because players don't have time to position. All of a sudden, if you do have time, if you roll down, if you summon your board with a few seconds to spare, you're able to see, able to snipe off a unit like that and just win fights wholly because of that single positioning error. We can see here that Muji, unfortunately for him, has not had a lot of success here with Brawlers because he is contested with Snoody at the top. So you only have really one item here for the Jax. Does have scoped weapons, but with only one item on this Jax, and as you mentioned before at the start, no bows on this Jax either. So no attack speed or anything like that to get this Jax ramping up. I do like, obviously, you have Reverberation, the Riven carry as the main augment. You're prioritizing the Riven items instead. I think that does make sense, similar to kind of Yumi uh, getting into a second stage uh, compared to the, the, the Nyla, for example, or the Rel in that Yumi reroll comp. It's similar here. Jax is a lot, of course, but sometimes Riven can carry equally as much, especially if you three-star her. But from this spot, I think Wujuara has a lot of problems he has to solve if he wants to become strong enough to win fights. We'll have to see what Muji's going to pick up here from the carousel. There is an Urgot there if anyone wants to pick up. You can see with the item components, everyone just has one component left. Everything has been slammed. And this lobby, as we mentioned at the start, is super, super important. This is lobby number two. So if you can get that top four finished, it allows you to stay in contention to potentially still be the winner of GSC number two. So these these fights, these this lobby means everything to all these players. Players ideally here trying to close out the third item on their carry as these fights get more and more intense. Ooh. And that third item might just be the mana thing. The cash on is accepted here, but just are going to first roll. I like this very much. I think players have to understand what has priority. In this case, rolling. You can pick up your items and slam them once the fight's already starting. And there's a lot to do here still. We still have to roll down for the mall fight three. You are playing supers if you're Dedazor, and you need a spike right now. You're at 27 HP. Uh, rolling 60 gold doesn't unfortunately find any vice at all really does get the malphite three so that does mean that you're going to get a little bit of extra damage with the supers but uh, we'll have to see if it's enough because you can see kevin's kind of spread out his front line a little bit but doesn't have a lot of front line to get through so if this edge could burst through this lease in the back line is going to be very exposed the Gunblade is built on these Ezreal in the end. And finally the gold collector is slam on malphite three he's not rock solid but he's trying his best He's trying. He, he doesn't have a lot of rocks, I guess, but I guess he just has a, a gun by his side. He's just able to, to do enough with the gold collector. But interesting to see who we put. I don't know who we put Mana Zane on, though, because we were thinking, like, you know, Mana Zane on the Ezreal. Must have put on someone else instead. Maybe the Vi? I'm not too sure. I didn't, didn't quite catch it. Yeah, I mean, double dipping into, into mana generation a little bit too much with blue buff and mana zane doesn't make too much sense. You'd rather have the gunblade on your main carry, which is Ezreal, of course, with the hero augment giving him even more power. Uh, so a little bit awkward on the cash. That's the one thing with underground. Uh, you're forced to cash out on that spot. You have 27 uh, gold or HP to work with. You can't really choose and pick uh, and wait to the next cash out in that case. So we can see. so far from any yeah. upgrades here. Yeah, he's definitely struggling, as we've mentioned, is being contested at the moment by Snoody. So Snoody's probably just keeping an eye on Muji here, because as soon as Muji gets knocked out, Snoody can maybe look to go towards maybe that Riven and Jax 3-star, which is really the spike that you're looking for with this Brawler comp. But coming up here against this Ezreal, I don't think these Talk Brawlers about are going to chance. Yep. What a lot of HP to chew from, but the, you will see now the damage from this Ezreal is so, so massive. The Jax very... Smartly keeping his distance, Renekton joins uh, the wise brawler staying in the back, but it's not going to be enough. The last Ezreal cast is going to come through. Jack's going to go down and Mujiwara going to go down with him. Eighth place for our Egyptian player, unfortunately. And Gunmei now sitting at seventh place, next on the chopping block if he's not able to turn things around. And we're taking a look here at Snooty's board as well. Already has the Jax two star, has a couple of Jaxes on the bench, and now with Muji being knocked out, 
because because Snooty also has a lot of HP to uh, HP to work with, is is level eight and still has fifty gold as well. He has so much to play with. And Snooty has to feel like a bit of a villain. I think anytime I play TFT and I'm I'm being contested by someone and that someone is not having a lot of success, I'm just waiting for him to die, just scouting his board every turn, not saying anything. Mm -hmm. But I still feel so bad. I'm like I I want you to die, but it's not personal. It's like, just give me the units I want, you know, you don't have to go full down. Just just give me my units, just sell your bench, and then we can just, you know, hold hands. But uh, for here, I mean, like you mentioned, you know, this Hacker Z is something that we haven't seen a lot, uh, but maybe it's a little bit popular in other regions. Let's pick up the Negatron Cloak instead. Maybe, not the Negatron Cloak 4, is it? Chalice, interesting. I'm curious where Snooty wants to go. It looks like in this case, he's going to try and go 9. Could just be rolling at 8, though, now that we see that Mujiwara has indeed died, as you mentioned. Could have just been waiting until this finally came through, saving his gold for this exact moment. At some point, I imagine going to be switching off of that LeBlanc into the Soraka. But for now, let's check out on the hottest star of the show in this game, Malphite, i.e. Gold Collector. Uh, I mean, at least with Infinity Edge, at least his... Uh... His rocks can crit, I guess. I mean, at least he's going to be slamming and critting and do a little bit of damage. But it's going to be coming up against Snooty, though. And I don't know if he's going to have enough to break through this Jax. Is he going straight onto the Ezreal? And this is the problem we were talking about. All of the tanks are in the front, but the Jax is in the back. We saw it happen in stage two. Maybe that was a foreshadowing of what was to come. Jax once again dealing with the backline carries easily and stopping a lot of the board strength that Jedzord, the French player, had in this fight. Snooty Boo playing a really fantastic game of TFT. Yeah, Snooty having a really, really good performance this time around has kind of turned things around as well because we saw at the start of the day with the standings is uh, Snooty did not have a great start to the day, but he's, you know, he's kept his mental, he's stayed strong, and he's a very experienced player as well. So I'm sure he's probably been in a position before when he's where he's been near the bottom. And all you have to do is it just takes a couple of rounds to turn things around. And if he can guarantee himself that first place finish, which I don't want to jinx it, but he is looking in a really, really strong spot with a 40 health lead at the moment at the top. That could be enough to maybe get him closer to getting the victory in GSC number two. And Kevin Parker as well. Snooty and Kevin Parker holding hands when it comes to narratives. Both ended up, you know, qualified to regionals off of the day three. Started off very poorly. Coming into the last game, they're among these players trying to catch up to the lead pack, and they're both currently first and second in the HP standings. Ging, a player we haven't talked about too much, has not gone for the mecha set idea. I understand why, I think, with these items, it was not ideal. Maybe just didn't find the mecha units in the rolldown. They're gonna be playing a more traditional Spell Slingers board with the Echo Frontline, with the Annie Frontline, the ZZ Rot as well, trying to buy time for these Talia casts. To do what we're seeing they're doing here, Weaver's Wall, deleting units completely. And I'm not sure this Z1 can do it for Gunmei. He's sitting at 9 HP. If he's not able to win this last fight against Talia, that could be it. One last cast coming through. The BT is massive, though. It might just be enough here. Yeah, the healing, I think, is going to be enough, or is it going to be enough with... Okay, the Fiora on the front line as well is going to be enough, and you can see the struggle at the moment that Gunmei is having with the Jawless, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the first time that we've actually seen Talia today. I don't think I remember seeing any Talias at all, but there we go. There's the Vi three-star that we was waiting for, and this is a really, really big spike. The Mandazane actually was on the Lee Sin. Now, the two losses we've seen here for Jedizor was off of the Ezreal getting immediately killed by a hacker unit. He now has time to scout and to properly position to try and survive these next few fights. We, we just saw the Reforger, I think, being used as well on the uh, gun collect, uh, gold collector. I mean, not Death surprising. Spice. Yeah, I mean, he picked up a Death Defiance instead and a Morello, which, to be honest, is actually not that bad. I think that's actually better than what it was before because it was Infinity Edge Gold Collector, and he's instead picked up a Morello Nomicon and a Death Defiance. Malphite is a chameleon in these games. He does what he can with any items he's given, in this case Morello for now, but Ging with the Talia trying to stay alive in this fight against Jadazor. The Ezreal casts are massive. Ezreal's still alive, Sona's still alive as well. Huge cast comes in, deleting all the frontline units. A split here in the angles for Talia, not even a cast actually, and Jadazor survives to live at least one more round with Ging being knocked down to around 20 HP. The crazy thing as well, as I was watching that Ezreal just obliterate through the entire team, is the healing as well. Like like you mentioned, the Talia was trying so hard to try and take down the Ezreal, but every single time Ezreal cast, half the HP came back every single time. It was absolutely insane, and the sustain from this Ezreal is, is so, so much, and it allows to just deal so much damage. 
Tedezor picking up the redemption, maybe for himself, maybe just denying that AoE damage reduction against the rest of these opponents, considering the AoE damage from the Ezra ult, which is really the star of his comp at the current moment. But Kambi is very silently, 35 HP, 7 win streak, Camille with the right admins. We saw it earlier in this tournament, putting in so much work. Do you want a free MF2? The answer is probably no. Don't think he does what it, I'm guessing he took the plus AD, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there was a plus AD option uh, for the admin four, and especially because you're playing uh, Camille carry, I wouldn't be surprised if that's exactly what he went for. Does put in the prankster for now, though, which might give him a little bit more opportunity. And we, we haven't took a, taken a look at Avali for a long time, but that's also a three-star Kaiser. So a lot of lobbies hitting these three-star four, uh, three-star three-cost units that we've been talking about throughout the whole day. One off of the vein as well, so close to a second power spike, second wind gonna work well with the comp as well, but all of a sudden the front line is gone. Ezreal is cooking, can he cook enough? It looks like he can, Kai'Sa is dead. Lee Sin, Sona still alive, a big loss for Havali Nick, and more importantly, a big win for Jedizor who is on his last life at seven HP. That's so, so close now. I mean, you, you're just expecting this Ezreal to just be ramped up more and more, and you can see this this Gadgetine with the Echo. Oh, this is a fight that we don't see too often. Lee Sin against Echo, the Gadgetine. Will it be enough? Had a, a trick up his sleeve. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> the target dummy buying just enough time for the tie there between King and Kevin Parker. Not something you see every every day. The TFT bingo is popping off today on this day three. <laughs> we've, we've had pretty much everything on this day number three. It's been absolutely crazy. But you can see how, how much this Echo can tank in the front line with this Gadgetine crest. Obviously something that only got introduced a couple of patches ago. And Gadgetine was never really this trait in the early stages of the set. No one really saw this as like a late game sort of board with the Garage team. But with this in introduction of the Gadgetine crest and now with the buff that is received as well with it being able to give um, deal extra uh -oh. damage, also get add damage resistance, but against this Jax, not three star just yet. Syndra will have time to pull in just one unit, but the Jax jumps away, he leaps back to the front line units and sets it to Talia, and that could actually spell the difference in this fight. Talia still has not been touched on that bottom left corner. The Jax trying his best, but there's so many targets that hit the Zac blobs as well as the ZZ blobs, not really helping Jax's case here, and that might be one of the first losses in a long time for Snooty, that will be the case. Ging will survive for at least one more fight here as well. Yeah, the Jax was enough. Oh, uh, the Jax was just stuck on the Echo. Sorry for mistaken Abby. Yeah, Jax was just stuck on the Echo there, and Echo was just like, "Yeah, you can hit me as much as you want. I'm just going to buy enough time for this Talia." And you can see that this is something that you've been talking about a lot with the Ergot. Is he going to do it in the end? Is he going to position this Ergot at the front, trying to get a cast? Looking at Sunny though, he just went number nine, and he has 50 gold to wow. work with. So he did go nine in the end, hasn't hit the Jax three yet, but can still do so. For any of our viewers that are wondering, what are all these units doing in the back line? What is, what is Snooty cooking here? The answer is, this is actually not joking. This is the Chinese uh, Jax hacker strategy. You put all your units in the back line, like you used to do with Assassins in set six, for example, in set seven, and that forces the opponent's frontline units to walk up and leaves a bigger gap between the front line and the back line of the opponent's board, allowing Jax to, instead of, as we saw before, jump back to the front line, stay on that back line instead. And to be honest, with how healthy Snooty is, with how much gold he has as well, he's level nine, he can just take his time. He doesn't need to do anything. Some players at this stage will be like, okay, I need to roll, I need to try and hit the legendaries. But to be honest, there's, you know, there's no rush for Snooty at all. Everyone else is on one gold, and Snooty's the only one on 50 gold. Oh, this is tantalizing here. The Sona 3 is offered, but you don't have enough gold to buy it. You have to survive one more round. You just have to be very careful where he places this Ezreal. He can't let it die right away to the Camille or the Jax. Instead, he will be facing the Talia board. It will be Ging instead. Once again, we'll see how that fight pans out. And on this board, on Ging's actual board, he is facing Cambys. So it will be the Camille jumping right into the Talia. Unfortunately, so many threats to the backline carries in these last few fights. And that might spell the difference. That might spell defeat here for Ging because of that massive outplay on the Camille. And because um, you see on the right hand side that it's actually he's against the Ghost, it means that he's not going to be as strong and he's actually going to win the round. It looks like Ging, unfortunately, is going to be knocked out here. So we're getting really into later stages of this lobby now to see who's going to be our number, uh, our, our first place in this second final lobby as we see our top four. It was a difficult lobby to, to play through in this last stage five and stage six with so many different positioning puzzles that you have to solve when you have multiple players in your pool. 
There's the 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 Jack jumping onto your back line, the Camille, but then you have the AOE from the Ezreal in the front line. So it's really hard to know exactly where to place these units. Uh, and sometimes just that 50-50 at the end might cost you a fight or might win you the fight in the case that you end up guessing the right spot. Yeah, you can see that uh, Studi did roll down the end, did find that Leona two-star. Recon having more success. Hey, I didn't jinx it. I'm just saying. I, I know, I'm used to cast the curse thing in... Uh, you know, in other games, but in this game, I guess I didn't cast the curse this time. Recon actually getting a top four, but will it be enough to break through this Ezra? I don't think it will be. The Vayne 3 upgrade did come through for Havali Nick, but the same fight we saw earlier goes in the same direction. The Ezra board winning yet again, and Snooty now trying his best against Canvas. For now, it looks like it's going to be enough. The Jack is still alive. Canvas takes a big hit, but not quite big enough to eliminate him just yet. Both French in single digits. Havali Nick trying to represent Turkey in this top four. And Snooty trying to maybe win the day entirely on this game five, jumping into that top eight, going to the final game six. You can see how much health this Jax has as well. It's absolutely crazy because, you know, you got the Leona there as well, the two star Leona, five mecha. So it means that it looks like the moment he's getting hold of both the set and the Wukong, allowing Leona to still be in that fight. But this is going to be a big round here for Cannabis. Can he position correctly here against Havadi? He doesn't. He's on the wrong sides. Oh, this Ash is a sacrifice. I'm sorry, Ash. You did a lot. Oh, runs away. The recon trade helping her out. Camille back to the front line, but a massive Camille ult might be coming through. The CC from Ramis might be enough, and it is. Eyes enough time for the recons to kill off the Camille with all the crit damage coming through. And now it should be easy pickings on these last few units left on the board for Canvas. That will be defeat for Canvas. Unfortunately, Turkey stays alive in this top four. Can the other French player do it? It looks like he can. Yeah, it looks like he's actually going to win. And Snooty's actually going to lose as well. So he's still trying to look for that Jax 3-star. Maybe there's a Jax here on the carousel. There is not. There's a Jordis emblem and a heart emblem. But I don't think that will benefit a lot of these players. A heart emblem could be something that maybe Snooty wants to go for. Especially with uh, the Soraka. Well, it considering... is to be picked up. Yeah, going to be the heart emblem in the end. On the Apelios, obviously not a unit that really wants to have that heart emblem online. But this is the board for Snooty. Both Brawler emblems allowing him to play One five more. mecha as well. So close to the upgrade. He still has HP to work with, so he's not in absolutely dire straits just yet. Uh, he's thinking about what to do right now. He doesn't have Hacker in anymore. He's just got rid of the Hacker. He's trying to just cap out his board as much as possible. He's trying to look for that Jax 3-star, which is really his big, big win condition. Uh, but we're going to be seeing here. This Ezra is something that we haven't really seen over the past few days, but has had a lot of great success against the Recon. This could be a knockout round for both these players. The Shroud is huge on the Ramus, especially delaying that CC, but all of a sudden Ramus comes flying in. Malphite is dead. You've done a lot of work for this team, but already down. Vi as well gets taken down. Only Lisa left alive. The Ezreal casts are good, but maybe not good enough. The damage is coming in too late onto that Recon Clump on the left. And Ezreal all alone. Recon on Recon action. The French player taken down in third. Spain versus Turkey to decide the winner of this game. And Both Snooty, on 11 HP. Yeah, and Snooty lost to a ghost as well. We didn't quite catch what ghost it was against. But yeah, he finds that Jax 3-star. That's what he's been looking for this whole time. But Recon, as, a, as we mentioned, though, is something that hasn't really had a lot of success today. But you can see, if you can hit them 3-stars with Ramus, which is buying enough time for this Kaiser backline, for the Vayne backline as well. And this is such a big round for both these two players. Because if you win this lobby, it gets you ever so closer and potentially looking at finishing number one. Snooty has the LeBlanc, not going to put Hacker in, just going to prime play out a normal game of 6 Brawler, 5 Mecha for this last fight. The Sejuani's on the wrong side, not going to be ulting most of these recons, cannot slow down the damage coming from all the extra crit chance, but Jax is coming. He's onto the backline, he's onto the Ezreal now as well, going to try and get that last kill. He does on the Syndra, now onto the Kai'Sa, finally, the kill comes through, he cleans up everyone but the Vayne, the Ram is trying his best, can't get off an next cast. And that's going to be it. A massive win for Jax. A massive win for Snooty. Havali Nick ends up second, but St Spain takes the win in this game five. Beautiful victory in the end from Snooty. From pretty much the start of the game as well, he was able to win streak. He was able to get enough gold. He got level nine so, so early, and it meant that he just had so much time to roll down. There was a little bit of hiccups, I guess, in the end because he was losing a little bit of HP. But it was enough for him to finish first, and that's a big, big win for Snooty. I mean, he's definitely going to push up the rankings. 
And heads up, playing that brawler line into first hacker in the mid game, identifying that there were weak players that had backline carries like Talia, like the Ezreal, getting a few free wins there, and then transitioning into the five mecha level nine board, and eventually getting Jack three at level nine, waiting for that Mujiwara death to then get that upgrade much later into the game. So really cool game, but I'm sure our analysts have a lot more to break down with everything that happened in that game five. We have another interview ready with the Portuguese player, the God, and then the analysts will break down all the action. I'm the God. Uh, my name is is Philip. I'm from Portugal, and uh, yeah, I'm a cool Portuguese guy who likes uh, this game, basically. Oh, uh, I start playing in set six, so I had set six, set seven, and set eight. So set eight is basically my favorite set of all time. I think my performances right now is the best, I guess, <laughs> because. I'm a first or eight player, so I may be first versus first or eight eight eight. But I I think I'm getting more first now, so my performance I, I think is good now. I hope. <laughs> I really enjoy them. I think the new format is really, 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 really good. And I said really six times because it's really good. Uh, because we are playing for uh, our spot, but also for our uh, our region. And uh, we yeah, I really enjoy it because it seems like uh, players that aren't that well known like master or something they can win and enter and i think it's really good that uh, they open the doors to everyone i want to give to all of them i can say everyone's name but chilendario maestro tavas ipanina the those people but all portuguese and uh, like we are really like a family so all all the portuguese family I really want them to to get a shout out. They they deserve. Welcome back everyone to the Golden Spatula Cup number two. We are on the verge of heading into our final game where we will see our final points being locked in and very likely seeing our champion decided in the lobby. We don't before we get into that though, we saw a hugely explosive previous game. Snitty Boo brought out a couple of things we had not seen on stream at all so far. The Hacker Jacks approach and Mecha Jacks as well. I mean, where do we even start with this? I mean, when you look at this board, he had two Brawler Emblems, or like two pl Brawler Plus ones from Augments. That does take you a pretty good way in terms of being able to start flexing more in and around such other directions, such as the Hacker Jacks into, into 5 mech, for example, right? These things opened up the game plan for Snooty, and I was very fortunate because he was contested in this lobby by Mujiwara. 
Yeah, and of course, we, we've been talking about this all day long. The comps we've been seeing getting tested generally don't go well for at least one player. Most of the time, it's not gone well for both players. It's shocking to have that completely turned on its head as of here. So we're looking forward to, you know, into future games because we're expecting to see Brawlers again. How does this, you know, this kind of hack-up setup work with the current way Brawlers are done? Maybe if you don't receive multiple you know, Brawler plus ones. I mean, it still is just kind of the same way as you would expect a more traditional Jack spot to play out. Um, I think that just having that, giving Jack's backline access means that you don't have to worry about something like an RFC, for example. So it's also much more about like the itemization elements to the game. When you look at this, I think we had a lot of interesting reroll lines in this game in general. We saw Campus mm. very early on start angling for that Camille. Even before he saw his augment on free one, he slammed those Camille items and got rewarded for it. And it's like someone like Jerusalem, for example, right? He was not looking to angle for a rising spell force reroll until that free to hero augment. He was playing rich get richer, building up that economy together with the underground to try to get into a strong late game board, but instead ended up rocking the rising spell force. Yeah, I was really shocked at how well that worked, considering that the early underground cash-outs that that composition is notorious for are considerably weaker in this patch than they were previously. One thing that does shine out for me, of course, I know a player you're keeping a very close eye on, Ging, with the Gadgetine Spellslinger setup. A disappointing fifth place, we've been expecting higher finishes from Gadgetine. I mean, I think for Ging specifically, right, he, he's made, he's been called out by Hacker multiple times already today. We've seen it be somewhat endemic to his playstyle, and we don't necessarily always know his matchup, but we don't know what he's specifically scouting and positioning for. But what we can conclude is he has been called out by these Hacker elements multiple times. But again, when you have to contend with Snooty Boo as well, you can't you kind of want to be up the opposite side of the Jacks, etc. So sometimes you can end up tanking a Camille, you end up tanking, well, the Jacks. So that's just something that can happen. A slightly unfortunate situation for Ging here. All right, we do have our penultimate standings ready. Do you remember, we're Swiss seeding our players. We play against other players with similar records. So we'll look through the bottom of the table first before moving on to the top. Again, I think there's some pretty shocking names down here. Gluteus, we had hoped to see the return and resurrection of his performances from before. Didn't happen today, though. No, it did not. And it is a shame for our former EMEA champion, but again, He's, he's a player that has multiple avenues into finals, still doing well in the Summoners in League as well. So this is not the last we've seen of him so far this set. At the top of our standings, though, we have a, to some people, a little bit of an unknown name, Sasa or 545DoorXD. Um, doing quite well here, continuing a, tr a hat trick of first places back to back now. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be real beneficial when it comes to potentially looking into any tiebreakers if he's tied on total tournament points with someone else at the end of this game. Yeah, that's particularly impressive. We said game three was really the time to start stepping things up. So just before we get into our final game, what are the you know what's your final thoughts on what we've seen so far heading into our final game? I think we're going to see fireworks. We have players like Potter Ball, for example, known for just laying it all out on the table, going for super high-risk playstyles. We've seen Sasa do the exact same thing, and I think that is going to be the picture we're going to be seeing all throughout this final game of today. All right, one more game to determine who will leave. Golden Spatula Cup number two with a guaranteed spot at the EMEA Regional Finals. Our castle are ready. Take us in for the final time. Thank you, Peter. I am still in Petros Panda, joined still by Stuart, and we're ready to go. We've, I think, pretty much filled out the entirety of the TFT bingo sheet for today. <laughs> Is there anything you're missing, Stuart? I, honestly, uh, today's had it all. It's had 2-1 hero augments, it's had aggressive plays. We've seen some standard TFT, but this last lobby is going to mean everything. You know, these players are going to have to go out with everything. I, I can't think of anything that I worry, really want to see, anything in particular that I want to pick out. I just want to see a great match of TFT to end not only GSC number two, but to end the competitive EMEA for set A. Well, I'm going to be ambitious and I'm going to say we have not seen a three star five cost yet today. Okay. Could this be the way to end off a tournament? As fantastic as this one, maybe it will be. But these are the players we're going to have in this final lobby. The total uh, point leaders right now in this day three going into this last game. Sauce, of course, as you see there, a big gap with 34 points going into Padabo with 32. And Giosco also managing to, again, have these good array of performances all throughout the day and finish in this top three going into the top or the final lobby of the day. And we're going to be keeping on our, an eye on our top players, especially Sasa, who has a, a little bit of a, a point lead at the moment um, against Pastor Bowl, the white player underneath him. So 
have to keep an eye out on definitely Sasa and Pastor Bolt as we get through this lobby, but... It's, it's still possible. Snoody, we take a look here, had a great showing in the last round that we just saw. Hoping for more of the same this time around. And what a time to be alive as a fan of TFT in the EMEA region. Usually, France is always at the top. You see this whole final lobby filled with French players, but in this case, the parody has finally arrived. We see all the powerhouse nations represented in this final lobby. Germany, Poland, Spain, and France. The four or I guess five countries with Turkey as well that isn't here that are always there in terms of representation, always have the most players qualifying to these events. And we see why. I mean, some of the players here are just the creme de la creme of the EMEA region. For sure, we're seeing a little bit of early game here. The lesser champion duplicator is being picked up. Do have a few item components here as well. Picking up that two-star Nasus, he did a little trick that some players do like to do as he checks his admin as well. You'll see this a lot definitely throughout this last game. But what some players like to do a lot is they don't like to upgrade their units. They just like to play two units on the board, potentially trying to, you know, make 10 gold for Econ. Doesn't find in the end, so just picks up the Nasus for a two-star Nasus in this early game. Curious to see if he'll keep this Camille and, and think about the admin or if he wants to sell this Camille for the Jinx in the shop, considering he has already the upgraded Nasus, which is one of the pivotal parts of playing Anima Squad early. You need to have good board strength and uh, will not be the case. Draven instead. And it is going to be one cost hero augments to end off the day. Reign of Anger is here for Giosko. Does he want it? It looks like he does. The best statted augment in the game at any GM plus or Masters plus lobby in TFT on ladder under a 4.0 average. That's when you know things are leaning towards the busted side of things. Yeah, for sure. Already has a lot of item components as well. I think most players would have got the, you know, five item component start, which is fairly new for this patch with the way that the item com components and everything works out. What would you slam here, though? If you're, if you're in his shoes right now, if you've got the Reign of Anger, Renekton, what's the best item here with the options that he has available? Yeah, it's a tricky one. You definitely want to have the Titans, I think, later on into the game. Rageblade is also pretty good with the attack speed on the Renekton, so I'm curious to see what Giosko ends up doing with these items specifically, if he even wants to slam anything, considering he wants to be, of course, trying to roll for a one cost later in after Krugs, and maybe just wants to not level and lose streak this stage two. Potentially, that's exactly seems to be the case trying to lose streak trying to get the item carousel priority and trying to get the the best in slot items for this renekton does lose out this early round you can see on the other board there for loris you got the two star silas with the carry augment as well with the jinx in the back line with the jeweled gauntlet as we take a look here at snooty's board uh oh gone reign of anger we're contested but the slams are coming through here, and that means that Snooty is going to try and win streak throughout this stage too. Both Spanish players going into Reign of Anger. No scout, no pivot. I understand the sentiment. If you're offered the absolute best one-cost augment in the game, why not go for it and just try your luck and see what ends up happening? If you still only have a two-star Renekton, you can pivot into more of a Jack-centric board when you get the six-brawler online in stage three. But we're seeing here on the side all the different augments that have been picked up, and there isn't too much overlap outside of this Reign of Anger for Giosco and Snooty. Yeah, you can see the uh, Sasa also went for the support Wukong augment, so maybe looking for a more AP route that you normally get to see with the support Wukong augment. But with this Reign of Anger, I think Snooty is going to be a very, very comfortable position. Does have the items that he wants as well with the Warmogs and the Titans. And we saw exactly what Snooty did in the last game with the early win streak that he got. He was able to level up, he was able to econ up, and it's a player, you know, as I mentioned before, it's a veteran player that knows exactly what to do at this stage of the game. If you just joined and you were wondering why six out of the eight players went level four at this point in the game, you can tell it's a one cost reroll or a, a one cost hero augment in this case. So many players staying on three, trying to find their upgrade for their, in some cases, the carry of their combat, at least for this stage two and three. In this case, bigger, better buckler BBB for Chuso with the poppy as the star of the show. Reminds me back of a little bit of Candyland, you know, some memories of Candyland a little bit. I think a little pe uh, people will have uh, some fond memories of Candyland. But you can see that Poppy is not going to do enough this time around because it is only one star Poppy. But it's a unit that if you do have that solo front line, if you do have the, uh, the stone plate, which is exactly what he has, he's able to just solo front line and deal a lot of damage, surprisingly, to the back line. But unfortunately, with it only being one star, he's going to lose this round to Sasa. 
And seeing that Wukong board, I believe that was two Wukong 2s. I thought it was Woodland Charm for a second, but that is a crazy start if those are two Wukongs. Finding that Wukong 3 early could be pivotal in terms of staying healthy in stages 2 and 3. Looking at the, the three cost options here, the Jax and the Cho'Gath, the Cloak and the Sword immediately picked off. Kai'Sa with a Rod, not going to be as enticing in this lobby unless someone picked the Ash Support. Nikolosko had pretty much all the items in the world that he could choose for. Decided to go for Negatron Cloak instead. You can see he already has five item components. So my guess would be Bloodthirster, probably for the Renekton, I would think, with that Negatron Cloak. And we'll have to see how this is. This is a carry Divine Ascent Kale Augment. Is this going to potentially be a reroll Kale? It's something that was played a little bit, you know, a few months ago, but it's definitely not one of the more popular augments, mainly used for tempo, and then you can look to try and transition a little bit later on. Yeah, stat-wise, both kill augments have been near the bottom of the pack the entirety of this set, but we do hear from our friendly co-caster, Wida, telling us that Patable has played this exact line in the past in the Hex League. He's familiar with it, and he's found success with it in the past as well, so if someone knows how to navigate this, it's going to be this player. It's going to be a player that currently is sitting second in the standing, so a player that has been dominating throughout the day, and is trying to cap out this last game with a win, and try and take the title home. <laughs> That's exactly what you want to do. Some people, some players will do this, is do that in this game. If there's something that you're comfortable with in the final game, but to, to potentially look to try and win not only this lobby, but also win the Golden Special Cup number two, just play comfort. Play something that you're comfortable with. Play something that you're used to and you have practice on. Because if you play something new at this stage of the game and this stage of the competition, then you might not have the right experience to try and come out on top. Something that I think Snooty is comfortable with is winning. Once again, he is one of our win streaking players in this stage two. Last fight remaining. Uh, the last uh, time he ended up winning that and going that five win streak in game five into the Krug. We'll see if he can do the same here. And if anyone's going to contest him, no one else win streaking but Jedizor, who picked up the rocket grab. The Rat Blitz augment is also staying very healthy in this stage two. We're going to take a look here. You see Sage has gone for the carry. The carry Talon Augment, but also pretty much has, to be fair, really, really good Viego items on the Talon as well. So probably maybe just to look into slam the items in the early game, trying to get uh, a little bit, of, try and preserve a little bit of HP in the early game. You see that he's currently, you know, loss, loss, loss into win and maybe looking to win this round as well. Yeah, he's going to win this round. So he does have a little bit of a two streak into Krugs, probably not the best that he would have wanted. As you mentioned, you know, Sudi still near the top and Sasa also near the top, a player that we have to keep an eye on currently sitting on 34 points at the top of the standings. So many players you will see here level four. They haven't leveled yet because, of course, most of them trying to reroll one cost, which means once this Krug fight is over, the next round you'll be level four, eight out of ten in the experience mark, and you have one round left to roll with much, much higher one cost odds. 55% there we see in the shop for all players that are still level four. And that's really the key thing. They're going to roll down to maybe 30, maybe 20 gold, depending where the, what spot they're in, in terms of the current copies of one cost they have. He's also getting so much gold as well. We're getting so much loot drop. Look at all that gold. He just, just went from pretty much 35 all the way up to 50 gold with that as well. We also picked up a few decent units. Picked up a Riven, picked up a Jax as well. Maybe he can look to try and use it as a mecha in this early stages. But as you mentioned, this is probably where he's going to be trying to look to roll down. He needs three more Wukongs. I pick up defenders along the way as well. And we'll see what Kyoto is trying to do as well, picking up Renekton's contesting Snooty Boo on five Renekton's right now, has a six in the orb, three away. I imagine Snooty's doing the same thing now, both racing to find the copies of Renekton before the other. And unfortunately, the Spanish Civil War is going to be ongoing here, as neither player might hit that spike. And Snooty decides in the end not to roll. I think he rolled a little bit to try and get some units, but as you can see on the other board, Sasa has found that Wukong 3-star. Three, three Unfortunately, it's not the carry Wukong Augment, so it's a little bit different, but still, the same thing happens with this Wukong. It still packs a punch. Wukong 3 is Wukong 3. Big monkey, no discrimination whatsoever, especially not with that Gargoyle Swing Plate. When he is the full focus of the opponent's board, which is going to be the case with Wukong with how his positioning and his ult works, this is an item that perfectly synergizes with that entire package. Beautiful here for Sasa. He has a lot of gold on his bench as well, only sitting on 10 gold. He does have a few defenders, which is what you were calling out, so maybe looking for uh, this defender frontline, which there are quite a few AD players in this lobby. We're going to be going straight into gold augment here. And with the Reign of Anger, potentially Knife's Edge is going to be the option, and it is. 
Interesting pickup here for Giyosko. Picks up that knife's edge. Usually an augment that you just really associate with duelists most of the time. But the pure stats with obviously brawlers you do want to play in the front line always. So they benefit from battle mage and knife's edge in terms of positioning. And that'll be the pickup for Giyosko in the end. Throw of the hunt here for Sasa, making sure that now this Wukong also has healing and not just resistances. I think it's an interesting thing because this is not the carry Wukong augment, but I think it's because Sasa was being, has been put in a position where he found six Wukongs so early on that he's just thinking to himself, it's like, okay, I only need three more Wukongs. If I can econ up and if I can get this Wukong three-star, yes, it's not the carry version, it's the re-energized version, which most of the time we see with an AP comp, especially with Talia, but it's still going to be such a big wrecking ball, especially with this mech online as well. Yeah, during this, the Mecha meta with Set as the star of the show, players very quickly learned how strong Wukong is when he's mech'd up, even as a two-star, even more so as a three-star throughout all of Sages 3 and 4. Just so happens that there's not many units that have AoE damage in Sages 2 and 3, which makes Wukong extremely interesting as an option when you see it here, just surviving for so long, able to hit multiple units. Even if you don't win the fight, you do usually end up killing off many of the units and getting a, a good loss. Not so much the case here. It's also now dropping down to 83 HP. Yeah, Snoody is still going to carry on winning. If he carries on winning, then he's maybe going to be put in a similar position to what he was before. Big thing is, is that Sasa did lose that previous round, so he has lost his win streak. So he's not going to be getting as much gold income as before. You can see Snoody's going for more of like a, a slow re, uh, re, like roll route. Instead of like leveling, he's just going for the slow roll, realizing that he only needs a couple more Renektons. Where on the other hand, Perfect. We can see Renekton 3-star already picked up, but he's just used all of his gold. He has zero gold left. It feels to me like Mortog's getting lazy. We're just running back the same game we saw in game <laughs> 5. Snooty 100 HP. The 8th player contesting him is currently 8th in the standings. In this case, Giyosko instead of Mujiwara. Snooty's hoping that Giyosko dies off so he can steal his Renekton and then once again cap out with that Brawler board going level 9 potentially and, and playing that Jax 3 as a secondary carry. For now, Sage also finding some trouble here. The Talon not doing enough against these HP pools the Brawlers have. And Sage hooking, taken down now to even less HP. Yosko stabilizing finally, but he's zero gold, Stuart. Yep, zero goal, which means it's going to take a lot of time for him to econ back up. And as you said, it's very, very similar to what we were, position we was in before. Snoody was on a win streak. He had the, you know, the uh, he was able to find a few of the units and just push levels. And instead, on the other hand, we have to see what they're going to do with this three-star Renekton with no econ at all. Does pick up a bow, does have a few components. That is potentially Titan's Resolve. I think he had a spot left in his Renekton 3, if I'm not mistaken. So it might yeah. be Titan's Resolve. Could be Titans, could also be Rageblade as well. That <laughs> will work really well with Random Anger in general. Uh, but we see it there, no surprise. The players that have the least components open are players that are wind streaking, slamming items, Ooh. have a big effect on your board strength, especially in stage three. Cash out for Potable, does he take it? It looks like he will. The Shroud is gonna be good enough here. I'm gonna try and again, already has a kill three. We were talking about how strong this could be, but he's currently sitting, five loss streak, 50 gold, 50 HP. Lows of fives, and we're gonna be seeing this Kale being ascended to the top. This is exactly what this Kale is gonna get. Three-star Kale, Giant Slayer, Lost Whisper as well. We're gonna wait for the Shroud as well. This is something that a lot of players do. They just wait until the last second with the Shroud, try and spread out the board as much as possible. So then you can try and shroud the, shroud the most important units, which this time was the Renekton and the Lee Sin. And this Kale's doing a lot of work against this Reign of Anger Ren uh, Renekton. That being said, there's different spikes right now. Spotable already has hit the kill three, where Snooty still, the way he decided to play this game out, is still waiting for two more copies of Renekton to appear on his shops to try and get that next power spike. We can see here the another victory here. There's, uh, well, another loss here, I should say, uh, for Chuso. Does have the Gadgetine, does still have that Poppy in the front line as well. He's one away from any three-star as well. There's a lot of reroll players in this lobby, which, to be honest, is kind of expected with the 2-1 um, hero augments being 1-1-1. One, one, one. He's now one away from Poppy as well, and he's going for it. Through, there's three-star Annie. You're and one, one away from Lulu. Away. There's two moves on the board as well. So, so close to so many upgrades. He's still going to stay here now at 10 gold, and probably, I think, will be able to hit all of them still level 5, Stuart. 
And this is such an interesting comp, like, comp as well, because this is not something we've seen. We've seen Gadgetine, as I mentioned in the last round, the Gadgetine has been, most of the time for this set, has been used as an early game augment to try and get a streak, to try and stabilize and then just transition into another AP route in the later stages. But Chuso, this game, has just said, I'm going to bring out something different. Reroll Gadgetine. As you mentioned, one away from Lulu, one away from Poppy. If you can hit these units, maybe it's going to be enough. We saw it from Solo in day one, eventually getting that Lulu with Hacker as well. That was with Grossbird, I believe, or one of the, the Lulu carry, rather, in that day one. We saw it yesterday, Snooty mentioned in the interview at the end of the day, that he was kind of forced to play Lulu reroll and Gadgetine reroll in general, but still found success with it, as did other Spanish players. It seems like Juso took a page from his book and decided to go down that same route. But as I see a reaction, Stuart, Renekton 3 has been hit later on to the game, but still an incredibly strong board here from Snooty. I mean, he's still so healthy. As he's still so healthy, you know. 80 HP has the Renekton three star now, and now he can just push levels. He can try and push exactly what he did last game. Push for level eight, potentially even push for level nine if he feels like he's strong enough. But now the, the question is, is what do you pair this Renekton in? Because yes, it's going to be strong now, but it's definitely going to fall off when other players look to try and upgrade their board, especially at this stage of the game, at stage four. Loris does find the Silas 3 for this Kingslayer Augment. We saw it earlier in the day. Aug picked this up as well and managed to get a fourth place position in one of the first few games of this day three. We'll see if the same can occur here for Loris, who is right now sitting in the top four of the standings. And for some extra backstory for this German player, he's actually one of the, the, the main forces behind the legendary deer list, the reroll uh, tier list the Germans have. And this is a reroll lobby, so I think he's definitely feeling comfortable. He's going to be feeling very, very comfortable. Uh, just so if people don't know, the admin for Sage here uh, is uh, every five seconds, admin gain 20 AD for the rest of combat. So it's a bit of a reroll for Talon, but it's also a good reroll for Camille as well. So again, that little bit of extra AD, but you can see the Sage is doing pretty damn well, especially with that nice edges. Finally, Sage has stabilized. Samira is here on the board now for Potable. Has a secondary carry aside or next to that Kale as well. But it looks like Juso has finally hit his Gadgetines. The Annie 3 is online. The Lulu 3 is also online. And no rerolls left for Juso. I imagine the Heartcrest could be an option. Putting in that Zoe on his next level up. Getting the Heartcrest online as well. Maybe looking to try and get four heart instead or Tome of Traits. We have a hacker. We have the prank stuff. Not the best options, though. Actually, it goes for Gadgetine instead. This is definitely going to be one of the more unusual Gadgetine variants we've seen. <laughs> mixing it up with Talon's carry augment in this case. And Silas is the beneficiary of it. We saw, you know, Zed. Everyone talks about Zed and Belveth and Set. But no, the real answer was always Gadgetine Silas. I was thinking that he actually might have put it on the Camille instead of the Silas, because Camille can maybe look to be um, more of a carry and do a little bit more damage. But maybe he thinks that the damage reduction from this Silas is going to be enough. But look at that. Silas versus Silas. Who's going to win? Double three star. Oh, no. This Jinx is doing so much damage. The Talon almost dead before he can get his first cast across and, and flying over to the corners. Still alive. Still able to finally get a few more kills, but not enough. LeBlanc left alone. She's one star. And Sage now down to 46. Still very close lobby all the way from 3rd to 7th. But Potable is not finding success with this kill. Yeah, Potable needs to have some success and needs to turn this around. Currently sitting in 2nd position with 32 points. 2 points away at the moment away from Sasa. Means that he needs to finish really. Like you need to kind of turn this around. Another thing that was, is very unusual is Duelist Malphite. We're having everything in this lobby. Malphite has, I think, used every single item in the game across <laughs> this day three. And this is a board that for those viewers that are diehard fans of EMEA TFT, you might have seen happen also in the day one. Volta was playing a six Duelist Supers board that I thought was very strange. But apparently something's going on in the French community. They're also going down this, this, this avenue, this line of play. Potable trying to fit in Supers here as well. Uh, Padable with the hook as well. Actually, doesn't hook in the Kale. I think there was a 50-50 chance of whether it hooks the Kale or the Lee Sin. Luckily for Padable, it actually hooks the Lee Sin. But this Kale, it might be enough for now. But the LeBlanc is sacking up with the Manazane and the blue buff. This is a big, big round for oh. not only the lobby, but also the competition. The LeBlanc in the end is enough. 
And Potterball loses another round, and you can see the disappointment on his face. He's so, so close to closing the gap to Sasa, but unfortunately loses this round. And that was despite LeBlanc taking a hike across the forest at the end there, walking all the way from the back line into the middle of the board before getting your final cast off. And it must feel so bad for the Padre Boys. He's so, so close, but sitting at 18 HP at stage four, he has to try and do something to turn this around. I'm not too sure. I don't think he has a third item yet on this Kale. I think he already had Giant Slayer, so it's interesting he picked up the BF Sword. Maybe he's just looking for Zeke's to get a little bit more attack speed. We'll have to see. Yeah, he doesn't have a third item. He does have a belt, but the, oh, the belt's on the Malphite, so that's a little bit difficult. Ooh. There's a Fiora three-star as well, though. Forced to sell one of the Yasuo, trying to get the Yasuo three as well, just to get the Fiora for this match, thinking that he might be in trouble otherwise. Despite sitting on what seems to be still two lives at 18 HP, 16, 17 tends to be the threshold. You don't usually lose by that much to take 20 in one hit at this stage, still stage four. And I wouldn't be surprised if Sasa is looking more at Pardubal's board that he's looking. Oh, actually, he faces off against him. This could be a big, big round. I don't think Pardubal is going to go down here. But if Sasa is the one to knock out Pardubal, this is the rank number one and rank number two standings at the moment. But I don't think it's going to be enough. Pardubal still has another chance, but he can't find any wins at the moment. And that is the silver lining of playing against mecha players going into stage four and five, playing against Draven reroll, playing in this against Wukong reroll. You take less player damage because right away the mecha absorbs two of those units and you end up losing by a little bit less. Oh, this is getting intense now because if Patabol gets knocked out in eighth, it gives Sasa even more room, really, to be honest with you. Um, and it gives him pretty much even more of a point lead. Now we're going to be taking a look at Sage's board here. Does have uh, the Camille three star, the Sidus three star, and the Talon three star. Puts in Prankster as well, but I'm not too sure if this board is really strong enough at the moment because it's not really the carry Camille augment, it's instead the Talon carry augment. I was going to say we've gone full circle once again. Sage playing Aesol Renegade as he did earlier in the day, but no, right away the Aesols get yeeted into the Abyss and instead the Echo comes in for the Prankster. Instead, Sage doing anything to stay. A stable and alive for the next few fights because he there's a big gap between seventh and eighth but then the gap shortens quite a bit between everyone else that's leaning towards that bot four and this could be the end for Padabol here the renekton the reign of anger we've seen the crocodile do work and he doesn't even let the fight finish Padabol unfortunately gets knocked out in eighth place which means he is out of contention but that means that sasa inside he's probably thinking to himself yes that's exactly what i wanted another player out of contention and a step closer for sasa to win in golden spatcher cup number two and we were talking about the Spanish Civil War with both Guillosco and Snooty deciding to go into Reign of Anger at the start of the game. The Peace Treaty has been signed. Both players have hit their three stars. Both players extremely strong coming into this stage five. And I could easily see them both ending up in the top four, considering how strong Reign of Anger really is. Exactly. As you mentioned at the start, one of the best performing augments at the moment uh, in the ladder. And you can see the exact same thing now with competitive play doesn't matter competitive play or ladder still really really strong looking at these next few fights the clear indicators giosco has finally when he hit that spike he became incredibly strong and the rest of these bottom three players chuso with the 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 gadgetine reroll that we saw early on is now maybe starting to fall off a tiny bit similarly happened to Solgasang on day one he popped off stages two and three and then stage four and five he really fell off oh. and Takes huge hit here for Sasa, finds the Samira two-star, can slam, I guess was looking maybe for VGS, but it's not going to be Runons. I think it's okay, found the Misfortune as well, has four Ace in here with that Wukong three-star frontline. It does, it is re-energized, so it does mean that maybe uh, this more Misfortune is going to get a little bit more mana and, and also the Samira, but four Ace. One of the late game cons that we normally look at. Normally it's the set front line that everyone is used to, but this time it's the Wukong three star. 
And I was wondering this whole time, what is Jetosaur playing after picking Rocket Grab Blitzcrank? We haven't seen this board until I think this morning in time, unless I missed something. The answer is Talia. He went into Spell Slinger, Soraka trying her best, but in the end, Samira gets the win. Jetosaur, the French player, taking down a tiny notch here. And now Snooty is the sole first place in the HP standings coming into this stage five. Yeah, only one player on the win streak now as well. Snooty actually loses the round, so maybe falling off a little bit with that reign of anger. Does have, you know, does have big friend, does have battle mage as well in the front line. So six brawlers, a lot of HP still to play with, maybe looking for the Jax three star, but the question is, would you go for potentially level nine here? Because there's not really a lot of upgrades that you can get. So Snooty can maybe look for level nine or maybe look for this Jax three star. What do you think? If you was in Snooty's shoes right now, what do you do? Would you go for this Jax three star? Or would you try and push level nine? Well, the good thing is that the decision can be made later into this stage. For now, you're just going to Econ back up to 50 and 60. If you get a few more natural Jaxes in your shop, or maybe off of the orb, if you wait until the PV round at the end of this stage, then you can actually pull the trigger on the decision, depending on where the rest of the lobby is as well. So for now, I think you're just going to try and stay passive with decision making and let the game give him the direction after a few more fights. Look at these crocs go. <laughs> croc versus croc. I think the big difference, though, is the, uh, the you know the quicksilver on one side, making sure that the Sejuani doesn't stun anything. But the stun does come through in the end. They're just battling out. Look at them, just going at each other. I'm gonna be honest and vulnerable here, Stuart. I don't know if you know, I grew up in Miami. This is bringing back some some terrible, traumatizing memories. The croc battles are not something I'm fond of. I'm glad to be now in Europe, in uh, you know, a, a more civilized land than the Everglades when it comes to. Alligators and crocodiles. Uh, we all know that uh, EU is also greater than NA in uh, in TFT as well. Always the case. Oh, let's, let's wait until Worlds happens and we actually <laughs> pop off to, to go down that route. For now, I will uh, plead the fifth. I want my lawyer here. I'm not going to say anything bad about NA, but I won't say anything bad about Loris either. We talked about him being a, a really someone that feels comfortable playing reroll. We see it here. Jinx, three star, Silas, three star, fully itemized. And currently sitting at 22 HP, trying to win these next few fights. He's lost the last two. And He's this Camille trying. is not helping. Yeah, the Camille is not helping at all, unfortunately. But trying his best. The Talon does jump around. The Silas is still alive, though, on the side of Sage. And is this Talon? Oh, maybe the Talon's going to be enough. And it is. Sage Whoa. still wins the round. These last, I mean, we're seeing it here, Giosko 20, Sage 20, Chuso 20, waiting for the, the result of this last fight. Loris at 12, so, so close at the bottom end here. And again, to win the tournament, but also just for the points you accumulate, GSC points for the regional finals qualification, equally important. And there is prize pool, so three different important variables that are going to be on these players' minds coming into this last, last, last stage, possibly stage six. Yep. A lot of things are going to be going through these players' minds, but I think the, the most important thing is that they don't just don't really think of the bigger picture at the moment. They just have to think of this game. They have to make sure that they make the right decisions, they do the right things to make sure that they can get to this position that they need to be. Sasa currently sitting on 36 HP, currently number one at the moment in the Ratit rankings, currently sitting on 34 points. Have to see has... if he the Zephyr, I wonder if he's going to hide it if he wants to buy. Nah, he's just going to roll and not, 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 not get too distracted just yet, but he could. Put the Zephyr on one of the bench units, trying to make sure that other players don't know he has that Zephyr. And he could end up winning this last fight or two, which could be extremely important for the final result in this Game 6. Has a spot on the Yumi as well for the corner. Zephyr, if he needs to have it. Yeah, but he's going to be spreading out his units, but unfortunately, it's not really anything you can put it on. You can't Zephyr this Renekton instead he Zephyr's the Lee Sin. I don't know if it's going to be enough for Chuso to win this round with this very unique reroll gadget in comp. Loris trying to stay alive. The Wukong is still alive on that left side as well. The Jinx alive. The Prankster comes in. The dummy is not going to be enough. Loris a big enough hit to go out unfortunately in this last fight. Looking at the right Chuso is going to be facing off against Snooty. Spain versus Spain but Chuso Looks to be strong enough actually to survive for one more fight. Only Sejuani and Vi left alive. Oh, it's Giosko rather. Giosko taking down to 4 HP now. Both Sage and Giosko at 4, Chuso at 6. These lobbies are so, so close. You can see the Sasa is the only one with the win streak at the moment. Looking in prime position. 
to win this Golden Smasher Cup number two. And at the moment, with the with the HPs of the hit them below, means that it could just be enough for him. Sage 4 HP, Chuso 4 HP, Galisco 4 HP as well. It's going to go down to the wire. And Sasa still streaking as well, streaking the whole day really coming into this as the clear favorite to win the tournament and also finding success in this game six. We'll see where this effort's gonna go. If it can actually pull up the Renekton, it won't be, it'll be the Vi instead on Snooty's board, but Snooty has so much HP to work with. A loss here would not be the end of the day for him. It would be the end of the day for Sage though, who is fighting for his life, fighting to stay alive. The guy seen Silas does finally go down. Talia is still healthy on the back line, not in the perfect angle for diagonal, but she stays in a spot where she isn't really touched throughout this entire fight. The Camille hasn't reached her yet, finally does, but will the Camille die before she can kill? No, Camille gets the kill. Talia is down, only the Alistar and the Annie remain, and the Camille should be able to clean up, and she does. Sage lives to fight another day. It does look like it's also going to fight another day as well. These lobbies are so close. Chuso does get knocked out, though, in sixth place. These scores, these HPs are getting closer and closer. But one player that still stands on top, I think, for pretty much two games in a row now is Snoody, which we haven't seen in a long time. But this exact seems like the exact same as uh, as game as the previous game because Snoody again on a lot of HP and also a lot of gold to play with. Exactly. We talked about it before. I think he might be waiting until after this P round to commit to one decision or another. How did you want to cap out his board? Is it going to be a Jax 3 or is it going to be level 9 instead? I'm not sure the Jax had too many items outside of the Zeke's Herald that was giving more power to the Renekton more than the Jax itself. So maybe going 9 is a better option. And like the last game, you can just slow roll for that Jax 3 instead and find it when you need it most when you're sitting at that you know 20 HP mark. Sage has a Zephyr as an option though, Stuart. Is he? Oh, I thought that maybe he was going to hide it, but maybe he prioritizes positioning more than trying to keep that Zephyr hidden. You see Sasa here also rolling down, trying to find a few units. He's trying to find just something to fill in at the moment. Maybe a defender, maybe a brawler. Could also be this Leona, maybe looking for five mecha potentially. No, actually doesn't want to go for five mecha, just puts in an Urgot instead. Going to be Urgot for now. Very cleanly opens the anvil at the very end there to try and keep a Shroud or a Zephyr hidden if that is going to be the option he picks up. And it's going to be a Zephyr for Sage. We knew that already. The Renekton is hit and goes up into the air on that left side of the fight there. Giosko fighting for his life against Sage here. Spain versus Poland. Talon jumping left to right trying to get the key kills. But with Renekton being as healthy as he is, the Quicksilver as well, stopping any amount of CC. We'll see if the Croc can do it. Talon versus Renekton, one cost versus one cost. The Sejuani ult could be massive if it stops the Talon in its tracks before it can get the next reset, and it will be the case. The Talon is trapped, he's frozen, and all the Brawlers gang up and kill off the Renegade unit. Sage taken down in fifth. Uh, and Sage was the player that did have that little bit of a gap as we were going into the later stages of this tour of, of this day number three. He had a little bit of a gap, but unfortunately, the last two rounds have not been enough for Sage. And now we're in to our top four. The big thing is that Sasa is still alive here, sitting on 34 points in the rankings and everyone else near him. But the big thing is, like, will Sudi be able to do enough to potentially win another lobby, the second lobby in a row? Ace, Talia, and two Brawler players left in this top four. A Zephyr here, the Echo, can throw something up in the air, and it will be the Wukong. Giosko showing his absolute dominance when it comes to scouting, positioning, and trying to get any possible edge in these last few fights. Will that be enough? Stalling out the main tank on the board here for Sasa for so long. It could be. Misfortune still alive. The stun comes through, does not kill Misfortune. The Renekton is now dead. Oh. Wukong and MF both left alive, and I think Sejuani can't quite do it by herself. Giosko taken down in fourth. The, the four ace is enough for Sasa in the end, and Sasa is guaranteed a top three spot. It means you can see it on his face. It maybe it could be enough for him to secure himself as first. We'll have to wait and see, but four ace here is enough for Sasa. That big late game composition hits the Mordekaiser two star as well. This re-roll Wukong in the early game was enough for him to win streak in this early game, transitioning into this four ace with some perfect items on this backline carries. Zach 2 is found for Jedizor for the French player. The three big countries in EMEA represented Spain, Germany, 
and France. The three best players from each of these countries also here in this top three in this game six. We'll see who ends up facing Sasa. It will be Jedisor, the French player here. The positioning might matter quite a bit. The thrill of the hunt is also massive for this MF and the Wukong to stay alive. The Talia ult is really what we're looking at here. Undertow will only hit the Soraka in this case. And right away, Samira taken down to under half health. The Mordekaiser ult comes through. The Wukong alive, but barely. The ults, the AP damage coming through. There's no protection. The Bramble not going to be doing enough. The Talia that's alive, but MF is also there. One last ult is not hitting the main carry. MF cast comes through and the MF wins it. The French player taken down. It will be Snooty versus Sasa to decide the winner of this game six. Oh, and there's a mech emblem. There's two mech emblems as well. What is this? I mean, they both could just go for mech emblems if they want to. I, th th okay, he's not going to go. I thought they were both going to. They're both playing mech. They're both playing mech. Um, I was like, maybe they just both pick mech emblem. But Snoo Snooty actually lost the last round as well. We didn't quite catch who he actually lost to. But it comes down to this. Germany versus oh. Spain. Snooty versus Sasa. Janna two in the shop. Janna, yep. Takes it, puts it in. Thinks it's going to be good enough to just get some extra power onto this board. Can this Renekton do it? The ace damage, when you fully assemble an ace board and you're able to itemize everyone, like we see that the fuse is going on on the Mordekaiser, it just does so much, so much power comes out of these units. The, the big thing is, I just got confirmation that Snooty did lose to uh, Sasa's Ghost in the previous round. So now this is a battle for first. Sasa can guarantee his spot in the gold, Golden Spatula Cup number three and win out this, this set. The Undertow comes through, hits almost everything. Mordekaiser ult, not fantastic, but still the fight is swinging heavily in Sasa's favor. The Croc is still left alive. The second Skylands comes through. All the aces ganging up on one single angry Croc. MF takes him down, but Snooty is still alive. We'll have one more fight. I don't think the outcome will change, though. It seems Sasa is just too strong. Sasa comes into the final lobby. He's got, he got two first places in a row in the past two rounds. Now he's looking for his third, third, first place in a row in this lobby number one. If he wins this final battle, he wins Golden Spatula Cup number three and books his ticket to the EMEA finals. The Mordekaiser ult so important. The Leona as well. She's able to burst down this Wukong 3 that might change the outcome of this fight with the triple, triple tank items onto that Wukong. But we'll see how this fight goes. Once again, the Urgot going to get the immediate casting since he is now frontline. The first Undertow comes through. The Leona has been Mecha. She's on the server. The Renekton as well. Now moving on to the Samira. Samira is also dead, but Renekton does not go towards the MF. Goes back to the frontline. Instead, MF can deal damage completely untouched in the back there. The final Mord ult comes through. But all of a sudden, MF is by herself. Leona, Renekton, and Sejuani take her down and take Sasa down as well. Snooty Boo is our Game 6 winner, but maybe not the tournament champion. We'll have to wait and see if Snooty done enough there, but Sasa getting a second place might be enough for him as well. We'll have to wait and see and wait what finds out. But what an incredible way to end as well the day. An incredible lobby as well. Four ace in the end for Sasa and Snooty getting two first places in a row. Pretty much the exact same comp as well, like the same playstyle. And as is fitting, we have an interview with Snooty lined up for the break and we'll have our analyst breaking down everything that happened in this final game today. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for more. Okay, so my name is Balu Antares Moroni, I'm 28, and I was originally born in Germany, uh, but I'm currently living in Spain since pretty much uh, since I was five, and I'm more known as Snooty Boo in the gaming community. Okay, so the, the thing that I enjoy the most about this, uh, this set is that I actually think they got the grasp on the hero augments, they've been getting much better at that, and the first month I was pretty much playing non-stop like 12-14 hours, so I'm really enjoying it. Usually when we're uh, almost at the bit set, I'm kind of tired of it, but I'm still in the mood of gaming 8-10 hours a day, so I'm really loving it. So TRC is definitely have to be important because like the reference we have in, in Europe is uh, France and their system revolves around their, their national competitions, their TRCs, right? And they've always been a step ahead and they've kicked their ass forever. So I think that Spain is actually catching up is really important. Myself, I've always been good at ladder but struggling with these tournaments. And now that I've been playing in these much more often, I think it's getting better. 
Oh, so I've been competing in pretty much all the Rising Legends competitions ever since it existed, and even before it was called Rising Legends. But I think uh, this uh, this year has been my best performance so far, a GSC one where I got tenth. I think I could have done a bit bit better, but that was still pretty nice for me because I actually get a, a real shot to get to the European Championship, which is pretty much my dream ever since I competed. So that's pretty nice. Of course, everybody who supports me every day, thank you very much for the for the cheers every day, and everybody who's enjoying TFT, keep on doing that. Uh, this is an awesome game. We're going in the right direction. Have a nice uh, day and. And thanks for watching. Welcome back everyone to the final part of the Golden Spatula Cup number two. We are collating in our final results, doing all of our tiebreakers, but oh boy, we, don't, we had ourselves a heck of a final game. We, we've been talking about all day about you know contesting these comps with each other and how it generally doesn't end very well, but our Spanish players apparently knew a little bit better. I mean, there's something to be said about when you're contesting one cost rerolls, those lines will tend to have at least an opening for two or three players. We saw it back in the day with something like uh, Shredder in set three. We've seen it with, uh, at the start of the set, actually, right, with the laser call reroll angles that were all around Ash and revolved around Renex, and funnily enough, right? So we've seen that there are space for multiple uh, players rerolling the same one costs if they have the support for it, and this was the case this game. So I mean, let's talk a little bit about we, what we, you know, what we saw from there. You know, Snooty, of course, winning out that final lobby, did an incredible job on our, you know, penultimate stream lobby. I've managed to pull out the win there to climb into lobby one, then to actually win lobby one as our final game on stream is particularly impressive. Great job there with the brawlers. I think it's just overall Snooty has finally kind of stepped into his element now, and he's going to perform quite well for the. Quite well for like for this thing now qualified for finals and can kind of just take a seat back now and say you know what i know exactly what i need to work on i no longer have final day jitters or anything like that because we're finally seeing him just pull up big performances back to back this was worth noting of course coming in today we did know snooty Cambis, kevin parker wet jungler and Savi were all safe for the EMEA regional finals, which honestly just makes it even more impressive that Snooty, who you know, had said to us before that here in day three, the pressure would be off because he didn't have to win to be pulling out some, you know, a performance quite that fierce. I mean, apparently, in some cases, the pressure doesn't sharpen to diamonds, but the lack of pressure for Snooty worked even better. Yeah, absolutely, and I think something I think that is that's just great overall, right? We, Asasa is another well player we're going to be talking a little bit more about in, in, in a short moment, potentially, right? Uh, he has shown his prominence of playing for these four ace law, four ace boards when given these low cost hero walkings. We saw we've seen it before, uh, and it's just a, a great way for him to fully navigate this situation. And, and when you are able to navigate these four cost uh, four ace boards, sorry, and get into those, I think it's a great thing to say. And I think that we're kind of figuring out that the four in Sasa five four five four stands for four ace. I don't know what five stands <laughs> for, but five aces. 
That's the, is that is that even is that even active actually? I don't even know what does five ace disable its rate. I feel like it should no. Probably. <laughs> I guess we'll have to go and find out. Uh, but of course, you know one of the big things for this entire tournament, of course, was to. You know, France, previously the dominant region. In this game, part of all being the representative on the final lobby. Fortune just didn't have the best of time with the Kelly roll. He actually did tell us, you know, this was a board that part of all was, you know, council running. Why did it not work out here? I think that just overall the tempo of the lobby was was really really difficult for him to deal with. Didn't get the off to the greatest start either. His items for the scale were were also not fantastic. Was lacking a few things to really make it make it kick. And when everyone is kind of on on your contest in the early game, he didn't hit on free one either. I don't know if he was sending it free one. We saw Saza also holding some kills and stuff like that. So it is just not always straightforward to hit these uh, reroll compositions. And again, I feel like Padable probably would have preferred this was not a one 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 hero or. 2-1 situation try to play more of a traditional game of TFT to, to go for the win. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, certainly from DreamHack and from the other events as well, you know, part of all is an exceptional TFT player. You can see, you know, the frustration was extremely evident, by the way, you know, just surrendered the game at the end and said, this has been, you know, the worst time for this kind of development to have here. But, you know, with all that in mind, this, you know, this does open the door, you know, more clearly for the German TFT community to really step forward. An amazing tournament from them, you know, so many players coming from the beginning was telling us we were in line for something special. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just one of those things where these final games are always going to be so tough. Some people will falter under the pressure. We saw Chuso try to go for the Gadiotine reroll angle that a lot of the Spanish players have been prioritizing and talking about. Um, remember going back to the interview with Snooty yesterday, right after day, after day two, where he spoke about the fact that this is a line that the Spanish players really like to play for. And we saw it yet again. All right, so we've got a few pieces of business to deliver before we get to announcing our final overall stands. We, of course, did have a contest running today to see who could be the wittiest TFT player of the day last time round. Yesterday, it was all about bringing out the prequel memes. This time from Ashes Bell. Uh, they're predicting for Loris. Loris hit Jack 3 yesterday for a round 3 win. Doing so, infuse their souls together. Jack doesn't need mana, so Loris doesn't need stamina to claim my heart. And yours. And yours. Oh god, he's leaping roof off the roof on. Winking. Rune Terror Run. Imagine if he had a real spatula. Wow. Yeah. Ash's Bell, you took us on a journey with that one. That's a well-won competition. And that's another thing to add to this whole tale of Germany ascending to becoming potentially the most prolific region in TFT. It's only a single event where we've seen this disparity so far, so it's a little bit too soon to call, call it completely right. But a player like Loros, who is mainly known for staying within his reroll lane, making it so far and almost having a shot of winning the, 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 the GSC, is also kind of speaking volumes about how deep of a scene they actually have in Germany. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, everyone can learn from France's example of being a sustainable TFT region that is going from strength to strength. And I think they've set the, you know, the template for everybody else to follow. We have got our final standings done. Our tiebreak is being done. So we'll be able to announce the final standings for absolutely everybody across the field, all the way from 30 second up. We can see here a lot of folks, a lot of big names, as we expected. Not everybody can get into the top 16. These ones will just have to set them for making day three. Yeah, they are going to pick up those ever so important points for the GSC ladder standings for come around end of the season to get into the Rising Legends finals here. I think we're going to be seeing the interesting screen very shortly that will showcase who actually ended up winning and who took home the remaining final placement. There was no real doubt at the end of the day, let's be real, chat. You all kind of, you all kind of <laughs> figured it out. It is going to be Saz with an absolutely dominating performance here in day three with a six point gap to Snooty. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. I mean, all credit to City Boo. You can see at the tail end there, eight into eight into eight, three first places in a row. He literally did everything he could to try and catch up. But Sasa's performance in the middle of the day was just too damn good. So congratulations, Sasa. We will actually be talking to Sasa right now. Uh, so what a day it's been. Sasa, we saw you smiling on the camera when you realized the job had been done and you had taken the first place. I'll ask the obvious question, how did it feel? Uh, uh, it still feels a bit surreal. Uh, it, 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 uh, it doesn't feel like I, I won. I think uh, it will come, come later today. But yeah, I'm pretty happy right now.
Yeah, so Sasa, we spoke in the run-up to the Super Bowl in Dragonlands, which you obviously qualified for. It did not necessarily yes. go too well back then. I think you finished like 21st. It didn't make even make it to day two of that. Um, but we spoke about the fact that you've been you've been around the scene for a long time, playing with relatively shifting levels of seriousness. Have you started like really putting a lot of effort into competing this season? Oh, I always took it uh, not that serious. But then I got day one at every event and like it, it really got to my nerves where I started to like obsess over this game and watch VODs 24-7 because I finally want to win and uh, yeah, today I did. I'm really, I'm really glad that's you know, the way that you ended up taking, you know, taking, you know, of course you know, for all of our players and of course for most of our players today, they can't be the winner like you are. So I would, you know, I would say from a person who's gone from a position of not win, of getting day one repeatedly, to you know, to winning the entire event, which is incredibly impressive. What would you say actually to those players who are now in the position that you were before having lost today? Um, the advice I would give: um, you close all the tabs of European streamers, and you only watch China. And um, yeah, that's it. That's my advice. Uh, interesting advice, <laughs> at least. I mean, I, I hope that you at least uh, look and, and study together with some of your your German compatriots, right? At least in, in that big uh, mixing pot of of knowledge that has kind of been assembled in the region, kind of also showcasing. That also been shown by how many players you have gotten deep into this. Do you think that Germany is about to overtake France as the premier uh, country in Europe? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know how we have so many people. Like, if you watch our, like, the Twitch numbers and, uh, like, we don't have any organizations supporting us, it's uh, kind of surprising that there's uh, so many good players of us. And I, I think um, it's just uh, because, like, we share the tech and, uh, yeah, we talk a lot uh, with each other and that helps. All right, just, just before I ask for your shout-outs, we have got a little message from Makes, of course. Our German caster, unfortunately, couldn't be here. I thought I'd just read this out while you're here so you could get your reactions to it. She said that she's really happy with how the German community has grown as individuals and as a community itself. We continuously see more and more different players from Germany coming through. They've got a massive community behind them that is rooting for them to make it to the finals. Uh, the GSE points coming through, and she's so thrilled to look forward to Amir Files with a big representation from Germany. And she specifically called out you, saying, Sasa showing up for Germany is a big pog. You know, I guess, for you, you know, anything you'd like to say back to Makes and to the, the community who supported you up until this time? Oh, there's uh, a lot of people who supported me. I don't know if I can shout them all out. But... Um yeah, I mean, big big thanks for uh, to the German community, like for sh showing up in my stream or like practicing with me. There are few people in particular that I would like to shout out, and um, that are um, the people from Memos Discord. You've probably heard that uh, mm. Discord a couple of times now. Um, yes. But there's one person in particular I want to shout out, and that is um, Elia. I think uh, without Elia, I would never have been the player I am today. And he helped me a bunch. Well, that's great to hear, Sasa. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on winning the Golden Special Cup number two. That will stay Thanks. behind your name for eternity. Please do go enjoy a <laughs> nice, relaxing time that your work is done. With it's been a long road getting us here. We've seen some absolutely amazing games. I ask for your thoughts coming into the last game. I ask you once more for your thoughts on today coming out of it. Now we've got ourselves a GSC2 champion. I think that we've kind of seen everything that this like entire setup had to offer. I feel like that's not a single comp we haven't really seen put to into the light today because we all throughout the weekend as well. Right, we got that triple one cost hero augment as well because we have. If there's anything we haven't really seen, it's been the triple prismatic and what that kind of does to the <laughs> game, but. Outside of that, we've had ups and downs, we've had returning players making us a day free, we've had new faces making us a day free, and we've crowned a new champion of a GSC. No repeat champion in the GSCs just yet.
No, we're still waiting for that one to happen. But that will bring us to an end here today. So, if you've liked what you've seen today in the Golden Spatula Cup number two, We've got very good news for you because we've got one more Golden Spatula Cup before we head to the EMEA Regional Finals. April 14th at 4pm CET. The Open Qualifier will be running the week before, so keep your eyes out there. If you want to sign up and get your chance to come in and join in, Wait, would you mind running the folks through where they can join in the after-party conversation on Twitter? Yeah, so that's going to be over on Twitter. You can see the hashtag right down there. Actually, I'm doing the wrong way. I'm pointing the wrong way because mirrored cameras and all that good stuff. <laughs> but at TFT Esports EMEA, if you're more of a QR code type of person, there's also a QR code that you can scan or you can type Twitter in chat. Our hashtag is TFT Rising Legends. That is straightforward. No, it is spelled exactly how you would think it's spelled. On Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, it's going to be at PlayTFT. Remember that we're going to see some of all the content we've showcased you. The interviews will be over on the YouTube channel of TFT. So if you want to eat, if you want to see those full length uh, team fighting tactics, for example, with uh, Impetuous Panda, they are going to be over there shortly. For the individual talent on the broadcast desk today, it's going to be at Niberia. It's going to be at Impetuous Panda. And hold, hold with me here for a second for It's Stuart. It's a bit of a mouthful. It is IT set or C, depending if you're British or American, then Stuart. And the Stuart is with a four instead of the A. So that is a, a little <laughs> bit of lead speak with a, a bit of good old fashioned gamer tagging in there. Lastly, you can find Counterfeit Cast as it's spelled right beneath him there on screen, and you can find me over at Weta Casts. That are that's all our socials. Of course, thank you to Fearless and Maisie Motherpan for doing an incredible job in a day number one and two. Of course, shout out to our amazing production team, Alvaro, Carlos, Daniel Observer, and all the fine folks who've made this broadcast possible. They definitely don't get enough love, but we're giving it to them right now. Again, come back and join us on April 14th for the last Golden Spatula Cup of this particular season before, of course, once more we head to the EMEA Regional Files with the Global Championship shortly after that. But now though, I've been Canopy, it's Jeremy Weaver. A thanks to all of our casters and all our viewers today. Our players have done an incredible job. And we see you guys a little way down the line.